Dark Fire by Rose Mackey, Book Two of the Under Violet Sun series. Chapter One, Poise and Frustration. The warrior stood poised on the balls of her feet, senses alert for the slightest hint of movement. Eyes closed, her face serene, beads of sweat trickling down the small of her back. She extended empathic tendrils to supplement her hearing, waiting for the spike of energy that would signal an attack. She tuned out the focused energy of the observers. They weren't important right now. The warrior dragged her leery across the floor, tracing a wide circle around her, the worn wood of the grip comfortable and familiar in her hand, the tip scraping gently over the mats on the floor. Her other hand flexed up behind her as she sank to a ready crouch. There, hearing the movement on her left, the barest swish of sound, she angled her head to the right fractionally in misdirection, a flare of satisfaction as her opponent took the bait, rushing to attack on the left. She gracefully dodged to the right, her muscles warm and fluid, and swung her leery around in a tight motion, the thin wood singing in the air to deliver a stinging slash to her opponent. She reversed her swing, bringing the leery back in an X formation to deliver a second and third stinging thwack across his upper chest. Three marks! Out! called a voice from the sideline, and her opponent cursed. She felt his flash of anger, followed by incredulity. She grinned in triumph and opened her eyes to look up at her opponent, frowning down at her. He was huge and bare-chested, wearing only loose workout pants. The male was gorgeous, and she admired him objectively, as one would admire a work of art. He had short, cropped bronze hair, his gilt skin shimmering with sweat, and was currently sporting three angry red stripes, two on his chest and another on his upper shoulder. His energy was distinctly feline and feral, contained by a ruthless will. Not for the first time she wondered how he had convinced a smart, gentle female like his healer mate to join with him. The female had a spine of titanium and balls of steel to get into bed with him every night. How did you do that? he demanded. You move as loudly as a pregnant cow. Lucius snorted. No, I don't. I've hunted white Dathalka and they can hear a footstep two hundred scree away. My, my, aren't we the very soul of modesty? Zira snickered at him, moving to the edge of the training area to grab a towel to wipe her sweat away. What can I say? I'm just that good. Lucius barked a laugh as he accepted a canteen of water from Tarlaxar, who stood with a gaggle of watchers on the sidelines, all now discussing the match quietly. Ha! Huh, and I am the goddess incarnate. How did you do it? Zira considered, trying to find the words to explain her empathic senses. Senses she had honed to warrior precision over the decades of her training. I could sense your intention. I felt your focus on the left and baited you on the right. She smirked at him. You fell for it. Tarlac guffawed, covering his laugh with a cough when Lucius turned a dark look at him. You did not teach us this in the Lyrie lessons. I am not sure I can teach it. The skill can be learned, true, but its foundation is the innate empathic sense that Felotians are born with. Lucius returned his attention to Zira, cocking his head, pondering before nodding firmly, a gleam in his eye. She had a sinking feeling that he had come to a decision that she would kick herself for later. This is a useful ability. We will try to teach this skill to non felosians We will conduct drills, test the limits of this in combat situations. I will prepare suitable battle simulations for us. The other security team members that had been watching their sparring groaned good-naturedly. Zira glowed with pride. That was why Lucius was the first warrior. Why, despite his unfortunate disability of being male, Zira was happy to follow him. Rather than be offended at being bested, especially by a female, he immediately turned his mind to how he could best use her skills for the benefit of the colony. Colony 29 was in its infancy. Zira had only been here for two months, and she loved it. Loved the ruggedness of the forests, the lilac hue of the sky under the double violet suns, the camaraderie of the females. She was even warming to the Verit males, although actually getting to know any of them was proving challenging. She had never met such an intense, controlled group of individuals. They had a pathological, wary respect for females, which was proving a significant barrier to establishing friendships between the species. Still, it was refreshing compared to males of other species, who in Zira's experience often had to have respect for the distaff gender beaten into them. In this colony, they appreciated her. They considered her warrior skills an asset. Here, they did not constantly compare her and find her wanting. 
Lucius turned to regard his small security team, and he began pairing them off for drills. The rec room was large, a single open plan space with polished flex plaz flooring, walls and soaring ceilings of a uniform industrial grey. Matte black nanoblocks were stacked against the back wall, able to be programmed into any recreational or training equipment required, then denatured back into their inert state. The matting on the floor, which they had spread out beneath their feet as the sparring ring, had been created from those same nanoblocks. The pairs spread out, ready to begin their warm-up routines. There was a slight hiss, indicating that the Oculus exterior door had opened, and a diminutive female entered the rec centre, interrupting them. As soon as the door opened, Lucius spun towards the female, his attention laser-focused on her. She started the long trek across the open space towards them, and Lucius moved to meet her. When they came together, he reached out a hand to her, caressing her cheek. She turned her face into his palm, placing a gentle kiss in the centre before she returned to gazing up at him. Zira could feel the heat blazing from them, and she suppressed an unexpected flash of jealousy, rubbing her chest against the ache there. Danara was one of her closest friends and was everything she was not. Kind, gentle, lusciously feminine, and Lucius adored his mate with an openness that astonished the other Philosians. He made no secret of how besotted he was. His pride and joy in her acceptance of him as her mate shone in his unabashed grin any time he spoke of her. Zira had long ago given up dreams of a great love, had accepted that the very things she liked about herself, her strength and independence, her warrior skills, were qualities few males desired. Still, it would have been nice to have someone truly see her, to have someone look at her, as Lucius looked at Danara, if only for a moment. Beloved, what are you doing here? Lucius's voice was a low rumble. I need you to come with me, Lucius. Odrin is awake. If you need to question him, now is your best opportunity. The sparring pairs started drifting toward them, whispering to each other. Odrun, a healer from Verit, had been severely injured a month prior. Trapped in a cave-in, he had been medevac to safety, and Danara and her team had operated for over twelve hours to stabilise him. His healing hadn't gone smoothly, and had been plagued by recurring weaknesses and infections that Danara had struggled to treat. The situation was complicated by the fact that a month earlier, a saboteur had stolen key medical supplies that still had not been located. The medbay team was trying to treat Odran with a skeleton set of equipment and medications, and a resupply ship was months away. To the males of Verit, engineered for robustness and health, it was unheard of. Verit males that received injuries that Sirius typically died. Few ever needed long-term medical care. Tarlac stepped forward, pausing a respectful distance away from the healer. Lucius turned his head towards Tarlac, not taking his eyes off Danara just enough to let Tarlac know he was aware that he had approached. The first warrior's back and jaw tightened for a moment, before Zira saw him consciously relax and nod to Tarlac that he could speak. Lucius and Danara's mating was still new, and he was ferally protective of her. Only a Creven idiot approached unannounced or surprised Lucius with Danara. They were likely to end up with Lucius's retractable razor-sharp claws in their guts or throat. Excuse me, healer. Did you say that Odrin had awoken? How is he? Dinara turned her stunning champagne eyes to the officer. He is healing, warrior. He is over the worst and will take time to mend. But your incredible Verit physiology has helped him through the worst of it. Tarlac nodded, relief writ on his face. Odrin and he had trained together as lass before Odrin's healing skills had taken him down a different path. They remained close. When will we be able to visit? Not for a few days more. He is still exhausted and sleeps a lot. She turned her attention back to her mate. Hence why I need you now, while he is alert. I see. Why could you not have contacted me on the HUD if the matter was urgent? He indicated the matte silver earcuff she wore that they all wore, a combined comms device and AI interface. The healer smiled impishly. Because then I couldn't do this. She hauled him down to her, kissing him thoroughly. While the onlookers whooped, her fingers weaved into his short hair. After long moments... She broke off the kiss, grinning ear to ear. Come first, warrior, duty calls. She held out her hand. Lucius stood stunned for a moment before snapping out of his shock to take her hand and allow himself to be towed out of the rec center. He half turned back to his team. Zira, take over drilling. See if you can teach your technique to the others. Zira nodded, 
her pride in his trust and confidence making her buoyant, and she turned back to her team, all eager to learn from her skills. Yes, even without a mate of her own, this new life suited her well. Odrin was both exhausted and mercilessly bored. It was not a good combination. He had not been outside of his ISO bay in nearly a month, and he longed to feel the wind on his skin, the soil under his feet. Reality didn't give a shit about his boredom or his wishes. He watched his hand as he reached over to grasp a glass of water, noting the slight tremors in his arm from the exertion of lifting the glass to his lips. He was a healer, the best in his generation, and he knew the signs. His body was seriously out of condition, and time and rest were required to repair the damage. The usual pearlescent sheen to his skin was gone, his epidermis pallid and dull. As he moved his arm slowly to lift the glass to his lips, one of his braids swung forward onto his chest, and he noted that its usual silver was now a dull grey, the metallic filaments within brittle. Verit physiology was a marvel, genetically engineered to be resistant to most disease. With physiques highly resistant to damage, illness was almost unheard of. Injuries, yes, but illness, weakness, those were things for others. In its drive to fight off infection and repair the damage to his organs and limbs, his body had cannibalised itself. He had lost significant weight, his metabolism burning through fuel faster than he could consume it. He had been on nutrient drips for weeks, eating as much as he could in his brief semi-conscious phases. Odrin was acutely aware that he was sick from malnutrition as much as anything else, literally starving to death as his body tried to heal itself. He swore viciously, healer he might be, but he was a warrior of Verit foremost. Warriors were not weak, did not lounge about a bed all day. Warriors should have purpose, be doing something. He threw the glass at the wall in frustration, watching the plaz unsatisfyingly bounce to the floor rather than smash, the water dripping down the wall. He snarled at it, exposing sharp canines before lying back on his pillows, panting with exertion at even that much activity. The dark stranger within threatened to take him over, to drown his rational mind in rage, when a gentle, amused voice came from the doorway. Healers always make the worst patients. Come to mock me, my lady. He couldn't hide the bitterness in his voice as he closed his eyes, unable to look at Dinara, to see the compassion and care in her face. You should know me better than that, Odrin. Her voice whipped and he jerked his eyes open. Do you see any pity in my expression? Her gaze was clear, her face calm. He refused to answer, remaining mutinously mute, turning to stare at the wall while she continued brusquely. I do not need to stab at you, Odrin. You are doing a wonderful job all on your own. She turned her back to him. He's all yours. Odrin's eyes shot up to see Lucius fill the doorway. He saw the male inspect him, his lips tighten. Hello, little brother. It is good to see you looking better. Odrin gaped in disbelief. I look like an effigy to the midwinter wraith, first warrior. Be careful or I'll steal your firstborn daughter out of your cave at midnight. He mock snarled and bared his teeth. You might want to get your eyes examined by the healer. All right. You look like a hide I left out in the sun, then let freeze overnight. Is that what you want to hear? Odrin glared for a moment before breaking into a reluctant grin. You have the worst bedside manner, Luke, you know that. They gripped wrists, Lucius consciously moderating his strength, shocked at how thin the younger male was as Odrin continued. Thank you for coming to see me. Took you long enough. Lucius examined him again with a critical eye. At least you sound more like yourself, the soul of charm and tact as always. He snorted. And if you think I would defy Dinara as either my mate or the colony's chief healer on a matter relating to one of her patients, you have clearly addled your wits as well as damaged your body. Odrin shrugged, eager to talk about anything other than his own condition. How is everyone? Is everything going okay? Lucius nodded. Mostly. No more incidents of sabotage since the Philosians killed that male last month. We've got the scans working properly now, so we can cut back on the physical perimeter security patrols all the time. We might even start having something like recreation around here. Odrin hummed in agreement. The first month on the colony had been chaos. They had little chance to establish anything like normality. You missed a Felotian festival. They call it Maiden Feast. Really? Indeed. Music, moonshine and barbecue. Odrin's eyes opened wide as Lucius nodded. Apparently they occasionally eat meat on feast days. The boys had a great time hunting to provide for the festival. Lucius leaned in close and whispered conspiratorially. 
We also discovered a fascinating Felotian tradition. Apparently, Felotians bare their breasts when they are seeking a male. You should have seen their native dress. They weave chains around their torsos and breasts, just jewellery on their top half and nothing else. The maman and her lass retreated to their rooms for the night in disgust. Odrin eyed him, gauging his sincerity. Are you serious? Lucius nodded, and Odrin thumped his head back on his pillows with a groan. How often is this festival? Lucius shrugged, and Odrin cursed again. Luke fell silent, and Odrin considered his presence. The male had been as a sire to him, had fostered him as a youth, trained him as a juvenile, taken him on his first hunt. He knew him better than almost anyone, and he didn't do small talk, so Odrin waited patiently. Lowering his voice, Lucius cut to the chase. I know you are convalescing, so I will keep this brief. Did you find it? Odrin sucked in a breath, aware that what he was about to say would change their future forever. I found it, Lucius. Under the crater, ancient alien tech. Lucius stilled. A month prior, the colonists had discovered that the planet was rich in a rare mineral, Zelan. It was momentous and terrifying and placed their fledgling colony at substantial risk. The Zylan had the potential to make Phallusia and Verit very, very wealthy. It would change the power structure of not just the Alliance, but the entire sector. If the universe found out that Zylan was present on their planet, every pirate, prospector and petty king with access to mercs or armies would converge on them, ready to decimate their untried colony. The only other known system with rich natural Zelan in existence was the Talta Group, and they had formed a blockade and no-fly zone to protect themselves, with sales strictly controlled. They paid the equivalent cost of a minor planet each year to the mercenaries that protected them, but the sales of Xylan more than made up for it. Colony 29 was painfully exposed, so early in its development. Plans were underway to improve the colony's defences, but they would take time. The best strategy for now was secrecy. More of a risk, however, was ancient tech. Throughout the known galaxies, time and again, Ancient alien tech and ruins had been discovered wherever Zelan was near. The aliens, so long gone even their name had disappeared, had been prolific. They appeared to have created a society that spanned thousands of planets. Common speculation was that they had originally seeded this part of the galaxy with life, and there were just as many theories on where they had vanished to. War, plague, ascendance to another plane of existence. Every few years, the intergalactic entertainment stations produced another serial or movie based on some new, more implausible scenario. An undisputable truth, however, was that wherever Zelan had been found, even in small amounts, they had found ancient alien tech nearby. Alien tech was highly prized and controlled. If word got back to the Alliance that there was alien tech on the planet, it would give them grounds to revoke the colony charter gave the Alliance immediate right of ownership to both the Zelan and the Tech. It would be a disaster. Can you tell us how to get to the Tech site? Odrun shook his head. The cave-in that injured me destroyed the path. I know where it is roughly, but I'd need to be there to locate the site itself. Odrun hesitated. It was huge, Luke. Bigger than anything I've ever seen before. Several times the size of the Ardrac. It was the size of the Matriarch's citadel. Lucius's jaw dropped. Until now, they had only found ancient tech in tiny quantities. The largest find to date was a heavily deteriorated scout ship, and the engineering developments from that single ship had spurred invention in dozens of fields. Advanced shield tech, propulsion, AI, medical technology, and more. It was shielded. The area was filled with Zelan in a configuration the scanner didn't recognise. It's in a hollowed-out chamber. I made it to a tunnel that brought me out at the top of a cliffside near the ceiling. Even standing looking at it, the scanners still insisted that the chamber was empty. It was crazy, like nothing I could ever have imagined. Lucius stood in agitation, scrubbing his hands through his short hair. We have to get back to that site. We need to know what we are dealing with. He turned his attention back to Odrin, his expression changing to one of determination. The chief healer tells me that your injuries are almost healed, a medical marvel, she calls it. You are ready for rehabilitation. We must prioritise getting you back into shape. We need to get you back out to that site. Odrin nodded, blinking back tears in hot eyes, pathetically grateful, his surge of emotion taking him by surprise. Lucius turned his back on him for a moment, under the guise of calling in Dinara, giving him a moment of privacy. When Odran opened his eyes again, Dinara had joined him, 
her manner once again brisk and professional. Audrun, while you are a healer and I have nothing but respect for your healing skills, healers make terrible patients. For your rehabilitation, you will be treated as any other patient, understand? Audrun nodded. You have three priorities. Nutrition, physical strengthening and stretching. We will assign you a program for each. Under no circumstances are you to attempt cardio exercise, weightlifting or weapons training until I give you clearance, or I will put you back in this bed myself, understand? He grinned at her. Yes, ma'am. Based on your recovery so far, if you follow the program, you will be well enough to travel to the crater site in four weeks' time. He opened his mouth to speak and she cut him off with a glare. While I'm sure that seems like an extended time frame for a Verit warrior, for any other human template species, you would be months in rehab. Follow the plan, don't re-injure yourself and you'll be back at it in under a month. Push too hard, damage your still healing organs and bones and you'll need more surgery and I'll ship you off-site to a specialist medical facility for treatment. I will not let you set another foot on this planet until I give you full clearance and you won't believe how slow I can be with medical administration when you piss me off. Her gaze was serious and he swallowed his objections. Lucius added, it will give us time to plan the operation. We still need to work out how to get around the interference and get equipment down into the crater safely. Lucius leaned forward and bopped him on the nose like a la to Odrin's snarl. If you're a good patient, I'll let you sit in on the planning sessions. Odrin jabbed a finger at Lucius. As soon as I'm at peak condition, I'll put you on your ass in sparring, old man. Bring it, pup, Lucius laughed, but Odrin could see the relief in his eyes. And for the first time, Odrin realised how hard it would have been for this male, his surrogate sire and brother in one, to see him so injured. He could never show Luke how hollow he felt could never admit how close the dark stranger was to the surface. Dinara blinked rapidly, accessing her HUD through the visual interface, and a blue icon overlaid his vision in the right corner. He looked at it deliberately for a second to accept and open the file. His nutrition plan and training schedule streamed before his vision. The healer placed a gentle hand on his shoulder. You should rest more today. I will send your first meal plan tonight. Tomorrow we begin physical therapy, so you'll need to quadruple your calories. He placed a hand over hers, grateful for her support and friendship, for her matter-of-fact manner, for her singular lack of pity. Thank you, healer, for everything. Dinara nodded and sniffed slightly, her emotions breaking through her professional mask for a split second. Rest, she said again before smiling wryly. You're going to need it. Chapter 2. Therapy Odrin sat in the open ward of Medbay, his muscles twitching as he stretched his legs out under the watchful gaze of the chief healer. Every day for the past week, she had supervised his therapy, putting him through hours of gentle exercises designed to rehabilitate his weakened physique. However gentle the stretches were, he was left shaking with exhaustion at the end and cursing internally in pain and embarrassment. He had solidly declined to have anyone else visit him, embarrassed at his state. He silently promised the goddess that he would never, ever take his health for granted again. Don't you have personnel that should do this? Surely the chief healer has better things to do, he growled bad-temperedly, and she cocked an eyebrow at him, utterly unfazed by his surliness. You want one of your subordinates to see you like this? He didn't meet her eyes. No, he was sure he didn't want his staff to see this. See him shaking like an elder after shuffling for a few minutes along the length of the ward would certainly damage his professional dignity. It was hard enough getting them to take him seriously as the youngest healer in his generation. Dinara grunted, thought not. She studied the readouts next to him. As a courtesy to another healer, she had streamed the data to a portal glass panel so that he could see the data, rather than just viewing it through her own HUD. You are progressing on schedule. It's amazing. Just a few days ago you couldn't even lift a glass and now you are walking around. I give you clearance. The medbay oculus opened, admitting the mamon and her aide, mamon Lascara. Blessings of the goddess to you, healer. The graceful trainee mamon bobbed her head politely before turning to Odran and offering him a gentle smile. Warrior, we are thankful that you are returning to health. Odran plastered his most charming smile on his face, hiding his grimace of pain. It was ingrained in him never to show weakness, especially to the mamon. However refined they appeared, it was always skin deep. They were vicious creatures that would lash out at a moment's notice. Thank you for your consideration, Mamonla. He managed a gracious, seated half-bow, 
his silver braids swinging forward to obscure his vision, so he did not see Skara flush with pleasure at his response. Dinara nodded in greeting to the Maman and her companion. The Maman and the chief healer had a rocky relationship. They had clashed repeatedly in the past, over the Maman's flouting of intergalactic law to bring her Maman Las to the colony as stowaways, and more recently over Lucius and Dinara's mating. They had finally settled into a respectful truce a month ago, when the two of them had defended themselves against a Svoboden spy, intent on sabotaging the colony. The Mammon visited Dinara daily for medical treatments, after her genetic alterations to enable her to consume colony foodstuffs had been unsuccessful, and Odrin noted with concern how thin and pale she had become. Increasingly, the Mammon could not consume any food at all, and was becoming more and more reliant on the derma nutrition patches that Dinara applied. The chief healer was attempting to develop a more permanent cure, but the colony medical facilities were rustic by intergalactic standards, and the Maman stubbornly refused to go off-world to a better equipped facility. Maman, Skara, if you would please wait in the ISO bay, I will be with you momentarily. I am just finishing Odron's physical therapy. The Maman turned her ice-blue eyes on him. She was wrapped in a dark blue velvet gown with a high collar, stiffened with silver and gold embroidery in an ice-lace pattern common on Verit. A white Dathalka fur wrapped over her shoulders, and her head was crowned in a circlet of silver-dripping tiny crystals, gracefully framing her face. The sumptuousness of her attire did nothing to detract from the predatory glare in her eyes. Colony 29 was much warmer than their native Verit, and it was still late summer. The heaviness of her outfit was an unusual choice for her, and Odrin wondered if her feeling cold was another symptom of her deteriorating system. The Mamon La wore a summer wear version of the outfit. Her dress was also dark blue but sleeveless and made of a lightweight nano silk that conformed to her every step. Her pale hair was topped with a tiara that looked spun out of crystalline spider webs. Small pearls weaved through her cloud of white curls. How is the child of my clan this morning? the Mamon inquired. Dinara looked at Odrin for permission to respond and he gave her a small nod. He is doing well, Mamon. Before you came in, I was about to give him clearance to leave Medbay and return to his quarters. He will need to continue to attend Medbay for his physical therapy. All he needs is gentle exercise, massive amounts of calories and rest for a couple more weeks, and he will be back to normal. The Maman continued her examination, not taking her raptor gaze away from him as Dinara spoke, and Odrin hid a shudder of foreboding at her intense regard. It was never a good idea to draw the attention of a Maman, especially not Frey. She may look like a queen, but she was a vicious warrior through and through, and she owned a debt that he could never repay. Finally, the Mammon turned to the chief healer. He is not permanently damaged. Odran suppressed the childish urge to snap that he was a fully qualified healer as well, that he could report his own condition just fine. He kept his tongue, knowing that the Mammon would place more credence in the word of another female than her own males. No, Mammon, he will make a full recovery. The Maman nodded. This is well. We have invested significantly in his training. It would not do for him to be unable to return our benevolence. She raked her gaze over Odran again, assessing him like a prize stud. Never forget what you owe us, Odran. Your debt to the clan is yet unpaid. The Maman turned stiffly and stalked to her iso bay, her dark dress flaring around her, motioning sharply for her companion to follow her. Dinara turned back to Odran. What did she mean by that? Her champagne eyes held concern, and he attempted to still his roiling feelings, aware that the empath healer would sense his emotions. He shrugged nonchalantly. You know the Maman. They are the very soul of compassion. She really did pray for you, a voice said, and they turned back, surprised to see Skara still standing there. The young female wrung her hands, shuffling in agitation, her voice conspiratorially low. We both did. Another small smile flashed at Odrin. We burned one of the Veritas flowers for you at our shrine. We are glad she listened and granted our wish for your recovery. She hesitated, obviously wanting to say more, before shaking her head and following the maman. Odrin felt as if he'd been struck. He was stunned with shock. They had burned Veritas for him. Dinara looked after the females retreating back for a few seconds before sighing and shaking off the distraction. All right, Odrin, that's enough drama for today. Do the exercises, eat all the food on your meal plan and rest. Her eyes warmed with mischief. 
I want my second in charge back soon. I'm saving up all the paperwork for you. You should be able to sit at the desk for a few hours a day from next week. Odron groaned. After all, I am honoured by having someone so favoured by the mammon working for me. You should have told me we'd have rolled out a red carpet for you, hung flower garlands. Odrin snorted in laughter, and Dinara relaxed, feeling his mood lift. Odrin, what is a Veritas flower, if you don't mind me asking? He stilled. It is a flower grown only in the caves under the matriarch citadel on Verit. We named the planet for it when it was colonised. It is said that they can use its distillation as a truth serum. Odrun looked at the doorway where the mammal had gone in apprehension. We don't use it that way anymore. We have more efficient compounds, but it has kept much of its cultural significance for the mammal, for all of us. Only a few are harvested each year, and only the most senior mammal, the matriarchs of the clans, can access them. We burn the petals in our most sacred ceremonies to the goddess. He eased his way up to standing, testing to ensure that his legs would take his weight. A maman burns Veritas when she wishes to convey to the goddess the depth of her feeling, the strength of her desire that her prayer is answered. He paused again. The last time I heard of one being used, it was when the matriarch was giving birth to her fourth daughter, unheard of in living memory. The Veritas was burned in prayer for her safe birthing. Dinara smiled at him. That is lovely, that they value you so. Perhaps under her cold exterior, the maman has genuine care for you. Odron shook his head. Perhaps, Hela, or perhaps she believes I shall deliver a service that is worth burning Veritas for. His eyes were troubled. What that could be, I cannot imagine. Dinara patted him gently on the shoulder. That is a problem for another day, my friend. Just focus on getting well for now. Odron nodded and shuffled slowly out of the med bay door, holding onto the wall like a drunkard. He firmly put thoughts of the mammal and his life debt to her out of his mind as he limped his way across the green towards his accommodation. Whatever she demanded, he would pay. His debt demanded nothing less than complete and total sacrifice to her will. His habitation unit was blessedly on the ground floor. He didn't think he could manage stairs right now. He saw a few faces brighten in welcome as he passed, which he waved off. He was acutely aware of how much his body needed sleep, how much he was ready to collapse. He was panting and shaking again by the time he reached his quarters. He instructed his HUD to open the portal as he approached, and he manoeuvred himself inside the dark cabin by leaning on the door, the wall, and the bedside unit in turn. Eventually he flopped down onto his bed, pausing only long enough to discard his shoes before he lay back on the mattress. He breathed rhythmically, calming his racing heart. It raced from the old, accustomed anxiety that came with any interaction with the maman, and a new panic that had formed in the darkness of the cave-in, where he had gasped for air and begged the goddess to deliver him from the crushing pressure of the soil above him. He clenched his teeth and stubbornly refused to let the instruction to activate the lights escape his lips. Somehow, his emotional armour had deserted him. He could not find within himself the ready grin and air of arrogant competence that he usually portrayed. Not even the dark stranger shielded him from the consequences of his decisions today. In years past, he had cursed his youthful self for stupidity, for bargaining away his future to the mammal in exchange for the uncertain benevolence of the matriarchs, raged against the unfairness of life that a single decision could forever alter his fate. Now, in the claustrophobia of the dark pressing in on him, he simply felt tired. He was a tamed wolf on a chain of his own making. He sighed deeply, pulling the cover over himself before sleep claimed him, warm and soft, a welcome oblivion. For a moment before being pulled under, he wished he was a Lar again, safe in the home of Lucius and his brothers, wished he could run to Luke to make things right, as if the mess he had made of his life could be made better by a bandage or a slice of pie. Chapter 3. The Mother Within the next time he woke, it was to an insistent buzzing in his ear in the pitch-black cabin. It took him three tries to get his parched throat to croak out the word, lights, and he cursed as they blazed to life, blinding him. Dim lights, eighty percent, he growled, blinking as the illumination dimmed to a tolerable level. He could still hear the buzzing, and as awareness slowly returned, he realised it was his HUD, alerting him that someone was at his door. He slumped back onto the bed, covering his eyes with his forearm, and called out, Open! He heard the low swish of the door opening, 
heard the person on the other side hesitate before calling out softly, Brother, are you alive in there? Tarlac. He opened one eye to just a slit, groaning at the light streaming in from the open door, silhouetting his friend in the doorway. In or out, I don't care, but close the damn door. Tarlac entered the compact unit, and the doorway shushed closed, plunging the room back into gloom. The healer sent me with your food. Apparently you've been asleep too long. I'm to wake you up and make you eat everything on the tray. She told me to rest. That female is a menace. I've only been sleeping for... He checked the time on his HUD, the small display overlaying the bottom right corner of his vision. 36 hours. I've been asleep for 36 hours. Tarlac nodded as he placed the tray on the small round dining table and unloaded the covered plates. The healer herself checked on you twice, but your vitals were good, so she said best to let you rest. If you were Philosian, she'd have taken you into the med bay, but our physiology put you in a kind of healing hibernation. Now she says it is time to eat. No wonder his throat was so croaky. He was parched. As if suddenly coming fully awake, his body thrummed with tension, sending alerts he was thirsty and hungry, and most of all, desperately needed to pee. He clambered to his feet and lumbered to the tiny bathroom, noting that his limbs felt considerably steadier than before his unscheduled mini-coma. He didn't feel strong, but he also didn't feel like he'd collapse at a stiff wind either. As he completed the necessary bathroom business, Odrin realised that there was an unfortunate odour. Giving himself a sniff, he grimaced at the pungent smell. An inventory of his condition told him he probably wouldn't collapse if he had a quick sonic shower. When he left the bathroom a few minutes later, he was feeling significantly improved. Having to take bed baths for a month was more than enough punishment for being so careless as to get injured. He grabbed some loose workout pants and a long-sleeved black sleep shirt, noting with shock when he put the pants on how tight he had to draw the waist. He had lost a significant amount of body mass. He sat down at the table opposite Tarlac, who was balancing on the back legs of his chair. It is good to see you, brother. Thank you for the food. Odran demolished the meal with a single-minded intensity. His body was screaming for nutrition, having burned through most of his remaining reserves during his long sleep. As he ate, Tarlac brought him up to speed on the colony. The establishment was progressing well, despite the attempts of the saboteur. Their first crops of locally grown food would be ready within weeks, and they had completed the surveys for the power and water facilities. Odrin ate every scrap of food on his plate, his stomach groaning with the effort. He sat back with a gusty sigh at the end, sated for the moment. As he looked around, Odrin noticed his accommodation properly for the first time since his injury. Last night, or was that the day before, he had simply passed out without a light on. Now he saw what he had missed in his haste to eat, and his breath caught in his throat. His cabin was decorated with tiny woven figures of all sizes, strung in rows across the ceiling, around his bed, and over the kitchenette area. Made from local plants, there were representations of the triple goddess, Dathalka, Hiran Ruir, Vlamin, Tothas, all the sacred heraldry of the Verret clans. There were even tiny woven starbursts representing the goddess's eternal mate, the universe itself. Over and over again, there must have been hundreds of them. Tarlac, he whispered. His brother looked at the strings and smiled. Vorden organised it. We all chipped in with a few effigies each. You couldn't have visitors, so we each made you one. For each day you were unwell. Odrin reached out to touch a gentle finger to one figure, a tiny, perfect goddess. Interwoven with three shades of purple leaves, the gradient of colours coalesced in her three faces, one in light, one in shadow, and one in the darkness. That one was Vorden. He's a magician with his weaving. Odrin swallowed, his chest tight, his heart was full of love and affection for his clan brothers. Tarlac smiled in understanding, then handed him another one. This is from me. It was a terrible weaving, a rough starburst, just a few leaves wrapped together to show the four spears of light from the central knot. Odrin laughed out loud. Thank you again. I have no words. Tarlac nodded and leaned forward to clasp Odrin's shoulder. We'll burn them at the next goddess moon, release all our fear and pain back into the universe. Odrin smiled and clasped his brother's hand. Until then, you get to live with them all as a reminder of how much you scared the shit out of us all. Honestly, what kind of verit male gets hurt by a little tumble? I was caught in a rock slide. Half a damned cavern fell on me. 
We are Verit. We grew up in caves and ice flows. Tarlac tutted and waved a finger at him. Careless healer. Odrin chuckled. The teasing was familiar, easing him with the normality in a way nothing else could. How long will I be hearing about this? We might stop when your grandsons come of age. Maybe. Tarlac grinned broadly. Come on, brother, let's get you outside for a bit. Odrin hesitated. He felt better, but wasn't sure if he was up to wandering about. It's all right. We aren't going far, just to sit on the edge of the green. The Felotians have introduced us to a new form of exercise recently. Several of them meet each day on the green to go through a stretching routine. Peyton finally worked up the courage to ask the cadet whether it would be rude for some males to watch. Tarlac grinned again. When the Kadex stopped laughing, she solemnly informed him that if her people had wanted no one to see their exercise, they wouldn't be doing it on the public green in full view. She said that the ladies would welcome anyone that wanted to watch or learn, provided they were respectful. Odrin's interest was piqued. The first couple of weeks on the colony had been chaos, and after being out of it for weeks, he had had very little opportunity to interact with the Philosians. He truly liked females and enjoyed their company. He had been looking forward to getting to know them better, both as individuals and as a group. He had reviewed everything he could on their culture in the weeks before arriving at the colony, and they were a fascinating people. The healer said that if you felt up to it, you could watch. In another day or so, you can join in. She said that it'll be excellent exercise for you to regain your strength. Odrun pushed away the yawning fear and panic at the thought of his weakness. The dark stranger scratched at him, demanding that he hide his vulnerability. He stood abruptly, determined to attend, refusing to let the anxiety win, to pick up the threads of his normal life. Tarlac looked at him quizzically for a moment, as they stepped out into the late afternoon sunshine. He took a deep breath, scenting the air, enjoying the vibrancy of life around him after weeks in the sterile medbay. He could smell cooking from the communal mess, and his stomach grumbled again, unbelievable given the massive quantities of food he had just inhaled. More distantly, he could hear someone singing, the tune floating on the breeze unknown to him. They slowly ambled towards the green where Odrin saw several other males sitting on the grass, including another of his close friends, Peyton. Peyton immediately rose to greet him, giving him a short, fierce embrace. A half-dozen Philosian females walked towards them across the grass. He recognised a couple of them, including Fila, a bold female and Dinara's closest friend. She was a regular visitor in Medbay. In the lead was a stunning female he had seen around, but never officially met before, carrying a bundle wrapped in heavy brown material. She was tall and muscular, with a mane of brown and gold hair in a single braid down her back, the sides of her head shaved. Her arms and legs, bare in her workout gear, were covered in intricate tattoos, swirling and blending seamlessly into a detailed, elegant whole. She was stunning, powerful. She exuded a strength and serenity that he could sense clear across the grass. Looks like we have an audience today, called Fila teasingly. Odrin nudged Tarlach. Who is that? He motioned to the tattooed female. That's Videk Zira, one of the senior security officers. She's amazing. You should see her spar. She's so fast you don't even see her coming. The open admiration and enthusiasm in Tarlach's voice was new and Odrin realised again that in his month of recuperation, the colonists had bonded and developed friendships. Examining the striking female again, he wondered if Tarlac and the security officer had formed more than a friendship. If so, he was pleased for them. Tarlac was a fine male and an excellent warrior, and the female was glorious. He felt a pang of jealousy that he wrestled into submission with unyielding focus before it could take root. After a long, considering look at the assembled males, the females crossed to the empty space and began setting up. It turned out the bundle Zira carried contained long, thin sparring sticks. They are called Leary. She's been teaching us how to use them, Tarlac whispered. They sting like the breath of the winter wraith if they catch you. He rolled up his sleeve to show a fine red welt on the back of his forearm, already darkening into a bruise. The females paired up and began to move through a series of martial art forms using the sticks. Zira moved among them, observing, correcting positions here and there, and periodically calling out a command in an unfamiliar language. It wasn't Philosian, or their HUDs would have translated it instantly. 
Each time Zira called out, the group increased their speed another notch. As their speed progressed, the watching males grew silent, their attention rapt. The women were breathtaking, graceful and deadly. They moved through the form seamlessly, their stinging attacks like serpent strikes. He heard whispering behind him. It was Dinara who had quietly joined the watching males. Just ask them! No, came the hushed response from one male. I promise they won't mind. They'd love to share it with you, she replied. What is it you want to ask that you think they won't like? Lucius inquired as he walked up to join the group, putting his arm around his mate and pulling her into the curve of his body. Peyton flushed. Some males would like to know if the ladies would show them some moves. The security personnel get to spar, but there are others on the colony that would like the opportunity. Lucius considered the request. All right, but not sparring, not yet. I've been on the receiving end of the Lyri sting, and it is not for the inexperienced. Perhaps Zira would be open to teaching some forms as an introduction. Noting that the females were on a water break, Lucius wandered over. Videk, he inquired respectfully. My males have been watching your practice. We noticed, she grinned at him. Some of the other colony males are interested in learning. Would you mind teaching them a little? She brightened, considering. Very well, we'll do a slow demonstration of the forms to begin with. She gave him a secretive smile. The forms are not always performed with Lyri. Many have other purposes. Zira huddled with the females, whispering before they spread out into a diamond pattern facing their audience, Dinara moving to join them to friendly nods of welcome. Zira stood formally before the group at the point of the diamond, hands palm up in front of her, legs shoulder-width apart, her body relaxed and centred. This is Delma Layat, Delma the mother goddess, Lay the energy within, at home, literally channelling the energy of the goddess within. As she spoke, she moved her arms gracefully, palms up at hip height, raising her arms to cross before her chest, then finally fanning her arms out before her and settling into her starting position again. Her moves were smooth, precise, and her voice hushed. It is a commonly taught martial art on Philosia and is considered basic self-defence. She pushed her arms down, palms to the floor, left knee raised, the Philotians echoing her motion. In the morning, the suns rise. She transitioned to the next move, her left leg swinging behind her in a circle as she rotated 360 degrees, her body bending forward gracefully, arms extending in front of her. The suns project the energy of the universe. Her voice was rich, capturing her audience's attention as she told the story of the day of the Mother Goddess. In time with her controlled, elegant movement, the land awakens, another move, and the animals rise, another move. The water sings, the birds fly, the moves continued on and on as one with her recitation. The mother cradles all within her, Zira concluded on her knees, arms stretched above her, and the universe sleeps. The males were spellbound. No one dared break the silence. The Philosians slowly stood and returned to their first positions before Zira started again. Her voice was hard this time, the contrast from the hushed ambience she had created jolting the audience alert. There is another name for these forms as well, the Mersky, the Raging Storm, because Mother Nature is not just creation but destruction. For life to have meaning there must be death. Watch the Mersky. The women, as one, called out, a wordless sound of power and rage that raised the hairs on the male's arms. They began the forms again, this time with rapid, violent movements, the down pushed palms and raised knee of the first stretch became a move to knee an opponent in the face. The slow rotation of the leg became a whipped round house kick. Odrin gaped at their grace and fury, at the raw energy pouring from them. Their moves were so synchronous that they reminded him of a flock of birds moving together. They were magnificent. Again and again his attention was drawn to the tattooed female, Zira, as she moved through iterations of the forms. Her beautiful face was tranquil as she progressed through the moves with devastating power. Her limbs were supple and strong, her breath even. She seemed the living embodiment of the goddess in her warrior aspect. Dalat Rai, bringer of judgment and passion, protection and righteous fury. One by one, the females concluded their demonstration, kneeling on the tufted grass. He could see a fine shimmer of sweat around Zira's hairline, and when her eyes caught his, he saw a blaze of triumph and energy within. Odrin inclined his head in a slight nod of respect from one warrior to another, and she winked at him. 
after the ritual and solemnity of the moves, he was startled into laughter. He chuckled aloud at her irreverence, breaking the spell that had fallen over the assembled audience, and they erupted in exclamations and chatter as the groups merged. Several of the males brought water bottles over, and Lucia spun Danara around in a circle, kissing her soundly. Odrin joined them. Chief Healer, this is the exercise you want me to try. I think you miss me in Medbay and are trying to hasten me back. Odrin tugged on a curl that had escaped Danara's plait, and she swatted him away affectionately. It will be good for you to build up your strength again. Healer's orders. Odrin nodded, his eyes following Zira. He certainly wouldn't mind an opportunity to spend time in her presence, and if he needed some one-on-one -on -one instruction, well, she could hardly fault him for that. Cheered by the thought, he resolved to check with Tarlac if they had formed a bond. If not, he would seek her out at the first opportunity for his health, of course. Chapter 4. Prickly Path. Encrypted transmission from Agent Hoyert. Plan A failed. Moving to Plan B, Operation Olive Branch is activated. Envoy dispatched with security force to Colony 29. End transmission. Odrin wandered into the mess hall the next morning feeling significantly better after more food and another solid twelve hours of rest. Sleep had helped quiet the incipient panic in his mind, well enough that he could once more be Odrin, the healer. Odrin, the friend with the ready grin and charming manner. The dark stranger was securely constrained by chains of protocol. Looking around, he was pleased to see the tattooed female warrior present. He grabbed a tray of breakfast enduring the good-natured jokes from the males on kitchen duty about the quantity of food he was consuming, and wandered over to the corner where Zira sat. May I join you, my lady? She looked up in surprise, her face frowning at the interruption for a moment before smoothing out as she recognised him. She offered him a professional smile. Healer, what can I do for you? Odrin smiled broadly in return, launching a charm offensive, tipping his head towards his laden breakfast tray. May I join you for breakfast? There is a matter I'd like to discuss. Of course, please do. She stood slightly as he moved around the table to sit down, and he quashed a spike of irritation. Did she expect him to fall like a tottering elder? He was still weak, but no longer an invalid. Once at the table, he busied himself with arranging his meal on the tray and picked up a spoon to start on the heavy porridge, murmuring appreciatively when he found it laced with dried fruits and sugar. How are you recovering, Healer? she asked politely. Well, thank you. I feel much stronger today, even compared to yesterday. I think sleeping in my own bed has made all the difference. Medbay is a busy place. Last time I was in there, the nurses woke me up every hour or so during the night for observation. I felt like I had no rest at all. You were injured? He frowned, disliking the thought of her harmed. She shrugged. Not badly. Like I said, they kept me in for observation. She leaned back in her chair, stretching her long legs out to cross in front of her. Her demeanour betrayed her curiosity. They had barely spoken a word since arriving on the colony, their paths rarely crossing. I witnessed your demonstration of martial arts yesterday. Zira bristled. You make it sound like we gave a performance. Delma Lay At is a lethal martial art. It was not a demonstration, it was training. In the right hands, it is a glorious ballet of battle. He smiled patiently at her and he saw her physically resisting the urge to smack him. I witnessed your training yesterday. It was impressive. Zira bared her teeth. For a female, he clenched his jaw. That's not what I said. She raised a sardonic eyebrow at him. It's what you meant. Odrin was incensed. He would never disrespect a female. If you believe your own gender to be inferior, don't go dragging me into it. If you like, I can recommend a good therapist to help you get to the bottom of your insecurity he replied coolly. She snorted out a laugh, taking a swig of her caffeine drink. He studied her relaxed arrogance and it dawned on him. You're making fun of me. She smiled tightly. Only a little. You bite too easy, healer. Your preconceptions colour your speech without you being consciously aware of it. His mouth gaped and she fluttered her eyelids at him. Oh, you're cute when you're flustered. He considered his response, intrigued, and studied his opponent. He had been a healer for years and had dealt with patients of all kinds. He considered himself an excellent judge of people, but Zira, she was prickly. He couldn't quite get a read on her. He felt like he was standing on quicksand. Excitement stirred. He loved a challenge. Whatever strange private battlefield he had unexpectedly stumbled into, he was determined to win. 
He forced himself to relax and he leaned forward casually towards her. Zira frowned slightly, wariness behind her eyes, sensing the change in him. Ha! Huh, let's see how she enjoyed being off balance. He reached over and snagged her cup from in front of her before she could respond. Leaning back to mirror her position, his muscular legs crossed in front of him and took a long draw. He hummed appreciatively at the taste. He would need to add this to his nutritional rotation. I only bite if you ask me, very, very nicely. He gave her a slow, wicked smile, pleased to see the minute biochemical changes in her response, her eyes slightly dilated, a gentle flush on her collarbone. He fascinated Zira. Damn, the man was too charming for his own good. The healer was hot, absolutely flamingly hot. Long and lean, with a mass of multi-hued metallic braids and intense sapphire blue eyes. There was a distinctly feline energy to him, an inquisitiveness and sense of elegance that appealed to her. Perversely, it put her back up. In her experience, males that were both gorgeous and charming were assholes. After a long moment, she smiled slowly at him in return, determined not to let him see how much that wicked grin had sent warm tendrils through her. You know how to play, healer. I'll give you that. She stole her cup back and lifted it in salute. The chief healer has instructed me to undertake light exercise as part of my physical therapy. She nodded, and there was another long pause. He cleared his throat. I would like to request you to teach me some moves from Delma Layat. If you agree, I am available at your convenience. I am not yet cleared for duty, so I can work around your shift schedule for the next few days. Zira examined him frankly, considering his physique. Try as she might, she couldn't believe that the male was here, walking around, sitting upright and flirting with her. His injuries had been horrific. Most other species would have been months, maybe even years in recovery. Not mere weeks. Zira's practised eye noticed his lingering pallor, the dark circles under his eyes and the lankness in his silver hair. Her empathic senses extended to him, and she picked up the faintest resonance of darkness. Filing the information away for later consideration, she pondered his request. The healer had taken her breath away when she'd first met him. His skin had shimmered and glowed tan in the simulated sunlight of the colony ship, his twisting braids gleaming with silver, iron and steel. He had been lean but with defined muscles that hinted at his warrior lineage. The male before her now was still handsome, but without all of that softness. His cheekbones pushed at his skin, his cheeks hollowed, and he had lost significant muscle. It would take a lot of work to build him up to his former self. She opened her mouth to decline, and was astonished when she heard herself respond, All right, I am off shift. Meet me at the rec centre in an hour and we can get started today if you like. Odrin grinned, relieved that he had navigated the thorny path of interacting with the prickly warrior. I am at your command, Videk. As Zira rose to leave, she had last words of instruction for him, Wear comfortable shoes and loose clothing. Before Odrin could ask any more questions, she spun around and he watched her retreat, her long, thick braid swaying back and forth in time with her steps. He tucked into his breakfast with enthusiasm, happy at the prospect of having a purpose for the day, rather than passing yet another day recuperating in bed. He would need fuel for his exercise. Something told him that the V-deck would not go easy on him, and he bared his teeth, buoyed by the challenge. Chapter 5. Training. Zira leaned against the corrugated wall of the rec centre, enjoying the morning sunlight. The brisk air was refreshing against her skin. She twisted a piece of grass in her hands, methodically stripping it in waxy purple layers while her thoughts wandered. She waited for Odrin to arrive, wondering again what in the goddess had come over her when she had agreed to this. The practice of Del Malayat, while commonly used for both exercise and self-defence, was deeply spiritual. Zira had grown up with the forms, spending hours with her mother, sisters and grandmothers, lost in the ebb and flow of energy in the movements. She had taught hundreds of females, but never a male. She sighed in aggravation again, throwing away the denuded stalk. Who was she kidding? She knew exactly why she was doing this. This colony was a chance at a new life, and she had made the start of genuine friendships here, Dinara and Lucius among them. Zira respected the first warrior. She deeply wanted to be worthy of his respect in return. She didn't fully understand the relationship between Odrin and Lucius, but Lucius doted on Odrin like a son or younger brother. She simply couldn't refuse him. Everyone liked Odrin. She couldn't afford to alienate the community. She needed this new life to work. 
Also, she admitted to herself, she liked him. Not many males could go toe-to-toe -to -toe with her. You know, in some cultures, that's considered a sign of sexual frustration. Zira started and looked up. She had been so busy wool-gathering that she hadn't heard Odrin arrive. So much for her vaunted warrior training. Annoyed that this male had her so distracted, she cocked an eyebrow at him. I can assure you, Healer, that should I wish to work out some tension, I would have no trouble finding partners. Odrin's eyes crinkled. I would never dare to suggest otherwise, my lady. I was merely making an anthropologic observation. She pointed a finger at him in warning, resisting the urge to grin back at him like a fool. He really was too charming for his own good. She shrugged the tension from her shoulders, determined to keep things professional, and turned to lead him into the coolness of the rec centre. Zira moved to the stacked nanoblocks in the corner and connected them to her HUD. She double-blinked deliberately, looking at the icon that floated in front of her vision and opened the nanoblock programming application. The world around her blurred as the carousel options of the block programming spun up in neon orange in front of her. She reached her arms out, using her left hand to move the rolling menu to the left until she found the program for padded mats. Using her right hand, she pinched her fingers to pull out and expand the selected option, inputting her size and firmness requirements, before waving her hand over the confirmation icon. Odrin had moved up behind her to watch with interest, and she grabbed him by the arm to pull him away from the blocks. Have you seen the industrial nanoblocks in action, Healer? He shook his head, eyes cat-bright with interest. Only the small medical versions. She resisted the urge to grin at his inquisitiveness. The lights in the rec centre flashed red in warning, and both of their HUDs displayed a warning icon, highlighting the out-of-bounds floor area as Zira spoke. An automated message streamed into their visuals and was broadcast overhead. All personnel clear nanite area. We need to stay outside the designated area while the blocks are reforming. She pointed to the floor, where an inlaid crystal line encircled most of the middle of the rec room. The crystal is the energy conduit that supplies the nanites in the blocks, it is ill-advised to impede forming blocks. Odrin nodded again, his eyes flicking to her hand still loosely wrapped around his forearm. She followed his gaze and flushed with embarrassment. My apologies, Healer. She moved away slightly, her hand tingling in the touch's aftermath. Please call me Odrin. If we are going to be training together, we don't need to be so formal. Zira gave him an arch look. Very well, you may call me Videk. He chuckled and she felt her heart skip a beat at the joyous sound, and she ruthlessly stuffed the feeling down. She couldn't afford to catch feelings for this male. As the goddess will it, my lady. He bowed slightly and she reached up, and with a gentle fingertip nudged his face back to the forming blocks. Odrin sucked in a sharp breath at her touch, but was distracted by the sight in front of him. During their interaction, the blocks had gradually changed consistency, from solid inert cubes to a gelatinous texture, the gel appeared to be slowly losing its structural integrity. On closer inspection, he realised the gel was moving. It crawled across the ground to the middle of the floor, where it levelled out into a long, wide, flat rectangle in the dimensions Zira had specified. Within seconds, the gel had re-solidified into a shiny black padded mat, suitable for martial arts practice. It was highly disconcerting. Zira directed Odrin to sit on the mat, and she took position opposite him, cross-legged. She sniggered as he cautiously approached the mat, towing it carefully before moving opposite her. For today we will start with breathing and some gentle stretching. She held up a hand to forestall the complaint she sensed was coming. Delma Layat is much more challenging than it looks. The forms require precision. Believe me, it will surprise you how sore you will be after just an introductory session. It works muscles you never knew you had. Odrin nodded, easing himself down into the seating position, hiding a wince as he crossed his legs. His thigh and calf had been seriously damaged in the rockfall, and they protested the unaccustomed pose. Close your eyes and follow my breathing pattern. Start by exhaling entirely. We will breathe in through the nose for five counts, hold for eight counts, and exhale for ten counts, she demonstrated. After several iterations of the breathing, Zira opened her eyes and examined Odrin critically. She waited until he had completed another round and stopped him. You are not breathing deeply enough. You must expand your ribcage, move your diaphragm. Let me show you. 
She knelt and took his hands and placed them around his ribs on either side, index fingers just touching over his rib cage. She couldn't help admiring his powerful forearms and long, talented fingers. She had the absurd desire to stroke down his front, feel the tension in his muscles. She sat in front of him, leaning forward, her hands over his. Now look at me. Breathe with me. She locked eyes with him and inhaled, watching him do the same. Holding her breath for eight counts, she was acutely aware of his closeness and searing intimacy of their visual connection as they breathed out together. She deliberately looked away, shaking off her awareness of him. She then mimicked the motion on herself. When you inhale, you should see your hands move away from each other, then return to fingertips touching when you exhale completely. Watch me do it. Watch the movement of my ribcage measured by the fingertips. She resumed her cross-legged posture, closed her eyes and cycled through the breathing again. She felt his gaze, his awareness of her the entire time. When she had finished, she looked at him, and for another electric instant, they locked eyes. Time stretched between him, and she saw his pale blue eyes flood navy before he closed them and resumed breathing, this time with proper ribcage expansion. She had no idea what it meant, but resolved to ask Danara at the first opportunity. After the breathing exercises, she had Odrin stand next to her and ran him through a series of stretches. Zira clicked her teeth in irritation. Odrin refused to do the movement slowly and kept attempting to increase speed to martial arts rather than stretching. If you won't follow my instructions, we will end this now. He glared at her. My apologies, but this feels ridiculous. The movements will build up your strength gently over time, like this. She demonstrated again, deliberately slowing the movement as she drew her arms up into a stretch above her head, before sweeping down in front of her to drop into a deep lunge. Odrin felt his eyes drawn again to her muscular physique. Her loose workout gear showed her smooth, lean muscles and her natural grace. He knew that being attracted to her was a terrible idea, but he couldn't help being drawn to her, to her humour, her strength. Odrun! She snapped her fingers in front of him. Where are you? He blushed, realising that he had blanked out, engrossed in watching her elegant movements. He wanted so badly to reach out and run his hand along the curve of her back, down to her round ass, to shape the softness he saw there in his palm. My apologies, Videk, what did you say? She frowned and chewed on her lip. Perhaps we should finish here for today if you are becoming fatigued. His heart spiked. No, my apologies. I was distracted, that's all. She reached out with her empathy and felt the blast of admiration from him, and her responding smile was slow and a little wicked. I see. He blushed again and she found herself charmed. He was a beautiful male, and when he wasn't being a cocky ass, he had a disarming manner that had surprised her into laughter more than once today. He shrugged, chagrined. You can't blame me. Her smile widened further. At least you have good taste. He looked at her boldly. I do. She laughed, a dark, husky sound. All right, Charming, show me what you've got. His brow furrowed in confusion. Huh? She reached over and tugged on a braid. Do the exercise, slowly. Yes, my lady. He mock bowed to her and moved into the stretch stance. He had barely begun before she was calling him to stop. Still too fast, here. She moved beside him and ran her hands along his shoulders and upper arms. Her touch was impersonal, supporting his arms while she guided him through the movements at the correct pace. The feline him in wanted to arch his back for her touch, to lean into her and rub himself against her, cover her in his scent, to demand that her impersonal tough linger become decidedly personal. He had to keep reminding himself that this female was not his. Attempting to cover his rising lust, he quipped, You know, if you want to touch me, you need only ask. You don't need to keep finding excuses. She barked a soft laugh, her face next to his as she moved his shoulders back through the movement. You wish. You aren't that charming. Yes, I am. Everyone says so. He smiled smugly, playing along. The maman says I'm the pride of the clan, she sniggered. I must remember to let Lenora know we need some renovations in here. For what? To accommodate your massive ego. It's not just my ego that's massive. That's what all the males say. Ferret males are superior specimens. He bared his fangs at her, and the subtext was not subtle. Bad kitty, she responded mildly. Would you like a measuring device? It would be my pleasure to present myself for your curiosity. For scientific purposes, of course. 
I'm not touching your device for anyone's pleasure. Now focus. She flicked him on the nose. He flashed a grin in response and performed the stretch, this time with what felt like agonising slowness. She nodded once on completion, satisfied, and moved on to demonstrate the next stretch. At the end of the session, Odrin's muscles were shaking with fatigue. I can't believe that moving so slowly is so challenging. I haven't felt this bad since my first days of warrior training. Well, you are still recovering, and from what I've observed of Verit training, I don't think you train for flexibility much. It's primarily about strength and stamina. She was correct. Get some sleep and a nutritious breakfast tomorrow. I'll see you at ten hundred hours before I have to go on shift. Yes, ma'am. She cocked her head, looking at him curiously. You may call me Zira, if you wish. Touched, he bowed slightly. Thank you for the honour, Zira. The walls were closing in. The dust was everywhere, clogging his throat. He couldn't breathe. He scrabbled against the rockfall, breaking a claw in his panic to find a way out. The sizzle of agony became another note in a symphony of pain in his body, his thigh and side screaming at him. He could feel wetness flowing down his left side, was aware that he was bleeding profusely. He tore at the rocks and succeeded only in creating another small slide of pebbles, successfully pinning himself by his legs. His rational brain took over, corralling the panic, pushing his fear into a ball at the back of his mind. He forced himself to lie still and reduce his heart rate. Motion was only stirring up the dust and creating more debris, making it harder to breathe. His racing heartbeat was only accelerating his blood loss. He lay there, still waiting for rescue. It never came. Oh, goddess, the roof was falling, falling. Odrin awoke with a gasp, his body drenched with sweat, his heart pounding. He gulped in air and threw his covers back, falling to his knees on the floor with a painful thud. He breathed deeply, attempted to calm his racing mind, reminding himself over and over again. I got out. They came for me. His body was filled with agitated energy. He had to move, to burn off some of this stress. He checked his HUD. It was nearly 5am. He could go for a run. As he stood, he winced. Maybe not. Kneeling on the floor wasn't helpful for his healing legs. He winced at the thought of Dinara's reaction to him breaking her no-cardio rule. Nope, definitely not worth it. He wished Zira was up so they could practice. The last couple of days with her while she trained him had brought him a peace and joy that he hadn't felt in years. He stilled. Yes, that was it. He could practice Delma Layat. He didn't need to wake Zira so early. He pulled on his shorts and tee and went to the rec centre. After days of training, he was more than familiar with how to set up the nanomats. In the dim early morning, he ran through the routines. He used the forms as medication sweeping his body through the motions again and again, enjoying the burn in his muscles, rebuilding after their long convalescence. When Zira finally arrived, he was calm and warmed up. She looked at him quizzically, unused to him being there before her, but ready to begin. Chapter 6. An Exercise in Self-Control Training Odrin was an exercise in self-control and rapidly becoming Zira's preferred brand of personal torture. For the past few days, she'd spent two hours every morning teaching him Delma Layat. He had proved an apt student, picking up the moves with ease and mastering the forms. Today they were going to graduate to sparring for the first time. From the very first day they had kept up their friendly flirting banter, and those hours with Odrin were rapidly becoming the high point of her day. Zira was both excited and apprehensive about getting up close to him. There was no way to spar without getting in each other's personal space, and it was becoming harder to remind herself that she was meant to be tutoring him and needed to keep a professional distance. Zira walked into the rec centre, unsurprised to find Odrin there before her. Typically, Zira arrived first, set up the nano blocks, and had a few minutes to settle herself. However, the past two days when she entered, Odrin was already there practising. She noticed that today, from the way his skin glistened and his shirt stuck to his back, he had been working out for some time already. His muscle tone and form had improved significantly in just the past few days. How was it possible for him to be so good-looking, especially after working out? Good morning, Odrin. Getting an early start? Good morning, Zira. He flashed her a dazzling smile that did not meet his eyes. It immediately rang warning bells. Odrin was far too charming for his own good, but never insincere. I am. Dinara had no need of me at Medbay this morning, so I wanted to go through some stretches first. 
Oh, okay. Just be careful not to overdo it. You don't want to strain anything. You're still on your recovery plan. He slashed an irritated glance at her. I know my own limits. I won't overdo it. I need to push myself to build up my strength. She held up her hands in defence. All right, all right, don't snap at me. I'm just concerned. Don't be. I'm fine. He calmed his voice, attempting to reassure her. But his shoulders remained stiff. It was so unlike the Odrin that she knew it took her by surprise, got her back up. What the hell crawled up your butt and died this morning? You don't need to be such a dick about it. Some people would appreciate having people that care about them. Some people aren't a qualified healer and a warrior, and therefore able to know what the hell they are doing. I'm not an invalid, I'm perfectly capable of doing a few stretches unsupervised. She glared at him, and he turned his back on her dismissively. All righty then, that puts me in my place. Whatever the fuck this attitude is, pull it back, Odrin. I'm doing this as a favour. I've got better things to do with my time that put up with your drama. Odrin didn't respond and resumed his stretching. Zira dropped her bag and took up her own position, moving into her warm-up stretches. She kept a discreet eye on Odrin, concerned about his sweating. If all he was doing was stretching, he shouldn't be that worked up. The positions of Del Malayat were intense, but rarely presented as sweating unless he was doing them wrong. She watched him move into the fifth form, advanced level, the stinger. He stretched forward, lifting a leg back behind him and above his head. Slowly he extended the stretch, lifting onto the toes of his foot on the ground. He raised his arms up and out into a dive position and held the stretch. With a critical eye she watched his form, grudgingly impressed with the precision. She waited for him to release, noting that he had passed a minute, the recommended maximum time for this move. As she watched, she noticed slight tremors start in his muscles, a tightening in his jaw, his calf muscles not. Enough, Odrin, release it. He didn't respond. I said enough, Odrin, you're holding too long. He remained silent, eyes closed, ignoring her. I said stop it now. She became increasingly concerned when she saw his calf cramp. His ankle began to hyperextend. She moved over beside him and struck at a pressure point behind his knee, and his entire leg crumpled, and he landed face first on the floor. What the hell are you doing? he yelled, as he attempted to push himself up. What am I doing? Are you insane? You nearly tore the ligaments in your leg. I know what I'm doing, he growled through gritted teeth. Oh really, come on then, Healer, let's see you get your ass up off the floor. She folded her arms and waited, watching him struggle to get his legs and arms under him, watching them shake. Come on, get up. You've got this so well in hand, so get up off the damned floor. He pushed himself up onto his knees before he fell again, his leg cramping and contorting. Oh, for the love of the goddess! She knelt and took his leg in her hands. He clamped his teeth together, forcing himself into stillness, determined not to call out in pain. She dug her thumbs into his calf muscle and firmly massaged his leg to release the strain. He swore a blue streak and his claws flashed out from his fingertips to dig into the black nanomat padding. She said nothing, just firmly massaged his leg, loosening up the cramped muscles and tendons. He watched her, feeling the slight calluses on her hands as she competently moved his ankle in a small circle, assessing the damage. Now that he wasn't in the haze of his workout, he realised with a chill that she was right. He had been a hair's breadth from tearing the ligaments in his leg. The shock of his own stupidity brought him crashing down into reality. He pushed himself up into a seated position, his leg still draped across her knees, and retracted his claws. Zira gently pushed his leg back onto the floor and looked at him silently. Look, Zira, I'm sorry. No, you're not. She studied him. My empathic senses aren't strong for a felotion, but even I can tell that you aren't sorry. Something is riding you, Odrin. You nearly caused yourself real damage today. She shook her head, and he saw in her eyes that she had made a decision. Speak to someone. You need to work this out, because today you made a reckless choice that could have harmed yourself. Next time you might make a reckless choice that harms someone else. He didn't know how to respond. She was right. Our training is over. Tell Dinara that you need another form of physical therapy. Please, Zira, don't end this. I'm sorry I was a creven, but... No, Odrin. My mind is made up. You need to talk to someone about this. Get some therapy or something before it sinks in and takes root. She stood up and dusted herself off, extending a hand to him. Come on, I'll help you to medbay. You need a compression bandage and some ice on that. He batted her hand away, bitterness making him cruel. No, I need the training. 
I need to get fit again. If you won't help me with that, then I need nothing from you. She looked at him for another long moment. Suit yourself, then. She turned and stomped off, grabbing her bag on the way out, and left Odrin sitting there on the mats alone. Zira exited the rec centre and turned left, dipping into the corner between the rec centre and the habitation pods, her heart racing in anger and fear. And hurt, her mind whispered. Admit it, you were starting to like him and he just burned it to the ground. She peered around the corner and waited. Furious as she was, she couldn't just leave without making sure he sought medical care. Eventually, she watched Odrin appear from the rec centre and limp painfully towards the med bay. She blew out a long breath. She'd been half expecting that he would ignore her advice and just go back to his own unit to sulk in the darkness. Whatever this was, he needed to deal with it. It was a poison eating away at him. Asterisk, 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 Odrin was furious and embarrassed as he limped into medbay. He had not made such a stupid error in training since he was a la. The past few days he had woken every night with the same nightmare, being trapped underground, dying. Except this time, no one came to save him. He rummaged in the emergency med stores, pulling out a cold pack and a set of compression bandages. Planting himself on the chair in his office and propping his foot up on a storage box, he set about bandaging himself. As he did, he cursed their limited medical supplies. Anywhere else he would have simply applied a catalyst patch, which would have accelerated his body's own immune system to restore the damage. But here they were rationing medical supplies, saving them for essential injuries only. Grimly, he admitted that if one of the warriors had made such a mistake, he would have referred them for therapy and assessment of their competence and fitness for duty. In clan interstellar warfare, there was no room for recklessness or failure to follow commands and safety protocols. Do you want to talk about it? A voice inquired. He looked up to see Dinara standing in the doorway. Nope. Her lips thinned. I see. Let's start again then. She pulled up a chair. We're going to have a little chat, Gila Odrin. He stiffened at the formality. Dinara, your attention is not required here. It is a sprain, nothing more. Then why are you broadcasting your anger and pain so loudly? What? Every felotion for half a scree can feel it, and frankly it's distressing. Dinara's eyes unfocused, in the way that Odrin had learned to recognise as a felotion accessing her empathic skills. Zira is deeply concerned. She hides it better than you do, but her psychic signature is upset. Dinara focused on Odrin again. I've never seen Zira ruffled. What happened? I had an accident while training, that's all. It happens and it's not a big deal. Then why isn't Zira here telling you off for an error and supervising your medical care? He sighed. Because I wouldn't let her. I see. She thinks I am an idiot. Did you give her reason to? He bristled for a moment before he nodded, letting the anger go and leaving only the stinging embarrassment. I made a stupid mistake. She stopped my training. What did you do? He grimaced. I'm so goddess damn tired of being sick. I'm Verit, a warrior and a healer. I'm tired of everyone asking if I'm all right. I'm tired of not being able to do the things I should. I'm Verit. And Verit males don't get sick, don't have long recovery periods. He shook his head, frustration welling up. It was bad enough that some clan members looked down on him for being a healer rather than a warrior, but to be weak as well, unacceptable. You just die. He looked at her in shock. It's a fact, Odrin. Ferret males either recover quickly or die on the battlefield. You are genetically engineered to take a beating and keep going. You have very little psychological framework for this kind of prolonged recovery. You experienced a highly traumatic incident. He pressed his lips together. He knew this. He was a healer that predominantly treated females. It was why he spent so much time on research. There wasn't much call for medical healers on Verit for males. So be a healer, Odrin. Heal thyself. What would you tell a patient if they presented like you are now? Dinara continued gently. You know what you would say. Perhaps extend yourself the same grace and kindness. She patted him on the arm. Think about it, I'll do up a new physical therapy plan for you. He shook his head in immediate denial. I want to continue with Delma Layat. He wanted to continue with Zira. The strong, smart female fascinated him. He had become addicted to her biting, sarcastic wit and frightening competence. Dinara raised an eyebrow. I thought you said that she declined to train you. Zira isn't in the habit of saying things she doesn't mean. Odran's lips thinned. He refused to accept defeat. 
I'll convince her. Be careful how much you push, Odrin. She doesn't owe you anything. He grinned at Dinara cockily. She likes me. She calls me charming. Dinara looked at him for a long moment. Charming only gets you so far, my friend. You aren't the only one with scars. Everyone is dealing with their own shit. Be careful where you go tramping with those enormous feet of yours. Later that night, Zira lay on her bed and flicked desultorily through the channels on the intergalactic entertainment net. It didn't matter what planet you were from. Storytelling was universal, and parents everywhere wanted to sit their spawn down to watch something to get a few minutes of peace. Every species had great deeds to tell, morals to impart, or humour, or whatever passed for humour, to lighten the hard times. She settled on a Galician drama, set several hundred years ago. It was highly popular, chronicling the life of one of their queens. The Galicians did well out of interstellar entertainment. They were a beautiful species, tall and inherently graceful with gossamer wings, four arms, and narrow, heart-shaped faces with overly large, jewel-coloured eyes. They were also expert performers and mimics, and could deliver incredible performances. The show was excellent, but she couldn't seem to focus. She was furious and deeply disappointed in Odrin. She wasn't really sure why she had only been training him for a week. Sure, they had a connection and some great banter, but they didn't actually know each other. They had made no promises, implied or otherwise. But you wanted to, her heart whispered. OK, so she liked him. Liked his charm, his intelligence, his sassiness, his inherent kindness. He was a gorgeous male, painted in gold and silver. She wasn't dead and it had been a long dry spell between partners. He's also an arrogant asshole, her brain reasoned. Charming was right. He was clearly doted on by the Maman, a favoured son in the clan, roguish and entirely too good-looking for his own good. He'd be a pain in her ass if they ever got together. There was also the darkness she occasionally sensed in him, a hard edge that she could never quite capture. It intrigued her. She gave up on the show. Turning off the display screen, she decided to turn in early. Between training Odran and her shifts, she had missed out on more than a few rest hours. Perhaps this moroseness was simply fatigue. Decided, she shucked out of her pants and turned off the main lighting, leaving on a dim nightlight. She lay down in just her oversized tee and punched the pillow a few times to get it into the right position. She had barely closed her eyes when a low buzzer sounded, and her HUD alerted her that Odrin was outside her door. Determined to ignore him, she pulled the covers up and closed her eyes again firmly. The buzzer sounded again. After a long moment, her HUD sent her a gentle ping, alerting her to an incoming call from Odrin. She groaned in irritation and blinked once to accept. Odrin's face filled her vision. You know this qualifies as harassment on some planets. Please talk to me, Zera. No. Please. I have nothing to say. Just listen, then. She groaned in aggravation. You have one minute. I'm listening. He paused. Can I come in? No. Talk or I go back to sleep. He took a deep breath. I wanted to apologise. You were right. I should have listened to you. My head isn't in the best space right now. And look, can I please come in or can you come out? I'd really rather do this face to face. Zira considered. On one hand, she was comfy in her cosy nest and really didn't want to get up. On the other hand, she had the feeling that he might stay out there all night if she said no. Ugh, fine. She got up and stomped over to the door, mashing the open pad. Odrin limped in and she motioned for him to sit on the end of the bed. Sit. Talk. She plopped down at the top of the bed, leaned against her bedhead and pulled the covers up over her bare legs. Odrin's brain seized up. He had been rehearsing this speech for hours, but in his imagining of how this would go, he had never considered this. Zira was gorgeous, all sleep rumpled. Her hair was down in a curled tangle, and she wore a loose black tee. He had caught a brief flash of her muscled, naked legs, covered in more of those intricate tattoos as she climbed into bed. It all derailed his well-prepared apology. Come on then, Odrin, spit it out. I don't have all night. I'm tired and need some sleep. What did you want to say that was so urgent it couldn't wait? He gathered his wayward thoughts and tried again. I wanted to say that I'm sorry. Truly. I... I don't know what was going on in my head. There was a long pause before his words dried up, his speech forgotten, and he finished lamely. So yeah, I'm sorry. Eventually Zira realised that nothing more was forthcoming. Okay, thanks for that. Are we done? Don't be like that. I'm trying to apologise. Can't you give me a break? 
Oh, I'm so sorry, my lord. Shall I sit quietly and flutter my eyes at you when you talk? He grit his teeth. Why did he think this was a good idea? Talking to her was an exercise in frustration. I'm trying to do the right thing here. Adults apologise when they fuck up. Do you have to be such a bitch about it? She narrowed her eyes, anger steaming off her. You haven't seen me be a bitch yet, Charming. You come here, demand to be let in. Give me a half-assed apology that doesn't actually say anything, then get pissed at me and defensive when I'm not bowled over by your glory. He raised his arms placatingly. Look, this isn't how I wanted it to go. I'll bet it's not. Will you just shut up for a fucking minute and let me speak? Why do you always have to have the last word? Her fury detonated. She knelt up, pointing at him. Let's get one thing clear, Odrin. I don't owe you anything. Not my time and not my attention. I was doing you a favour and you acted like a dick. You ignored me, my expertise and my advice. You spoke to me with disrespect and acted in a self-destructive manner. I won't be a party to that kind of bullshit. You want to hurt yourself, do it on your own time. He opened his mouth to speak. I'm not finished. Then you come here with this attitude and these demands. This apology isn't because you feel bad, it's because you feel you should apologise or you want something. More training, some sort of absolution or something. Whatever it is, I'm not the person you need to work this shit out. I'm not good at feelings and I'm not your maman or your therapist. There isn't anyone else, he roared, and she opened her mouth in shock. There isn't anyone else that I can talk to this about. Goddess knows I've tried. He scrubbed his hands over his face, tugging at his hair to relieve some of the strain. They just don't get it. Verit don't get sick, aren't weak. They can't understand what I'm going through. Zira swallowed, unsure how to navigate the well of pain that she had pierced. And you think I can? she asked quietly. Just because I'm Felotian, it doesn't mean that I'm good with people or feelings. He shook his head in denial, sighing heavily. Because I feel you get me. You see me in a way that others don't. She barked a harsh laugh. I've never been good at talking. At least if you hadn't injured yourself, I could have helped you spar to work out some of this frustration. He looked at her, captured by the yellow of her eyes in the dim light, reflecting in the darkness. His voice was husky. That's not the only way to work out frustration. Her pupils dilated, and he saw her breath catch when she caught his meaning. He moved so slowly, leaning forward to grip the back of her neck and pull her towards him. His lips were a hair's breadth away from hers when she whispered, This is a terrible idea. Monumentally bad. I think it's a great idea, he countered, their breaths mingling. Don't say no, my lady. She froze for a split second before making her decision, staring into his eyes, weighing his need, his sincerity. She surged into his arms and their kiss was an angry clash of teeth and tongues as they devoured each other. He used his hand to manoeuvre her head for the perfect fit and he drank her in. It was explosive and unexpected. The wave of his sensuality and need barreled through all her defences. His tongue delved into her mouth, tasting her, and he groaned as the scent of her arousal reached him. She climbed over to straddle him, fitting herself to him with just his pants between them, her legs wrapped around him, a delicious friction that stole her breath. Odrin set his teeth into the column of her throat and licked the salt of her skin lazily. Bad kitty, she murmured, the sultry complaint nothing like the censure it should have been. He dragged his fingers up her muscular legs, tracing her tattoos. His hands moulded that luscious ass that he had so desperately wanted to touch every day during training. He moaned into their kiss, and she tugged at his hair to pull his head back, allowing her to trail kisses down his jaw. This changes nothing, she snarled. You're still an ass. As you wish, my lady. This is just another form of physical therapy. Tell anyone about this and I'll kick you into next week. He grinned ferally at her, and she felt her heart flip in response. Goddess, she was so sunk. He tossed her onto the bed and went for the fastening of his pants when she stopped him. Slower, show me. He looked at her, and his breath caught for a second. Zira lay on the bed, wanton in the dim light. He knew his eyes would be changing colour, navy flooding them to accentuate his night vision. He didn't want to miss a single second of this. She was glorious in the dim light, her crystalline tattoos shimmering with fire. He undid the snaps of his pants and dropped them to the floor, pooling around his feet. He prowled up the bed towards her, a giant jungle cat. He used his tongue, licking in tiny sips. He grinned at her in the dark, laughing. Scream for me, my lady.
He delved in with teeth and tongue, torturing her. They twined with each other, playing and exploring. After an hour or more, they lay together, breathing heavily. She laughed in delight. Well, this was unexpected. He smiled darkly. What makes you think I'm finished, lady? She felt a whole body shiver at the dark dominance in his voice, so unexpected from the sassy, funny male she knew. Goddess knew she hated bossy males, so why the hell did she find this so damned hot? Somehow tonight, the healer had tuned into a dark fantasy she hadn't known she had. She wanted his darkness. All night he took his time, learning her secret places, and it was hours more before he deemed himself satisfied. He wrapped a big hand around her throat loosely, not enough to make her feel trapped, just enough to send her arousal soaring again at the implied dominance. She bared her teeth and wrapped her own hand around his braids, tugging his head back when he went to kiss her again lazily, holding him away. They locked eyes for an instant in a battle of wills before she flipped him, tangling her legs with him and ending up on top. She had a split second to enjoy her triumph, to smile smugly before he turned the tables on her, flipping her around in a move that she had most definitely not taught him, leaving her face down on the bed with him lying on top of her back, his hips pressing hers into the mattress as he spoke into her ear. Whatever will you do now, my lady? It seems I have you at my mercy. He bent down to set his teeth in her neck again, holding her in place while his claws whispered up her sides to the settle on her waist. Or perhaps I have you at my mercy. Are you going to do something about it, healer? Or are you too weak? He snarled at her barb, fire reigniting as his eyes glazed with rising lust. He leaned forward to whisper in her ear again, Yes, lady. She looked at him over her shoulder. Yes, now. He twined his fingers in her mane of hair. Say please. She laughed outright, delighting him and wiggled her butt, driving him to the edge. Please, healer. As you wish, my lady. Once more they played, before they finally collapsed, exhausted. He fell to the left, cradling her in his arms, breathing heavily, their hearts racing against each other. They stayed that way until their sweat cooled on their skin. Occasionally he dropped tiny kisses on the side of her cheek and neck, and she felt her heart crack open dangerously. Angry, rough coupling was one thing, but this, this tenderness threatened to undo her. This was caring, and she could become perilously addicted. Eventually he spoke into the quiet between them. Well, this was not how I saw tonight going. She gave a hushed laugh. Will you be adding this to your list of prescribed therapies, healer? Perhaps, although I'm not sure if many of the males here are my type. They might find my performance lacking enthusiasm. She smiled and winced slightly as they moved apart. I wouldn't say that you were lacking in enthusiasm. He looked at her with concern. Did I harm you? She shook her head, a little sore, but it will be a pleasant reminder tomorrow. She rolled over to look at him, nestling her head in the crook of his arm. Did I hurt you? She asked. You were the injured one. He snorted with laughter. I'm not so injured that I cannot partake in this pleasure. They lay in silence until Zera spoke. This is a little weird, isn't it? He nodded, stroking her tangled hair back from her forehead. Do you want me to go? Zera shrugged. The pause drew out, the tension growing thick between them. Zira thought it was strange to be so close to someone you felt like you were inside their skin, only to lie next to them minutes later and have them feel so far away. Odrin considered. It might be best if I went. We can talk about this, whatever this is, tomorrow. Zira smiled crookedly. Are you sure you'll want to talk about this tomorrow? Her question betrayed her anxiety. He seemed taken aback. Why would I not? This isn't exactly how I planned our first night to go, but now that it has happened, you are glorious, my goddess. I am honoured that you elected to spend your time with me. Zira searched his eyes for another long moment. All right, perhaps it's best if you go. If you still feel the same tomorrow, we can do breakfast. Do you wish to be seen with me? You were the one threatening me, should I tell anyone? Sensing his hurt, she reached out to smooth his frown with a fingertip. It's not that I don't wish to be seen with you. There's just a lot of pressure here. Everyone will be watching. It might be nice to work out what we feel for each other before everyone else gets involved. All right, if that is your wish. I... I must be honest, Zira. I did not intend for this to happen. I do not regret it, not for a second. But there are things we must discuss before we go any further. Oh, goddess, if you tell me you are already mated, 
he laughed and cut her off, placing his hand over her mouth. I am not already mated. He kissed her soundly. There are things we must discuss, but they can wait until tomorrow. I will leave you to your rest. We can share breakfast in the morning and discuss our next steps. He stood and pulled on his clothing, hiding a wince at the pain in his leg and side. He would never let her see that their exertions had caused him any discomfort. I will keep quiet for a while, Zira, but I have no desire to hide our liaison. She knelt on the bed and took him in her arms. I wouldn't want to either, just for a little, until we know how we feel and if we want to go public. Chapter 7. Briefing. Encrypted transmission, Sadai Delegate, Amira Lien to Kadek Maral Lien. Sister, I have received concerning news. The Alliance has dispatched a Malurian, Makenroy, as their envoy to Colony 29. Officially, it is to render assistance after your challenges. Unofficially, I don't know. They did not consult me, which is highly unusual as the Philosian representative for the colony. I have spoken to Maman Zalud, the Verit representative, and she did not know either. Someone is scheming here, but to what end, I don't yet know. Take care of yourself and your colony. I will let you know when I find out more. End transmission. Zira woke the next morning and lay in bed, feeling relaxed and happy in a way that she hadn't in years. She contemplated the day ahead. She was off shift. She would find Odrun, have their breakfast and discuss the next steps. Odrun would be doing his paperwork in Medbay until lunch, so she could go annoy Fila for a while. After, maybe they could go to that oasis in the forest that Danara had told her about. A little swim would be great for his rehabilitation, and seeing Odrun shirtless and wet would certainly be good for her. She gave a delicious full body stretch. She couldn't believe she was enjoying the thought of seeing him again. After yesterday's training session, she had thought their brief friendship was over, but last night changed everything. Sure, he was an arrogant pain in the ass, but he was also funny and charming, and there weren't many males willing to go head to head with her. She felt a twinge of fear, caution that she was moving too quickly with him, that she should slow down and pull back, but she quashed it ruthlessly. She was on a new planet, and she gave herself permission to try this new relationship with openness and optimism. Plan for the day decided, she hopped up into her sonic shower, smearing her skin with a lovely scented cleanser that she had bought in a tiny market stall on Valhalla. Valhalla was a market planet, the entire colony covered in hundreds of different markets and bazaars, all forming a single intricate mosaic of colour and noise and scent. She had spent several wild days there with her sisters on her last vacation, flitting between the bars, restaurants and markets. She had adored the Rilaza, the perfume and cosmetics market, the most. It had been a riot to her senses, and she had spent far too much money on lotions and potions, but she didn't regret it for a moment. After spending so much of her life as a warrior, she treasured her small feminine indulgences. Her tattoos were another example, making her feel powerful and beautiful while doing nothing to impede her efficiency as a warrior. She admired her latest addition, a tracery of lace in shimmering crystal ink just over her collarbones and dipping down her sternum. After her shower, she braided her tail of hair, weaving a string of beaten gold beads through the heavy mass of blonde-shot brunette curls, and scratched her nails slightly over the bristles on the shaved sides of her head, deciding it could wait another day before she shaved again. Considering she selected a light elitum necklace. She had barely worn any adornment in the month she'd been here. The entire colony had been advised to stay in their AI-monitored jumpsuits until the perimeter was secured, so that an alert could be sounded if someone was harmed. This week was the first time they had been granted permission to wear personal clothing while not on duty. She held the necklace up to her throat, and the morphic rope wound itself sinuously around her neck and down to form a little hook above her cleavage, where a pendant could be attached. The AI-controlled rope grew tiny tendrils, detecting her crystal ink tattoo and designing a light metallic tracery of droplets that complemented and framed the lace whorls in her skin. When the elitum had settled into its final design, she attached a tiny triple-headed goddess pendant to the hook provided, and stopped to admire the design. The Elitum was never the same design twice, responding to a complex set of environmental and personal parameters. While it was programmable to an extent, the beauty of Elitum jewellery was in their uniqueness. They were wearable, one-of-a-kind art. The very nature of the design was ephemeral. As soon as she removed the jewellery, it would return to its inert morphic rope state. 
This time the elitum looked like moonlight on beads of water, scattered along the lace, a pale platinum slash silver with hints of palest blue. It was a typically Phalosian product, designed to harmonise and interact with its external environment, replicating natural shapes and concepts, and was one of their most popular exports. Elitum was also worth an arm and a leg. This piece had been a gift from her mother's and all of her sisters combined, and she adored it. Next, she selected a light, loose-knit wrap dress in a pretty light green and was pulling on her sandals when she was interrupted by a ping on her HUD. Blinking to accept, it was an audio comm from Lucius, instructing her to attend the cadet's office immediately for an urgent briefing. She stilled. She was a VDEC, a senior officer, but she rarely interacted with the cadet in a formal capacity, most of her orders coming through Gadek Sraya, or Lucius, as first warrior. She cast a quick eye over her outfit, deciding it would be acceptable as she was off-shift and would not have been expected to be in uniform. Zira reached the Kadex office at the same time as Odrin. She flashed him a smile and felt a flush of pride when he stopped in his tracks at the sight of her. He slowly looked her up and down, his eyes full of carnal knowledge from the night before. His gaze followed her crystal tattoo to her cleavage, before continuing his inspection down, taking in every curve. You look most beautiful, my lady. Zira was mortified when she felt the blush creep up her neck, and she resisted an urge to smooth her dress. Her mouth dry, she croaked out a response. Back to my lady. I thought we were on a first-name basis. It seemed appropriate. His voice was husky. He reached out, placed a gentle fingertip on her sternum, and it took her a moment to realise that he had lifted the goddess pendant from her chest to examine it. May I? She nodded, speechless, feeling strangely vulnerable in the daylight, without the distance of the training room or her athletic clothing, without the hushed darkness of her apartment. There she could flirt and laugh and joke, secure in her place of power. Here? It was suddenly very real, and she felt like she had stepped into quicksand. He moved closer to her, examining the little image in the light. This is beautiful. This is a representation of the goddess, yes? She nodded again, wondering when exactly the power of speech had deserted her. I had forgotten that Phalotians worship the triple goddess as well. On Verit they are Manat Rai, Evanat Rai and Dalat Rai, the goddess with three faces. Zira found herself responding. It is a common belief system. In species with sexual dimorphism, where a female bears children, it often becomes a founding spirituality that a goddess mother figure births and protects the universe. She was mortified. What the hell was she saying? Zira could feel herself speaking, but had absolutely no control over the words coming out of her mouth. Odrin's closeness, the warmth of his fingers against her collarbone, his breath against her face. All of it brought her thoughts to a screeching halt. Fascinating. She could see him fixated on her mouth, just a couple of inches separating them. When we train, you often remind me of Dalat Rai, her warrior aspect. Her breath exhaled in a rush. I... It is good to see you on your feet, healer. Like flicking a switch, Odrin's face calmed, his emotions shuttered. A charming smile appeared on his visage. It was disconcerting the speed with which he changed personas, which was the real Odrin, the dark, intense stranger from last night, dominant and playful, the flirtatious male from training, or this charming stranger... He switched faces with an ease that unsettled her, making her realise that she didn't know the real Odran at all. Odran stepped away and turned around, bowing in one smooth motion to the maman as she shuffled up, leaning on her mate, Prime Brune, and her maman la aide. Zira arranged her face into a neutral expression, reeling back her surging emotions and concealing her shock at the state of the other female. In the last month, the maman had deteriorated significantly, Gone was the diminutive, elegant queen. In her place was a withered, frail female. My lady! Audran's voice was calm, controlled, betraying nothing of the intensity of their interaction. How may I aid you? The maman smiled at him, and it amazed Zera to see genuine warmth in her clear gaze. Nothing, healer. I thank the goddess that you are recovering, but you are still far too thin. Save your energy for your own healing journey. She examined him carefully and grunted, apparently satisfied with whatever her inspection had revealed. At least Dinara seems able to assist you. She's not entirely incompetent. 
Zira opened her mouth to defend Danara, but a fit of coughing overtook the mammal. She fumbled for a cloth and Skara handed her an embroidered linen square, the Prime and Odran exchanging pained glances over her head. Come, Odie, walk in with me. Tell me about your treatment plan. I'm always keen to hear from you. She reached out a claw-like hand and gripped Odran around his wrist as the Prime shifted to help her. A tender Skara. I know you have wished to inquire after the healer's health. Skara nodded gracefully, beaming at Odran as she fell into step with them. Zira exhaled a gusty breath, trying to get a handle on herself. Her heart was racing, too many emotions flooding her in a brief space of time. She took several long breaths, grounding herself, before she followed the others into the admin building towards the Kadex office. The conference table was a long oval. The Kadex was already seated at the head of the table, every inch the military leader in her Felosian pale blue jumpsuit and cropped silver hair. Felosians were a people painted in vibrant colour, and the Kadex was no exception, her skin a dark, ruddy red. She had the classic Felosian yellow eyes with large black pupils. Lucius and Danara sat on her right, leaving a spare seat between them and the Gadek Sreya. Sreya motioned her to take the vacant spot between her and Lucius, while Odrin and the Mammon's party sat opposite her. The Kadek wasted no time. Thank you all for coming. My apologies for the abrupt summons. We have received urgent news. The Kadex eyes flickered as she interfaced with her HUD to active the streaming screen over the table. An image of a 3D star map appeared, showing their sector, then zooming out to a red blinking dot several sectors away. A countdown timer appeared in the top right corner. In less than a week, an Alliance envoy will be arriving. Officially, they are coming to provide support and assistance, given the disruptions we have experienced during the colony establishment. Zira nodded in understanding. The first month had been chaos. Multiple supplies had been stolen, and the preliminary surveys had been wildly inaccurate, meaning that their security perimeter had taken weeks to establish. There was something in the environment that meant that scanning technology was very limited, even with the compensating algorithms that Sraya and her team had developed. The Alliance had sent replacement supplies, and the replacement ship had also been destroyed, supposedly by pirates. Someone wanted to derail the establishment of the new colony. The cadet had been forced to publicly execute a saboteur that had been found. Belatedly, Zira realised the others were silent, and she felt their spike of anxiety. Why would they be anxious about Alliance help? Lucius spoke into the silence. You said officially. What is it you believe they are here to do unofficially? The cadet took a deep breath. I have been given confidential intel that the envoy is McEnroy. A Malurian. The maman sucked in a sharp breath. Decline their visit, immediately. We cannot allow them to come here. Lucius snarled. For once I agree with the maman. A Malurian cannot set a single claw on this planet. Danara lifted a finger to speak. My apologies, but can someone please fill me in? What is wrong with a Malurian? What is a Malurian? The maman looked like she had sucked a lemon. They are a predatory alien species. Not human template, not part of the Alliance. They are highly active in interstellar politics and are often used in treaty negotiations as intermediaries and negotiators, she grimaced. They are also well known as assassins and spies for hire. They are extremely expensive. Odrin frowned. That makes little sense. The Alliance has an entire planet full of administrators. This is the first new colony in a century. Why would they send an alien as an envoy, especially one they had to pay for? Zira nodded again as she considered the implications. The Alliance was deeply xenophobic. The entire purpose of the Alliance was to advance the interests of human template species in a universe that was brimming with kingdoms, hives, empires and conglomerates of other species. They particularly hated giving away Alliance funds and resources to other species when a human template species could do the job. The Kedex spoke softly. Malurians are known to work for Svoboda. It was like a bomb dropped into the room, the maman hissed, the Prime snarled and Lucius started swearing. Zira was genuinely impressed with some of the colour in his language. She noted a few phrases down for use later. The cadet looked at Zira. My apologies, Zira. I know you haven't been fully briefed on the background yet. Suffice to say, we have evidence that Svoboda is behind the theft and destruction of our supplies and the saboteur last year. They also unsuccessfully tried to have the colony establishment stopped a couple of years ago. Zira's brow furrowed. 
There was clearly a lot more going on than she was aware of, and she still wasn't entirely sure why she was here with the colony leadership. The Maman was furious. We absolutely cannot have a Malurian here. You must decline the visit. We are in a fragile state right now. If they find out before we are ready, dot, 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 it would be a disaster. It could jeopardize everything. Zira spoke up. Excuse me, Kadek, but I still don't understand. While I get that it's not desirable to have them here, the colony is ours, deeded by the Alliance. Surely security can closely supervise them during their review. What could they possibly discover that could jeopardize everything? The Kadek regarded Zira for a long moment before looking at Sreya and nodding. Sreya turned to her. Last month, Dinara discovered Zeeland Beta D on the planet. Large deposits. Zira's jaw dropped as Sreya continued. It is resistant to scanning, so the planetary surveys missed it. It's what has been interfering with our survey. If word gets out, we'll have every prospector, pirate, researcher and petty king in this part of the galaxy descend on us. We cannot defend ourselves yet. It will take months to set up a full planetary defence system. Zira closed her mouth with a snap, her mind reeling with the implications. This will change the power structure of this galaxy. The others looked at her gravely. The cadet nodded to Sreya again. Tell her the rest. Sreya continued. When Odrin was injured, he and his team were investigating a crater site a couple of days away. They found evidence of ancient alien tech. Do you know what that means? Zira's head spun with the implications. The presence of ancient alien tech makes this a protected heritage site. It automatically gives the Alliance the right to take over and evict us by revoking the colony deed. If they find out about the tech, it's all the excuse they'll need to take the planet and the Zeeland for their own. Sreya smiled approvingly. All the more reason you must decline them, the Maman interjected. Perhaps not, my lady, Odrin murmured, ignoring the Maman when she turned a dark glare on him. If we decline, it will attract attention. Why would we not want help after all of our troubles? Surely there's something to hide if we don't wish an outside observer. The Kadek hummed in agreement. As part of the Alliance Charter, they may send delegates whenever they wish. Officially, this is a friendly envoy. If we reject, it could well become a less friendly investigator. Then we will reject them too, the Maman replied hotly. And then what? The might of the Alliance armies? That path only leads to escalation and does not solve the problem. The Prime mused, Perhaps we can make up some excuse. Say there is an illness or some such. Both Dinara and Odrin shook their head in response, and Dinara explained, If there is a serious illness, they are required to send aid under Alliance Charter. We'll be crawling with medical personnel in weeks. Even if we said that it had miraculously gone away, they'd see through it quickly. There would be no trace markers of illness in our bodies. Or worse, they could decide to quarantine the planet. We'd never be able to build up enough military defences to protect ourselves if they can't get past a quarantine blockade. The Maman bared her teeth. Then think of something. The Kadek replied mildly. If you would stop issuing orders for a moment, Maman, then I will share the plan that my team has come up with. The Maman closed her mouth with a snap, and Zira held in an inappropriate urge to giggle. She looked like an indignant house cat. Our only choice is misdirection. We are not yet ready for this confrontation. We must allow the envoy to come and manage what they see to prevent any accidental disclosure. It should not be too challenging. The only people that know are the colony leadership, and now Odrin, Dinara, and young Skara. Lucius and Sreya will manage the envoy between them, ensuring that any evidence of Zilan is not found. The Mamon glared daggers at the Kadek, but remained silent as she continued. We have one priority. We must discover where the alien tech is before this envoy arrives, and how much exactly. It will guide how we structure our interactions. Zira, Odran. Since your accident, we have been planning how we might re-enter the crater chamber in a safer manner. We were hoping to give you more time to recuperate, Odran, but matters have overtaken us. Zira's heart sank. They couldn't possibly be talking about sending out Odran. He had received major surgery just weeks ago. He had been out of bed for less than two weeks, and he could barely complete a couple of hours of Del Malayat. He could never manage a full mission. Tomorrow you will leave for the crater site. The engineering team has rigged up landing beacons and comms relays. Zira, you will lead a team to establish a temporary base at the crater site. You will be assigned a small security force, an engineer, and Odrin will act as your scientific advisor and guide. Stealth is paramount. Your primary mission is to locate the ancient tech if it is there, 
make a preliminary assessment, secure the site, report back, and await further orders. You and your team will mid-air drop at the crater. Zira nodded, determined to succeed. This was the first senior mission the Kadek had assigned to her, and she had a fierce desire to prove worthy. Thank you, ma'am, for trusting me with this mission. Zira sucked in a breath, knowing what she needed to do as mission commander, even as it broke her heart. Bracing herself for what would come after, she took a deep breath and raised her hand. If I may, though, I would advise against taking Healer Odrin. She did not look at him, but out of the corner of her eye, she saw him whip around, confusion, hurt and anger on his face. While Odrin is a fine scientist, he has not yet recovered sufficiently for this mission. I have been conducting physical therapy exercises with him daily, and am acutely aware of his condition. I request another scientist be assigned. If I take one of the security personnel with me that was on the original crater site mission, they could also act as a guide. The cadet raised an eyebrow. I know that Healer Odrin is not fully recovered, but the chief healer advises me she has been monitoring his condition daily and that he has recovered enough to participate in this mission in an advisory capacity. Your request is denied. The more people we bring into this, the more people know, and the harder this will be to keep contained. Zira could hardly breathe, her rising panic for Odrin clogging her throat. Her heartache at upsetting Odrin, and her sense of duty formed a churning ball of emotion in her stomach. She wanted to vomit. Danara leaned forward, sensing her stress. Verit physiology is highly robust, Zira. Provided that Odrin does not have another cavern fall on him or do anything foolish to overexert himself, he should be fine. Zira frowned at Danara. I cannot control all parameters of a mission, Chief Healer. Even with the best planning, things happen. She pulled herself upright in her chair, stuffing her emotions down. Still, my objection is noted. I accept your decision, Kadek. You know, I am sitting right here, and I am a fully qualified healer. I am capable of speaking for myself and determining my own fitness. Odrin looked at Zira stonily. Your medical opinion is both incorrect and unnecessary, Videk. Zira's heart pounded in her ears, drowning in a tidal wave of his betrayal and anger, and her own churning fear that in his desire to prove himself he would do himself more harm. Before Zira could speak... Danara's cool voice cut through their dialogue again. Actually, Healer, your medical opinion does not count. As I made clear to you before, in this case, you are a normal patient. I am Chief Healer, and it is my decision whether personnel are cleared for duty. Odrin went to retort as Danara continued to speak over him. The v deck is well within her rights to question whether injured personnel assigned to her have been cleared for duty. It is essential that she be aware of the capabilities and limitations of her team. In normal circumstances, you would not have been cleared for more than light duties for another week. However, this is an emergency. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The word limitations left a bitter taste in Odrin's mouth, and he barely heard the rest of the meeting. He couldn't believe that Zira had requested him to be removed from the team. Hadn't he tried hard enough? Proved that he was both warrior and healer? After their night together, when he had bared his soul... The magnitude of her betrayal was huge, a leaden weight against his heart. He felt the red rage build, his claws slicing at the insides of his fingers, desperate to release. His people referred to it as the dark stranger, the beast within. The scientist in him knew it was his genetic adaptations responding to stress, flooding him with a biochemical stew designed to help him survive on a battlefield, amping up his aggression, reflexes, senses, focus and processing skills damping down his pain receptors and impulse control. But the warrior, the warrior, was furious and wanted to succumb to the instincts driving him to fight, to take revenge on his enemies. He stormed out of the meeting as soon as he could and leaned against the wall outside of the admin building, breathing deeply, trying to calm his furious response to Zira's betrayal. As he reined in his surging emotions, he felt a cold creep over him an icy fury that replaced the violent urges with the calm patience of the feline predator that was part of his genetic heritage. He opened his eyes when Zira came out, and as he saw her turn to him, he spun to walk away. He did not want to have this confrontation right now, when he might say things that could not be taken back. Odrin, wait! She reached out to touch him and he jerked away, ignoring the flash of hurt in her eyes. I'm sorry if I offended you, but I'm genuinely concerned about your welfare. 
It's my duty to ensure that the team is fit for the mission. It's fine, Videk, you have a job to do. Don't be like that. Like what? he hissed. You want to forget what we've done, who we were becoming to each other, just be professional, fine. She folded her arms defensively. You're being childish. Am I? Tell me, how would you feel if I told you that you weren't fit for duty? If you had been training specifically for one mission and I said you were weak, incapable. I never said you were weak and incapable. You are injured and it takes time to recover. It's nothing to be ashamed of. She paused, and as he watched, he saw her face shudder, saw her totally shut down, and it chilled him to the bone. You know what, Odrin? If you made that assessment about my condition, I would accept your decision. I'd respect your position and authority. His temper detonated. Bullshit. Don't you stand there and tell me that our personal interactions had no bearing on your professional judgment. Her eyes narrowed and she stiffened. Think what you will, Healer. Just make sure you follow my orders, and don't get so carried away with proving you are well that you run headlong into trouble again. I don't feel like carrying your sorry ass back through the jungle. He saluted her insolently, and she gritted her teeth, spun on her heel and stalked off. He resisted the urge to pound the wall next to him. All he'd do was add a broken hand to his list of deficiencies. Walk with me, brother. Lucius loomed in the doorway. Not right now, Luke. What made you think it was a request? Odrin gave a half-hearted snarl and pushed him away. Really, Luke, I'm not good company just now. Lucius slung his arm around Odrin's neck and towed him towards the perimeter of the camp. Move your ass, warrior. Time to run off some of that stress so you can think clearly. I'm injured. I shouldn't be running. The acid dripped from his words, settling into his veins. He trudged reluctantly behind Lucius like a stubborn puppy. We aren't going far, responded Lucius placidly. They reached the perimeter line within a few minutes, and the woods loomed before them. Now jog. Lucius cuffed him on the back of his head, eliciting a startled yelp. One look at the first warrior, and Odrin knew that a less friendly whack was coming if he did not comply. With a sigh, he trotted off at a slow, gentle jog. Lucius and Odrin trotted along in the warming morning light, the air crisp. Tiny jewel-coloured birds flittered between the gnarled trunks of the trees, and an occasional unseen critter rustled in the underbrush. As Odrin ran, his muscles loosened, and he felt some of the tension drain out of him. Long minutes later, Lucius took the lead, and Odrin realised Luke had a destination in mind, rather than just aimless wandering. They emerged out to a cliffside clearing with a stunning view down a ravine to the river below, and the ocean in the distance. Lucius clambered over some rocks to sit on a large flat plinth, dangling his legs over the side. Gingerly, Odrin sat next to him, feeling his ribs and legs spiking in pain in warning. I don't want to talk about it. All right, Lucius offered him a drink from his water canteen. Odrin looked at him suspiciously and accepted the drink. It wasn't like Lucius to give up without a fight. It usually meant that he had a sneaky strategy up his sleeve that his opponent wouldn't see coming. How is your leg? Fine. Uh-huh, that's why you limped that whole last scree, was it? Odrin hunched his back, feeling like a scolded la. It aches, he finally responded. Have you mentioned this to Dinara? I don't need to. I know what I'm doing. It's fine. It's her job to monitor your condition. What would you say to a patient hiding pain from you? Odrin remained mutinously silent. Dinara cares about you and your well-being. She's also a brilliant healer. Don't discount her assessment and don't undermine her by hiding information necessary for her to do her job. Odrin heard the threat hidden in the mild words. Lucius was fairly protective of his new mate and wouldn't hesitate to reprimand a male that harmed her. Zira cares about you as well, Odrin snarled at him, baring his fangs. I said I didn't want to talk about it. She is your commanding officer for this mission, Odrin. Do not shame our clan by disobeying your commander because of a personal situation. Or do you think she is not worthy of being your commander? That her judgment is impaired? Do you challenge her right to command? Shock knocked Odrin back from the edge of his anger. I would never disrespect her that way. She is a brilliant warrior. You did today. You challenged her judgment in front of the leadership group and her own commander. Lucius looked him in the eyes properly for the first time since the meeting, and Odrin realised Luke was truly angry with him. It dawned on him that this little chat might not be about his own emotional state, but was his first warrior giving him a chance to explain his disrespect and disobedience to a senior officer. I... 
I didn't. You did. Lucius's voice was firm. You seem to have forgotten the way of the warrior, Odrin. You are a male of the Dathalka clan and a public representation of our values and culture. You will never disrespect or disobey your commanding office in public again, or you will face a reprimand. She was wrong. Then you discuss your disagreement in private. If you cannot follow her orders or question her assessment, you come to me. Am I understood? Odrin nodded, feeling sick at the realisation of how close he had come to outright disobedience. I am sorry, Luke. I will apologise to her. Lucius returned his attention to the view. That is a good idea, and for what it is worth, I agree with the Videk and would have made the same assessment. You are in pain after just a few scree of gentle running. If this was any mission other than advisory, I would have sidelined you myself. Odrin didn't respond, acutely aware of the pain in his leg and side. I understand it is hard, this long recuperation. It is unknown to Verit, but if you push too fast... You will re-injure yourself and will be out for months. You may well cause permanent damage that cannot be repaired. Consider that if my words mean nothing to you. Lucius stilled, his eyes flickering as he accepted a HUD call before he beamed. My mate is off duty and requests my presence. I suggest you take this time in nature to re-centre yourself and remember who you are. I will see you off on your mission tomorrow at the airfield. Lucius stood and clamped a hand on his shoulder in silent support before he left. Chapter 8, Drop Zone. Encrypted transmission from Burrow to Envoy. Agent Agrentau indicated that the colony had discovered something on the planet. Locate and retrieve information as an immediate priority. Reply Envoy to Burrow. Confirmed. Approaching the colony now. End transmission. Zira stood at the airfield in the pre-dawn light with her security team. Tarlak Sar and Tidek Ariel were solid personnel that she had sparred and run simulations with and she was confident in their capabilities. Ariel, tiny for a Philosian with short natural blue hair betraying her father's alien heritage, was an expert in weapons. Tarlac was an exceptional Verit warrior, fast, smart and efficient. She could not have asked for a better security detail. Odrin and her assigned engineer, Olfa Parr, had yet to appear. Zira was calm. Her training came to the fore, helping her focus on her mission, pushing personal concerns aside. Distractions were dangerous. Any time her mind strayed to Odrin, she ruthlessly wrenched it back into line. She had spent the night studying the briefings from the previous missions, as well as every scrap of information she could gain on ancient tech and Zilan available on the public net. The first sun was peeking over the hillside when Lucius appeared, Odrin and Olfa beside him. Huh, apparently the first warrior had been giving his males a pep talk. Good for them. She was mildly jealous. She'd never admit it, but she could use a pep talk herself right about now. Lucius gave her a polite nod, which she returned, and motioned for the group to circle. You have all received your pre-mission briefings. Videx Zera will go over your assignments with you on the ship on the way. You will find the equipment already on board. I am here to reiterate that this mission is top priority. You will maintain the highest levels of stealth and secrecy both in mission and afterwards. When you return to the colony... We do not expect any danger on this trip. It is reconnaissance and base establishment only, but as always, you should be prepared for any difficulty that you may find. We have already found one saboteur on this planet. There may be more. Live ammunition is authorised. Zira felt the shock and understanding of the seriousness of the situation ripple through the team. She wasn't a strong empath compared to many Philosians, but her empathy was strong enough given the physical proximity of the group. She felt for their different responses, each giving her an insight into how they would react in the field. As expected, Ariel and Tarlac remained calm, their attention heightened, although Tarlac was also excited about the prospect of combat. Odrun was sullen, muted, and she supposed he was still smarting from yesterday. That couldn't be helped. Ulfa was highly anxious and regretting eating such a large pre-flight breakfast. She would need to monitor the young technician. Lucius turned to her. You are in command, Videk. We have compensated for distortion in comms, so you should be able to communicate via HUD while on the surface, and perhaps a couple of levels down into the cavern. Any lower, and you'll need to install the comms repeater boosters to get a signal with any reliability. She nodded. Call if you need us. We can be there in a couple of hours. He crossed his right arm across his chest and bowed formally to her, then turned and walked off the airfield. 
She took a deep breath and turned to her team. All right, everybody on board. Briefing as soon as we are in the air. She moved to the aircraft, a medium-sized transport vessel in a dull grey metal, slightly pitted from previous hard usage. It had a single large hold with bench seating on either side, capable of seating up to 20 personnel. Their equipment was piled up in the centre in three large travel crates, strapped to the floor with yellow webbing. She stood at the gangway, watching her team board before walking after them and pulling the door closed behind her. Once on board, she moved to the flight area, where she greeted Vordan Parr, the pilot. All on board, pilot. Ready to go when you are. Thank you, V-Deck. Pre-flight is done. We are ready to go. Thanking him, she returned to the cabin, ensuring that everyone was seated and strapped in before dropping into a spare seat next to Ariel. The weapons specialist smiled faintly at her, then closed her eyes, leaning her head back. Smart female, it was still early and today was going to be arduous. Odrin sat across from her. His gaze snagged hers, trying to catch her attention. She smiled politely at him and closed her eyes, determined not to be distracted by their personal drama. She really couldn't have chosen a worse time to break her dry spell. What the hell had she been thinking? She was stuck on this damned colony with him for at least a year. The transport jerked for a moment before it smoothly took off into a gentle ascent. Her HUD pinged discreetly and she opened her eyes and blinked once to accept the message. It was a text-only message from Odrin. She stifled a groan. Can we talk? Her eyes shot over to meet his and he lifted an eyebrow inquiringly. She glared at him, then closed her eyes again, her jaw set. Her HUD pinged again and she gritted her teeth. It pinged again. She sent him a message. I know this relationship thing is new to you, so for reference this is really annoying. It is not winning you any friends. It pinged again and again. Hissing out a breath, she accepted the messages. Please. I want to apologise, I was an asshole. She clamped her mouth tight in case she accidentally swore at him. She would be professional even if it gave her an aneurysm. Using the slow, visual text interface, she painstakingly messaged back, Seriously, you want to do this now? This is not a good time. Please, he immediately responded. Make a fist, now punch yourself with it. Better yet, take out your knife and stab yourself. He burst out laughing and Ariel spoke into the silence. Whatever you two are saying to each other, either share with the group or shut up. I want to get another half hour sleep before we need to do mission briefs. She opened her eyes and looked at Zira. Respectfully, ma'am. Zira flushed crimson, gave Odrin one final death glare, and closed her eyes again to go over her mission plan in her head as the transport flew on towards the crater. She let her mind drift, going over the plan she had developed, until Vorden messaged her they were twenty minutes out from their destination. All right, everyone. We are twenty minutes out. Mission briefing. Pay attention. The others sat upright to listen. She streamed the site plan to their shared HUD channel. It appeared in bright blue, overlaying their vision. As she spoke, various sections of the map lit up in orange to indicate their targets. The crater pillars and surrounding area are unstable, made of a porous rock liable to crumble under pressure. We cannot safely land the transport, so we will drop into the north end of the crater site. Once down, we will set up a beacon while Vorden circles. Once the beacon is up, our equipment will be mid-air dropped after us, and it will home in on the beacon automatically. She pointed to Ulfa and Odran. You two are on beacon duty. It is your priority. Phase one will be to establish a secure base. Tarlac and Ariel, you will secure the site. I want perimeter scan bots installed in the walls and a shield generator up within an hour. Ulfa and Odran, once the beacon is done and the equipment is down, you will set up camp. Acknowledge. Ariel and Tarlac snapped out. Acknowledged, Videk. Odran and Ulfa startled belatedly realising this was a required response before confirming their ascent. Phase two will be to scout the crater and install stabilising tech. Primary objective is to locate any evidence of ancient alien technology. We will start by looking for the site that Odrin found last time. Odrin and a security officer will be our scout team. Ulfa, you will work on installing the supplementary equipment such as comms boosters, scanners and anti-grav bots which we will need if we find the tech. You will be assigned a security officer at all times. One security officer will remain off rotation. Security personnel will work in shifts of eight hours. No one goes anywhere alone. Aside from the potential of another saboteur, the area is prone to cave-ins. No one wants to be stuck in the dark alone when no one knows where you are. Acknowledge. 
the group chorused, acknowledged Videk. Assuming we find the tech, phase three will be assessment and relay of data. Ulfa and Odrin will catalogue and assess whatever we find and prepare a report for Colony Command. From there, we will await further orders. Questions? She paused, waiting. Ulfa looked both excited and terrified, but the others seemed calm and ready. Very well. Buddy up, check each other's suits and then your packs. We reach mid-air drop zone in ten minutes. Final acknowledgement. The last response was firm. Acknowledged, Videk. She watched as Tarlac turned to Ulfa and began examining the straps on his jumpsuit. They had been outfitted with combat suits, tightly fitted and a pale tan colour with brown splotches that would blend well with the cavern floor and walls. The suits were dotted with low-reflectivity interface crystals that would scan their environment and their own bodies, providing a constant stream of information to both the wearer and Zira, as their commander, on their environment, location and health status. The suits themselves captured waste and water, recycling the water through inbuilt filters powered by the body's heat, motion or environmental energy, like sunlight. Sealed pockets bulged along the legs and torso, containing emergency rations, nano-block patches that could transform into any manner of useful products, flares, field scanners and weapons. Each officer had been provisioned with a laser knife, a field hunting knife and a low-energy pulse pistol. Zira's security team had been allocated a suite of additional weapons in various sizes and ranges. Zira instructed Ariel to assist Odrin while she moved to confer with the pilot. As she moved into the pilot area, she took a couple of calming breaths. She had led teams before into much more challenging missions, including multiple hot combat situations. But this was her first mission on this colony, and the secrecy of the mission entrusted to her was an honour she would not fail at this. Are we ready, Vorden? Yes, Videk. I will give you a two-minute alert. He waved his right hand through the virtual dash in front of her, then held it out. Her HUD overlaid her vision with a virtual icon in his hand in green. When she touched it, it informed her it was the drop zone timing alert. She smiled at him and pinned it to the top right of her HUD overlay. Thank you, pilot. He turned to her, his usually cheerful demeanour solemn. Look after them, Zira. I don't want to have to medevac anyone else out of this damned crater. It's a death trap. I can't even get below the rim without my instruments going crazy. If the worst happens, we'll try our best to get to you, but there are no guarantees. She reached out and touched the back of his hand with a fingertip. I will do everything in my power to keep them safe, Vorden. You have my word. She stepped back and the corner of her lips lifted in a wry smile. Don't worry so much, you'll get grey hair. He huffed in mock offence pulling forward a lock of his long, steel-coloured mane for examination. That's it. I'm taking you back, female. You are unfit for command. You are clearly blind. Chuckling, she returned to the hold. The countdown flashed three minutes to go. Jumpsuits checked. Acknowledge. Acknowledged, ma'am. Gather your packs and connect for drop. They efficiently moved to the small packs stored next to the drop door. Tarlac and Ariel lifted the drop harnesses and assisted Odrin and Olfa to step in and connect to the lift system. Zira was pleased to note that Odrin and Olfa were calmer now. Verit males regularly practiced these kinds of drops as part of their youth training. This was familiar ground. Ariel efficiently checked Zira's suit. Zira connected herself and hefted her pack and did her last walk along the group to check all were correctly attached. When she got to Odrin, he lifted the harness to show her the connection without being asked. She didn't want to be distracted, but had to chance a look at his eyes to get a sense of his demeanour. When she did, the appreciation she saw there almost floored her. The genuine confidence she saw in his gaze relieved an anxiety that she had not been aware she had been holding. She had been afraid that after Odrin challenging her authority in front of the cadet, he would undermine her during this mission. She didn't think he was that kind of male, she wouldn't have agreed to spend the night with him if she had. But after his outburst, her confidence in her judgment of him had been shaken. The acceptance of her leadership and appreciation for her skills warmed her, gave her a tiny kernel of hope that all was not destroyed between them. Perhaps they could be friends after all this was done. Her HUD alert flashed the two-minute warning, just as Vorden's crisp voice echoed through their communal HUD channel. Two minutes! Assume drop positions, goddess bless and protect. Tarlac and Ariel, you will go first. Odrin and Olfa, wait for my signal. Everyone nodded and she opened the drop door. The air swirled into the hold, 
its icy talons scratching at any exposed skin, whipping hair into lashes that stung. Tarlac and Ariel stood on the rim, gazes focused, bodies ready. The HUD alert turned red, flashed three times and then turned green. A large target appeared in their visions, indicating the drop zone. Vorden's voice echoed again. Go for mid-air drop. Tarlac and Ariel stepped off the edge of the craft, dropping into the early morning twilight and falling away into the gloom. Zira was glued to her HUD display as it fed her data on their elevation, speed and heart rate. When they both touched down, she motioned to Ulfa and Odrin up next. Ulfa hesitated, and Odrin reached over the younger male. Come on, brother, let's do this together. Odrin smiled at her as he stepped off, dragging young Ulfa with him into the gloom with a whoop. Zira gave a startled laugh at his antics, her heart lifting a little from the tension of the mission. When her HUD alerted they had landed safely, she took one last look around the hold and stepped out into the air herself. It was cold and crisp, and the second sun was cresting over the edge of the forest. It lit the dew on the trees and plants into a carpet of shimmering crystals tinged in lilac from the violet suns. She was shaken again by the beauty of the planet. How strangely peaceful it was, floating down. The transport engines were a dull roar, and the air whipped past her face. But she felt cocooned in her feeling of rightness. This planet welcomed them and wanted them here. She passed below the surface of the planet into the dark cold of the crater. It was full of columns of rock, some as tall as a person, others like skyscrapers. The rock was pale and looked crumbly, and there were many broken columns fallen giants that littered the floor of the cavern with blocks the size of transports, others leaning drunkenly on their piers. She touched down and disconnected a message Vorden to confirm. His reply was immediate. Thank you, Videk. I will circle until I can detect the beacon and eject the equipment pods. Odrin and Ulfa were already hard at work on the beacon, and in short order they had it set up. The equipment pods landed gently with a puff of dust, and Vorden signalled he was leaving. In just a few minutes they were alone in the gloom at the bottom of the crater. Zira paced the perimeter of their designated campsite. It was an indentation against the wall of the crater. Not a true cave, just shelter formed by an overhang that sloped gently back into the distance, like a colossal thumbprint in the wall's base. The floor had a strange consistency, a slight give to the porous surface. She gingerly picked her way across the floor to their site, which was relatively clear of debris. Her HUD told her that Tarlac and Ariel were setting up the perimeter sensors and scanners. The crater felt... strange to her senses. She had the vaguest impressions of waiting, of expectancy. It was unsettling, like someone was hidden watching her. She stood, waiting, extending her senses out... She wasn't strong enough to give an emotional nudge to her quarry, nor could she telepathically connect, but she could invite whatever it was to join her. The world seemed to still to hold its breath. Then the feeling vanished so completely it was as if it had never been. Shaking off the creepy feeling, she went to help Odrin and Olfa set up the camp. The day passed quickly. Tarlac and Ariel returned to the base camp late in the afternoon, dusty, cold and hungry. They had spent the better part of the day clambering around the cliffside, installing sensors and then digging into the rock to install their security bots. Odrin, Olfa and Zira had set up the campsite. Their tents, cooking appliances, bedrolls and sanitation facilities were largely automated. Once dragged into place, the small biodomes expanded and anchored themselves, and all they had to do was connect the utilities. Olfa had set up a small nano-generator which would provide power for their equipment, and the dropped pods included potable water, reclamation and food supplies. They could easily stay here for weeks without needing resupply. Things were peaceful. Odrin had not tried to talk to Zira again, and perversely it left her feeling frustrated. She knew it wasn't reasonable to feel irritated with him after she had explicitly told him to go away, but she hated things being unsettled between them. If they were going to be stuck out here for weeks, they had to make their peace, for the sake of everyone else, if not for them. Ariel was Philosian and highly empathic. She had already picked up on their tension, and it was only a matter of time before the Verit males did as well. Deciding it was now or never, Zira messaged Odrin. Do you want to talk? His reply was immediate. Yes, lady, if you have the time. Meet me outside of the camp on the south side, you can do the perimeter walk with me before we sit down for dinner. 
Odrin's stomach was churning and he wasn't sure if it was excitement or anxiety. He desperately wanted to apologise to Zira for his outburst. He met her at the south side and began the long walk around the perimeter they had established. They walked in silence for a while before he spoke up. I am sorry, Zira. I never meant to undermine you or your authority. She glanced at him and continued walking. Thank you, Odran. I accept your apology. He frowned. This formality was not what he wanted. His Zira, the real Zira, was passionate and funny and divine in her fury. This controlled individual was the commander, not the female, and it scratched at his temper that she would use formality to keep him at a distance. I mean it. I was angry and hurt at being excluded. I realise you were trying to ensure the success of your mission, and I shouldn't have taken my shit out on you. She opened her mouth to speak before thinking better of it. Please, Zira, say whatever it is you want to say. He smiled a little. You can yell at me if it will make you feel better, I don't mind. She sighed heavily, his attempt at a joke falling flat. The issue isn't that you yelled at me. I know you weren't trying to undermine me. I can feel your intentions, remember? He nodded. The issue is that I don't think you are dealing with your shit, as you put it. You've let being injured get inside your head and undermine your sense of self. You need to work it out, whatever this is, before you do something more self-destructive. He stared off into the distance as she spoke, quashing his instinctive desire to reject her statement, to say that he was fine. I worry that you'll do something stupid and reckless to prove you are healed when you aren't, and maybe hurt yourself so bad that Denny can't put you back together again. He laughed harshly. I'm a healer, not an idiot. I won't do anything stupid. She stopped and pulled him by his arm around to look at her. You already did, Odrin. Besides, do you think healers are immune from stupidity? That you have some sacred blessing that means you can't screw up just as badly as the rest of us? He tried to pull away from her in agitation, and she reached up to his face. That single palm against his cheek stilled him, focused his attention on her. I'm not good at emotions, Odrin. There are dozens of other Felotians on this planet that would be better at this than I am. But I would like to think we are still friends, at least. I don't want to see you hurt. He jerked away from her, stung. Don't worry, Zira. I won't burden you with my issues. I would hate to be an inconvenience to my friends. She growled in frustration. For the love of the goddess, why are you such a dick? That is not what I meant. Blessed Fala, you make caring about you an act of bloody torture. I'm trying to help you, you creven. He spun back to her, grabbing her by her shoulders. Don't you get it? I don't want to be just friends, Zira. I don't want to show you the dark wilderness of my soul. I don't want to see it myself. You are the last person I want to show my shit to. I've spent the last two weeks staring at you, wanting you. Every time you laughed or showed a move, I just about lost it. I wanted to beg you to touch me. I wanted to taste you. She stared up at him in shock, clearly torn between wanting to kiss him and thump some sense into his stubborn head. This was the last thing she needed. He drove her absolutely insane. They were terrible for each other. And I won't accept a relationship that isn't honest. I won't be with a male that hides who he is from me. If you want purely physical, go to a pleasure planet, Odrin. Get a synth doll. She tried to wrench her arm away and he crowded her closer. You think that would satisfy me after you? One night with you and I'm addicted. I'm not responsible for your feelings. If you need relief, use your own hand. She grabbed her knife from her belt and wedged it between them, pressing it to his balls. Take your hands off me, Odrin, or I'll give you another injury to worry about. He leaned closer to her, his lips nearly touching hers, and he felt the prick of her knife. It would be worth it. He licked the seam of her lips, seeking entrance, and he felt the tip of her knife press slightly harder. Not enough to cut him, not yet, but enough to know that he was very close to the edge of her temper. I know I'm a total mess just now and I screwed things up, but I don't want to give up what we had the other night. It was incredible and please don't give up on me. On us. She tensed for a moment before she softened and allowed him to kiss her. He wrapped his arms around her, lifting her lithe body tight against his. He walked her backwards to a large boulder, pinning her against it and wrapping her legs around his waist. He twined her braid around his hand and kissed the breath out of her. Their jumpsuits were fastened tight to their bodies. There was no way to open them to provide relief without damaging them, so he positioned his hand between her legs and rubbed through the material, letting the rough fabric create the friction she desired. It didn't take long. 
Within moments, she gasped out her release, sinking her teeth into his neck to muffle the sound from echoing through the caverns. You can't just seduce me into agreeing with you every time we argue, Zira whispered as they lay together after. As long as we are still together to argue, he responded. You know that's toxic as hell, right? You pulled a knife on me, he replied reasonably. She snorted. You deserved it. You touched me without permission. She sighed. Do you know any good therapists, Healer? He helped her place her legs down, hugging her gently. I'm truly sorry, Zira. Whatever this is between us, I don't want to lose it. It's special. And I meant what I said. Work on your shit, Audrin. Then we'll talk. So I haven't blown it totally, then? He asked, his voice solemn. He couldn't hide the coil of fear and insecurity in his voice. She couldn't help smiling and smoothed his frown lines with a fingertip. Not totally, although making out on perimeter detail would earn us both a punishment if anyone found out. We're lucky nothing snuck up on us. She moved away from him, and he could see her rebuilding her emotional armour, building the distance necessary for her to command the mission. He clung to her words, trusting that they would have time to work out their issues when they returned to the colony. Come on then, you can finish my perimeter walk with me. They walked in companionable silence as the late afternoon deepened into true dark and cold. Zira activated her night vision mode on her HUD, and Odrin's eyes flooded navy, adapting to the dim lighting. They were heading back to the campsite when there was a scratching sound ahead of them. Zira froze and motioned for them to move to the lee of a boulder. She activated her HUD and used the visual interface to send a text message to their shared team channel, showing that they had detected movement and were investigating. A breeze whistled through the cavern and brought with it a mixture of scents. Odrin inhaled deeply, sorting through the sensory input before nudging Zira. He placed his mouth next to her ear and whispered, I detect only animal scents. It is most likely a native creature. She looked at him, considering, and expanded her senses. It feels predatory. She cocked her head, listening, feeling, and immature. She stood. It doesn't feel threatening. More curious. Come on. They crept along the path. As they approached where the creature had been, there was another rustle. Odrin listened. We've scared it away. He knelt down to examine the footprints. It appears canid. See the claw marks and the smaller back paws? Zira nodded. Tracking was significantly outside her expertise. She was a professional soldier, not a hunter. As they wandered back to camp, they occasionally heard rustles, as if the little predator was following them, but didn't glimpse the creature. The group decided on an early night. Olfa had made some food and Tarlac and Ariel were already turned in for sleep as she arrived. Zira activated the perimeter security bots and took the first on-call watch. They weren't in active watch, not yet, so she could doze. The bots would wake her if they detected anything. Chapter 9. Envoy Encrypted transmission from Envoy. Confirmed arrival at the colony. End transmission. The cadet waited at the bottom of the ramp, watching the Envoy exit the shuttle. The ship was small, sleek and heavily armoured, meaning it was incredibly expensive designed to transport important guests planetside in safety and comfort. It had not travelled all this way under its own power, which meant there was a mothership somewhere, and wasn't that interesting. There could be hundreds of personnel on it. Next to the K-deck stood Lucius, in full first warrior furs and badges, the Maman leaning heavily on her cane, and Lenora, her chief of logistics. The colony security personnel lined up behind them, Lucius's face was stone, giving nothing away. The maman quietly seethed. It still amazed the cadet that the female could appear so frail, but have an energy that could sear any empath within twenty scree. The Malurian envoy looked like sin. Physically, he wasn't entirely dissimilar to human template species. In dim light, a female might pass him and think him attractive, but the similarity was superficial only. Genetically, Malurians had evolved on an entirely alien planet. They were not descendants of Earth, human template, but something else entirely. He was tall, clad in a long, swirling leather coat that hid the contours of his body. His skin was grey, dotted here and there with protruding black horns. His eyes were dark red, rimmed in gold and sunken deep. The cadet started when she saw the red horns curving down from his ears and back from his knuckles. He was a member of the royal family. When he smiled, as he did now in welcome, 
black lips pulled back to reveal row after row of small, red-tipped fangs. When a Malurian bit their prey, the prey rarely survived. Two Malurian security personnel, covered head to toe in dark, red-armoured uniforms, accompanied him. Not a single sliver of skin showed on them. The cadet stepped forward, bowing her head slightly. Welcome, envoy. What a surprise. The Malurian laughed, the sound like a snake hissing. Not that unexpected, since you had time to assemble a welcome party. His eyes roved over the assembled security and landed on Lucius. I see your mail even put on a pretty outfit for me. Lucius stared him down impassively, his face unmoving, and the key deck cheered internally as the Malurian settled back, clearly disappointed that his barb had not resulted in a rise. Aren't you meant to be good at this, McEnroy? Where are your famed diplomatic skills? the maman asked. My lady Maman Free, I hardly recognised you there. The Malurian turned to her with a twinkle in his eye, before arranging his alien face into something resembling compassion. I know it is not done to comment on a lady's appearance, but you look like something my pet Aravac dragged in. I've been unwell, McEnroy. Do not worry, I am on the mend. The Maman's glare dared anyone to say different. Excuse me, Kadek, I have been remiss in my duties. He turned back to her, sweeping his leather jacket back to reveal a dark red suit jumpsuit, studded with dark interface crystals. I am Makenroy, envoy from the Alliance to your charming Colony 29. I must say, you are the double of your sister. Thank you, Makenroy. That is to be expected. We are twins. Makenroy laughed his sibilant titter again, and the hairs on the back of her neck rose. Before we proceed, envoy, I must know, by whose authority are you dispatched? His smile dimmed and for a moment she saw a flash of something in his eyes before his charm reasserted itself. Dear lady, I do not understand your question. You may address me as Kadek. Morale smiled tightly. I wouldn't think that it is such a troublesome question. Who sent you here? Whose name is on your orders to come here? My sister is Sadai, the Felotian ambassador to the Alliance, and she was unaware of your dispatch here. Doesn't that strike you as... odd? McEnroy spread his hands in the universal gesture for who knows. What can I say, Kadek? I am but a humble servant. My orders came from the Alliance Command. That is all I know. The maman hummed. Are you in the habit of going where strangers send you? How very mysterious and exciting for your life. Perhaps when this is over I can assign you a side quest. McEnroy hissed his laugh again, clutching his chest dramatically. My lady, you wound me. The maman raised an eyebrow. No, dear. When I wound you, you will know because you will be standing in a pool of whatever passes for blood in your species. The Malurian arranged his face in a picture of abject despair, and the Kidek resisted the urge to roll her eyes. He should be on the Galactic Entertainment Network. I only come to provide aid to your charming rustic colony. Word of your troubles has reached the ears of the Alliance. He spread his fingers wide, interlacing his nuchal horns. We bring you supplies, medications, replacement equipment, and a sympathetic ear to champion your cause with the Alliance. How strange. And here I thought we paid our ambassadors to do that. The Kidek let the moment draw out. Very well, we grant you entrance. Thank you for your supplies. I'm afraid that we do not have any spare accommodation just now, so you will have to stay on your ship. I also assign you a security officer for your time here. For your safety, of course. Not that I think your personnel are incapable. Her eyes flicked to his guards, who had not moved at all during the interaction, and showed no reaction to her barb. Thank you, thank you, most kind. This is Tadek Tyler. She will be your security for the first shift. The young officer stepped forward and bowed smartly. And this is Judek Lenora Patra, who will show you where to drop your supplies. She manages our logistics. Lenora stepped forward. If you would follow me, please. Makenroy smiled broadly and followed her, trailed by his silent companions. As they left, the maman moved up to her shoulder. Well done, Kadek, well done indeed. I fail to see the benefit of the encounter, ladies. Lucius rumbled from behind them, and they turned. The maman tutted. Really, Lucius, you are meant to be good at strategy. He gritted his teeth. Surely it would have been better to have him remain unaware of our insight. The Kadek shook her head. No, Lucius, that crack about my sister was telling. He knows we are related. They may even be monitoring our transmissions. It was better to have him think he has allayed our suspicions for now. Lucius nodded reluctantly. 
I have a new assignment for you, First Warrior. Find and track the ship he came on. That little pleasure shuttle didn't get here on its own. There is a mothership nearby, and I want to know what it is doing at all times. Yes, ma'am. The cadet screwed up her face and sighed heavily. I hate politics. You are surprisingly good at it, dear. Thank you, maman. The maman nodded graciously. Lucius looked at them in horror. You two agreeing is almost more terrifying than the Malurian. The maman smiled tightly. Don't worry, Lucius, we will be back to warring once this is over, but only a fool chases rabbits when there's a Dathalka after the flock. Chapter 10 What Lies Beneath Encrypted transmission from Envoy. Confirm equipment and personnel detected at a crater site to the north of the base. Security personnel dispatched to investigate. End transmission. Three days. Three days of searching. And nothing. They had found the cave entrance Odrin had scouted on his original mission, and as expected, it was blocked by the cave-in. Figuring that they might find a nearby cave entrance that would connect to the network of tunnels, they systemically worked through a search grid in a spiral pattern, edging out from the original cave entrance. The problem was not that they couldn't find caves. There were hundreds of the damned things. The landscape was literally pockmarked in crevices, caves, potholes and more. It took hours to clear each sector, and each one had to be inspected, either visually or with the use of bots. None of their usual sensor technology, which under normal scenarios would have mapped the entire crater in an hour, would work down here because of the Zelan refraction. None of the typical geologic markers were present that would indicate caves. There were no streams, no unusual vegetation patterns, nothing. It was tedious, frustrating work. Plus, it was freezing. The temperature had gradually decreased since their arrival, and the base of the crater was so deep, the sun's rays rarely reached it. Their jumpsuits kept their bodies warm, mostly, but any unprotected skin, such as faces or fingers, was exposed to the biting cold. The Verit males didn't mind the cold. Verit was a freezing wasteland, after all, but they grumbled incessantly about not having all the little comforts that Verit had developed to support a society living in such conditions. It also meant that they had to sleep in their jumpsuits, which meant that they were all smelling ripe. Zira was not interested in their whining, at all. They were here to do a job and no one promised it would be fun. She was more concerned about their lack of progress. Deciding she needed a break from it all, she sat on a large, flat boulder, a piece of one of the fallen columns just outside of camp, pondering her next move. There was a stark beauty to the dark crater. It wasn't silent. The wind constantly moving through the columns created a continuous sighing melody that changed with the temperature. The pockmarked landscape was rugged and challenging, and it appealed to the soldier in her, to her desire to throw herself at the world in contest. Scratch, scratch. She froze, not wanting to scare the creature off. That was the other reason she was out here. Every time she went on patrol, she had felt it watching her. She had begun leaving little offerings of food, hoping to befriend it. Out of the corner of her eye, the creature appeared. It was small, barely up to her knee, and appeared to be a mammal. It had dark red fur that lightened to a pale gold on its muzzle, paws and belly. Large black eyes in the front of its head, over an elongated muzzle with fluffy circular ears that twitched and rotated. Clearly a smaller predator. Its rear legs were large and muscled, going down to delicate rear paws with small claws, and as she watched, she understood why. It sat back on them, raising its front legs, which were short and similarly muscled, tipped by four sharp claws. When it put its front legs down to creep forward again, its shoulders were articulated fascinating. It would be fast, flexible and strong. It shuffled forward, gold wet nose cautiously sniffing the air, looking for food. Ever so slowly, she reached into a pocket and pulled out a strip of meat jerky that she had appropriated from the male's ration stores in anticipation of meeting the little creature. It pondered the offering she held out, weighing whether it was worth the risk of getting close to her. She extended an empathic tendril to it and reassessed her judgment of its intelligence. It was smart, curious, hungry and mildly telepathic. It was also a he. Hello there, little one. Hungry? She pitched her voice low, soothing, and accompanied it with an empathic suggestion of friendship. He cocked his head, looking at her, before taking another tentative step closer and stretching out an unexpectedly long neck to snag the meat with sharp little teeth. He darted back, 
settling on his muscular rear legs and raising up his forearms to hold the offering for him to nibble on. It was adorable. As it ate, she could sense it judging her. She resisted the urge to laugh at the seriousness of its examination. How do you live down here, little friend? Can't be much prey. She noted its condition, the lush red fur, and wondered about its habits. It must have a food source or a way out of the crater. After it finished, it took another tentative step towards her, and she held out an empty hand for it. I'm sorry, I don't have any more today. It snuffled her hand with its wet nose before gently headbutting her hand and huffing in dissatisfaction. She chanced giving it a little scratch behind the ear as she laughed quietly at its grumble. I'm sorry, I'll do better next time. It huffed again and settled down next to her on its rear legs, watching both the landscape and her. As they watched, gentle snowflakes fell. The snow rapidly covered the landscape in a thin sheath of white crystals. While Zira appreciated the view, practically it was inconvenient. It was already hard enough not to step in the myriad of tiny holes. If the snow lay where it landed, they would have to call off their exploration for safety reasons. She allowed herself a few minutes to luxuriate in the view, noticing the little creature get progressively closer to her, presumably for body heat. The view really was stunning. The towering broken columns, the clean snow and the gentle eddies that formed from the wind through the rocks. Eventually, duty called. She sent an all-team message to reconvene at base camp for a planning session. As she stood to leave, the little creature darted back and away, and she sent it one final wash of friendship emotion as its bushy-tailed butt sprinted off into the snowfall to dash into a crevice between two rocks that was free of snowfall. Tapping a finger to her lip, she considered, and calmed Odrin. Gila, can you come to my location, please? I'd like your assessment of something. Yes, Videk, came the immediate reply. When Odrin arrived, she pointed at the crevice. Notice anything strange? He nodded, seeing what she had immediately, his gleaming with interest. There are several reasons a crevice would not carry snow. Geological formation, composition of the rock, but none of those are relevant here. He moved over and placed a scanner on the edge of the hole. As I suspected, the temperature is slightly higher around the rock face. It could indicate that this crevice is deep, bringing up geothermal heat or moisture from below which melts the snow. Could we set the bots to do a visual scan of the area, identifying points where the snow does not lay, and target them for exploration? Odrin nodded enthusiastically. Great idea, it should narrow the search considerably. I'll work with Olfer on reprogramming the bot straight away to scan for both heat and visual anomalies. Excellent. They began the short walk back to camp together. It really is a brilliant idea. You don't need to sound so surprised. I do have them occasionally, retorted Zira. It will save us a lot of time, and honestly, I am surprised. It's brilliant. He looked at her mischievously. For a female. Zira's brain clunked so hard she stopped dead in her tracks. You did not just say that to me? she said, outraged. Odrin shrugged and sauntered on. I'm just glad to see that your association with me is starting to have some positive effects. She tackled him to the snowy ground. Take it back, right now, you arrogant asshole! He laughed and wrestled with her. Nope, you bite far too easy. She grabbed a handful of snow and rubbed it on his face, and he erupted in curses and shoved her off. Admit it, you thought it was funny! No. He grabbed some snow and began to form it into a compact ball. You're smiling, she circled warily. No, I'm not. It's a grimace. I heard you laugh. I was sighing in disgust. He took aim and fired at her. Strange sort of sigh. She dodged, the ball flying wide. You're strange. Just admit that you think I'm funny. Never. Zira dusted herself off and turned for camp, her nose in the air. He laughed and caught up to her, sniggering the whole way back to camp, to her teeth-gritting frustration. Back at camp, they shared the revised plan with the others, who were more than happy to have an evening at camp, warm and safe, while the bots scouted the area. In the morning, hopefully, they would be able to finally progress with the mission. Several times during the evening, Zira caught flashes of movement in the darkness, and reaching out with her mind, she found her little friend, full of curiosity about the strange creatures that had invaded its domain. They turned into sleep, and Zira had barely had an hour of rest before something awoke her. There was no sound, just a sense that something wasn't right. She extended her senses and her mind was flooded with panic and rage. It almost overwhelmed her. 
she had to slam her mental barriers down immediately to prevent her own debilitating panic reaction. Lurching out of her tent, she opened her barriers just the tiniest bit to locate the source and stumbled towards Odrin's tent. She ripped the seal open to see Odrin lying on his pallet, his muscles clenched, body stiff in fear and pain, heart racing. His eyes were closed, he was lost in a nightmare. Without thinking, Zira lunged at him, desperate to break him from his dream before he could physically damage himself. She grabbed at his shoulders. Odrun, wake up! She hissed. She had only a split second of warning. He stiffened entirely, back slamming straight, before his eyes flicked open, unseeing. His claws sliced out and she jerked away, the sharp edges passing so close to her face she felt the wash of air at their passing. He shoved her back onto the tent floor and landed on top of her in a tangle of legs. He reared up, arms raised to slash at her again when her training took over. She slammed a foot into his leg and twisted to throw him onto the pallet again before leaping away to give herself room to defend herself. Audrin lay on the pallet, blinking owlishly in the light as he awoke. Zira, what? He went to stand up and cursed as his leg gave way and he crumpled to the ground. She was there in an instant to help him. Are you back with me? Where did I go? He mumbled. And why does my leg hurt like blazes? You were having a nightmare. You tried to skin my face. His eyes opened wide before he gulped reflexively. I'm so sorry, Zera. I... It's all right, Odrin. I know you didn't mean it. I'm sorry about your leg, but I had to get you off me. He shook his head, waving away her apology. He levered himself up to sit on the bed and rolled up his jumpsuit leg to reveal the purpling welt. Oh, Odrin, I'm sorry. She reached out a hand tentatively to examine his leg. Let me get a med kit. He reached out and smoothed her frown. It's fine. I would rather this than know I had hurt you. Is this some stupid male thing? It's clearly not fine. It's swelling to the size of a melon. Where is your med kit? He pointed to a box in the corner and she fished out some healing gel. She sank to the floor in front of him and began carefully applying the gel to his leg. He winced occasionally, despite her gentle touch, but gradually relaxed as the gel numbed the area. What were you dreaming about? Nothing, she sighed. Can't you just answer me once? Do we need to do this dance each time? You know you'll tell me in the end. Can we just shortcut it this once? He glared down at her, the dim light casting his face into shadows. I'm pretty sure I already beat it out of you. He snorted in laughter, then sighed. I was dreaming I was down there, in the dark, under the cave-in. Only this time no one was coming to rescue me. It was just me and the dust and the dark, the weight pressing down on me. Zira stilled. It must have been awful. He looked at her, stark terror in his eyes. I have never in my life felt helpless like that before. All my healing training, my warrior skills, none of it meant anything. She reached over and gripped his hand and he held hers fiercely. I was sure they would never find me. I waited for hours. Zira could only nod and offer him her silent support. Nothing would take away the fear, the pain, except time. He needed to lance this wound. He spoke into the dim light between them. I lay there, pinned by my legs, hearing the rocks groan around me as I slowly died. She reached over and pushed his hair back from his forehead. I can't change what happened to you, Odran. You'll carry the scars of it with you wherever you go. But I can promise you, if you fall again, I will come for you. You'll never have to worry that I would stop looking. I won't leave you behind. She pressed the most delicate of kisses to his cheek, gossamer wings against his skin, but it seared him to the bone. This wasn't just affection or lust or friendship. The kiss spoke of something much, much deeper. Zira stood. It's late. We need some sleep. Hopefully we'll go caving tomorrow. Will you stay? He held out a hand to her. She regarded him solemnly. Do you really want me to? We can't do anything in our jumpsuits. It's not about sex. It's about you. I just want to hold you. He flashed a smile. It was a pale, wan echo of his usual charming brilliance, but it was a smile. I don't know how or why. We've only spent one night together, but I miss snuggling with you. She laughed aloud. All right. He lay down on the pallet and opened his arms, and she crawled in next to him. She was so strong and competent, it amazed him how delicate she felt against him as he curled around her. She snuggled in and then chuckled. What now? You really smell. You need a bath. He laughed and flicked the command to turn out the lights on his HUD. You aren't exactly a floral bouquet either. So romantic. I didn't say I minded. 
Good night, Zira. He kissed her forehead and she tucked her nose under his chin and closed her eyes. Night, Odrin. The next morning, they received the first telemetry, and the plan worked better than Zira could have imagined. The telemetry revealed five potential cave sites. Excited to finally make progress, they split into two teams. Ariel and Ulfa took off towards the northern sector to investigate two sites. Zira and Odran headed south along the wall of the crater to investigate a further three. Tarlac had been on the last on-call night watch, so he stayed behind to rest and monitor the camp. They left the camp in high spirits, optimistic about their chances. Eight hours later, Odran and Zira trudged towards the last site, cold, tired and ready for dinner. They had been hiking all day and the previous two sites had been a bust. The caves were there. One had dead-ended after just a couple of scree. In the other, they had wasted several hours moving through progressively tighter tunnels before calling it quits. If that cave was the way down, they were in serious trouble and would need explosives to break through. Ariel had been comming every hour and had struck out on both of her sites. They were already en route back to the main camp. If this site didn't pan out, it was back to plan A of painstakingly searching manually. The last site was apparently in the middle of a wide open space in the crater floor. It was the first expanse they had come across with none of the tall towers. Despite the lack of cover, they nearly missed the entrance. It was so small. The only sign it was there was a lessening of the dusting of snow on the rock formation around a crack. As they neared, they realised the crack was actually a crevice between two boulders, forming a low valley that sloped down into the darkness. Considering the entrance, Zira calmed Ariel. We have located the third site and are going in. She shared her location with Ariel. We will calm every half an hour while we can. If we go dark for over five hours, come look for us. Acknowledged. Good luck. Odrin jumped down into the crevice, landing lightly in a crouch, and Zira laughed. Fancy. My lady? He flashed a charming smile and held his hand out to her. Thank you, sir, she quipped, throwing her backpack at him and hopping down next to him. He rummaged in his pack and withdrew a torch, handing it to Zira as she took off into the corridor that had formed in the gap. It was narrow and tall, just wide enough for Odrin's broad shoulders. They crept along the gap, cautious of their footing on the crumbling floor as the passage moved under the rock face and plunged into darkness. They wandered for several minutes before it abruptly opened up into a larger cavern. The cavern was smooth and oval, the ceiling so far above them in the darkness that they couldn't see it, the walls veined in silver and gold traceries that glinted in the dim torchlight. Odrun reached out a hand to Zira's shoulder to stop her and motioned for silence. He cocked his head, sniffing delicately before heading off. I can sense air movement. There is another entrance over here. Zira followed, more than willing to take his lead. Verit was a frozen planet, and its inhabitants spent a significant portion of their lives underground, their cities powered by geothermal energy. Odrun was much more familiar with underground transit than she was. The new passage was much lower, and Odrun had to duck to avoid whacking his head on the rock. They walked on, checking in on schedule, the connection patchy but viable. They passed through strange patches of hot or cold air, and at one point Zira swore she could sense a faint thrumming like machinery, but it stopped before she could pinpoint a direction. As they walked, she could also sense Odrun's increasing disquiet. Are you all right, Odrun? He nodded sharply, his breath deepening. If you are having problems, I need you to tell me. I need to know I can trust you. He spun to look at her, his eyes a little wild. You don't think you can trust me? She cocked an eyebrow at him. I thought we weren't going to do this again. I trust you with my life. I'm just not sure that I trust you with yours. He teetered on the edge of anger before he slumped, defeated, and raised a shaking hand to wipe the sweat from his brow. I'm not doing well, he murmured. Zira could see his jaw clenching, the veins standing out on his temples. I... I'm having trouble being underground. Zira sucked in a breath. Since when? He didn't look at her. All day, it's been getting worse. I see. Her mind clicked, putting the pieces together. And you didn't think this was relevant information I should know when we were going to be underground for this mission. I have it under control. All right. Zira's voice was non-committal. I didn't want you to know. Zira didn't respond. Odrin resumed walking. They had only gone another scree when she heard his breath hitch again. Zira? Yes. 
Can you talk to me, please? I need a distraction. All right, what do you want to talk about? How did you learn Delma Layat? Zira consciously relaxed, relieved the question was so normal that they could step away from the tension between them. That's easy. My mother teaches it. She taught all of us sisters, but I'm the only one that kept it up as a passion. Do you have many sisters? Yes, five. Five? Audrin's voice was incredulous and Zira laughed outright. Yes, five. My mother always wanted a big family, so she had artificial insemination. She got a set of twins, the triplets and me. Are you close? Zira nodded and belatedly realised that he couldn't see her behind him. Yes, very. They were upset at my decision to come here where they couldn't easily visit, but I was itching for a change, for something new. She paused, considering whether she wanted to ask the question burning in her mind. Dinara told me you had all been ordered here that you didn't volunteer. Did it bother you? She saw Odrin's silhouette shake its head. No, I was happy for the chance to pursue my research on a new planet, to try a different way of life. They paused when the tunnel branched and took a left turn. Within a few minutes they emerged at another cave entrance that showed snow outside. Odrin noted it on his map. This is a secondary entrance. Let's go back and head for the right-hand tunnel. They returned to the tunnel and continued walking. Zira could feel Audren's anxiety rising again and picked up the threads of their previous conversation. So, has colony life lived up to your expectations? He barked a laugh. Well, getting a bunch of rocks dropped on me wasn't great, but the rest... He trailed off for a moment and she thought he had finished. It is more than I could ever have dreamed, he whispered softly, reaching back to squeeze her hand for a moment. Did you come here to find a mate? he asked. Not really. I'm open to it if it happens, but I mostly wanted the adventure and the land grant. What about you? He hesitated, and she could feel him deliberating whether to tell her. I would like to find a mate, but I owe a life debt to the Maman. I do not think she would ever allow me to mate freely, as in Verite culture, my mate's wishes would have precedence over hers. Zira paused, sensing that he had shared something extremely private. She didn't want to ruin the intimacy that they had created in the hushed darkness of the cavern. I am not aware of that aspect of Verit culture. What is a life debt? How did it happen? Audrin's voice was tight. I cannot say. Suffice that she granted me a boon in my youth, and I agreed to a life debt in repayment. Until I can repay the debt to her satisfaction, I am bound to follow her orders in all things, even beyond the level of obedience normally expected from a Verit male. To her satisfaction... She could literally order you to do anything forever and you'd have to do it. Or what? Odrin was silent for a long time. I would be executed, he said flatly. My clan brothers would also bear the punishment for my dishonour. Zira snorted. That is ridiculous. Why would you agree to such a stupid deal? He spun round. Do not judge what you do not understand, my lady. My culture is not yours. I gave my word freely and will honour it. His eyes snapped blue fire that she could see, even in muted light. I should not have told you, even Luke doesn't know, but I wanted you to understand that if we progress further, I cannot promise to mate you. Don't change the subject. We are a long way from mating right now. Let's go back to why Luke doesn't know if you did this as a youth. Wasn't he your guardian? He grabbed her shoulders. Desist, Zira, please, I beg you. You ask what I cannot answer. We'll see about that. She shook him off. When we get back, I'll ask the Kadek to look into this life debt. What is wrong with your maman that she binds a child to a lifetime of debt? Is slavery still acceptable on your planet? He stiffened and growled low at her. You dishonour us, Zira. I do not want or need your intervention. I am a verit male and I will do my duty. She is not the evil wraith you paint her as. The maman has supported me and guided me my whole life. She supported my desire to study medicine, to grow beyond my warrior birthright, to come here, to this new planet. Zira opened her mouth to argue further when the comm activated, the broken message audio only. Videk, come in, urgent, under attack. I, we are under... Tarlac, escaped. I think injured. Ariel, I read you, confirmed, did you say under attack? Yes, Videk, base camp is... attack. Security, deactivated, unknown, uniforms, military operation, Tarlac, injured, functional. Confirm, is the base compromised? Yes, Videk. Zira considered her options for a split second before replying. 
Get to our position. The cavern is hidden. We can regroup here. Bring as many supplies as you can. Acknowledged. Your position. Three hours. Zira's stomach lurched and she looked at Odrin, fear filling her for a split second. He reached over to pull her into a fierce hug. She let herself languish against him for a moment, their personal battle forgotten. She stiffened, her mind already turning to what to do next. Set the bots to visual scan and continue exploring this path. We need to know if there are any other entrances to this cave. The last thing we need is them coming up on us from behind. Odrin nodded, kneeling to remove his pack and pulling out three of the tiny silver spheres. His HUD interfaced, and they floated on a pale green light in front of him, receiving their instructions before zipping off along the tunnel, sounding like angry bees. In parallel, Zira inventoried their weapons. They had only minimal armaments, their knives, their low-energy pulse pistols, her high-energy pulse rifle, and a couple of multifunctional units that could be set to a range of uses. All of their perimeter security equipment was at base. She clenched her fists. The situation was dire. Come on, healer. We have to double-time it back to the entrance. We'll need to detour to that secondary entrance and set some defences there on the way. They took off back to the entrance and their transit seemed agonisingly slow. As she ran, she turned over scenarios in her mind. Whichever way she looked at it, they were screwed. She had no illusions about their ability to defend against a well-armed military force. This wasn't an entertainment saga. People would die. Most likely hers. At the secondary entrance, Zira used one of her precious multifunctional units and set it to scan for movement and notify her. With a single command, she could instruct it to overload and explode. She positioned it just inside the narrow cave entrance, hoping that if it came to it, the explosion would close the small opening. It was the best she could do for the moment. At the main entrance, she used her final multifunction unit, praying that Ariel or Tarlac would have some with them. She also set up the last two scan bots, sending them floating away. One she positioned on the crater wall behind them above the entrance, set to wide view and scan for movement. The second she positioned facing towards base camp, several scree out, to provide some advanced warning. When the bot reached its position it reported movement, and the streamed visual in her HUD showed Ariel and Ulfa supporting an injured Tarlac. He looked terrible. His right leg was wrapped from thigh to shin in bandages to a splint, bright red blood seeping through in patches. Ariel, come in. I have a visual on you from a bot. Videk. A military force attacked base camp approximately four hours ago. There was no warning. Ten individuals dropped from a stealth shuttle and used some kind of interference tech to get behind the security perimeter. I've never seen it before. They captured Tarlac and were interrogating him. We killed the interrogators and snuck out of camp. It's just a matter of time before they discover they're dead and they'll mount a pursuit. Acknowledged. I have set up what I can for security. You are about ten minutes out of our position. Could you recognise who they were? Their uniforms had no insignia, standard space jumpsuits in environment-sensitive camouflage. They spoke in galactic standard, but I heard several other languages used between individuals. Zira whistled in appreciation, considering. Multiple languages used meant mercs, most likely. Most official forces were tied to their planetary alliances and species, and spoke a common language, but environment-sensitive camouflage meant money, and lots of it. The specialised jumpsuits could change colour and texture to match any environment, and made the wearer damn near invisible. Assassins commonly used them. To outfit an entire battle group meant this group was most likely highly trained, and they felt that whatever the group was doing was worth the expense, and would result in a return in investment. Zira considered her options again. She had three soldiers, one partially functional, and two more scientists with some warrior training. Her team had run no battle simulations and had minimal ammunition, up against what was most likely a highly trained group of mercenary assassins. It was suicide. Their only actual option was to call for help and dig in to defend. You are ten minutes out, Ariel. Odrin will come to meet you to assess Tarlac and guide you back in, past the security I've set up. She motioned to Odrin, who nodded and started climbing out of the gully. I will call for help. Acknowledged, Videk. Zira took a deep breath and switched HUD channels, reaching out to Lucius. First warrior, come in, please. We require immediate assistance and evac. We are under attack. Videk, report. Zira gave him a quick summary of the situation. Tarlac has been tortured and is injured. His condition is being assessed. 
We will mobilize a security team and can be there in four hours. Can you defend until we get there? Possibly. I have set up a security perimeter, but we don't know how far away they are. Keep that team alive, Videk. This is why I chose you for this mission. We are coming. She was bolstered by his faith in her. I will, First Warrior. Zira refused to allow herself to consider failure. They would all get out of here if it was the last thing she did. Although she admitted to herself, it may well be the last thing she did. Chapter 11. Rats in a Hole Odrin jogged along the surface as fast as he could while dodging potholes and crevices designed to break an ankle. The lingering panic of being underground was washed away by the reality of the situation. He saw the other group ahead and increased his pace, ignoring the pain in his thigh, protesting that he was not yet healed enough to push his body this way. Tarlac, my brother. How are you? Wonderful healer. Ready to go on a three-day hunt. Perhaps we can stop at the hot springs on the way back. Tarlac's face was grey, his lips thin and pinched against the pain. His exposed skin was covered in mottled purple and blue bruises and ugly slices in his skin. Medical report, warrior. They captured me during my rest hours. I heard them in the camp and they shot me with some kind of trank as I was emerging from the tent. When I woke up, I was wrapped in immobilisation bands. Odrun winced. Immobilization bands induced temporary paralysis when activated and were highly effective at containing prisoners with a high threat rating. They also left painful after-effects for days, including burning nerve pain and muscle spasms that could break bones. They wanted information. They don't know what we are looking for, but they know there is something here that we consider valuable. It sounds like they were liaising with the saboteur the cadet killed and another operative that is still on the planet. Tarlac bared his teeth, and Odrun worked to keep his face expressionless. Tarlac's fangs had been removed. It was a common torture, but particularly excruciating for Verit people. Tarlac clamped a hand on his arm, speaking urgently. I didn't tell them anything, Odie. He sighed, and Ariel gently stroked his hair back from his face. He looked at her, and for a moment Odrun thought the male was going to crumple. Instead, he seemed to draw strength from her presence. They were highly organised and had a lot of tech. They will find us. I left a trail a mile wide. He motioned behind him and Odrun saw the drops of blood and the drag from his injured leg. Any other injuries? They stabbed me in the leg, dislocated the knee. I have some other bruises and abrasions. They wanted me functional enough to talk. Ariel jumped in. We applied field first aid and splinted his leg. All right, I'll guide you back in and have a proper look. If that's all, you'll be at reduced operational performance at 60% for a day or two. Ariel's mouth dropped. That's it? That's it. Odrin kept his voice calm. Verit physiology takes a lot to cause permanent damage. Simple stabbings and dislocations can be healed with a couple of days rest. The bruises and minor abrasions will be gone by tonight. Unfortunately, even we can't regrow teeth, so you'll need some dental work when we return to the colony. Odrin looked at Olfa, who seemed pale but calm. And you two, any injuries? Ariel and Olfa shook their heads, and Olfa remained silent. Odrin made a mental note to talk to the young male later. He didn't know him well, but given his age, this could well have been his first engagement. He turned, desperate to return to Zira. He knew that she was a seasoned warrior, but everything in him told him not to leave her alone, to protect her. His instincts screamed at him that this level of protectiveness, the desperation to be close, was indicative of a deeper level of bonding that he was not free to explore. His life was not his own. He squashed it down. This was not the time to deal with his complicated love life. Just now, all that mattered was getting the team back safely. When they returned to the crevice, Odrin jumped down first and assisted a cursing Tarlac, who was sweating by the time he eased him down on a rock inside the first cavern. Zira had immediately dragged Ariel off to report. Her eyes lit up when she saw Ariel had several multifunction units left, and they grinned viciously as they went to shore up their defences. Odrin opened up the medical view on his HUD and connected with the AI in Tarlac's jumpsuit to assess his condition. Determining that there were no other hidden injuries and that Ariel and Olfa had done a decent job of bandaging and splinting the leg, he dosed Tarlac with pain meds and instructed him to rest the best he could given that they had no sleeping rolls or tents. Tarlac lay down with his head on his backpack, wrapped in a thin temperature control blanket made from the nanoblocks in the emergency medkit. Odrin sat down nearby, monitoring him. 
acutely aware of his own fatigue and lingering injuries. When Zira and Ariel returned, he noticed Zira's exhaustion. It had been a long day, exploring three cave sites. Then this. She did a good job of hiding it, but he was learning how to read her. It gave him an absurd sense of intimacy that he was beginning to know her well enough to learn her tells. The security team will be here soon. We just need to hold out a bit longer. Ariel Olfer, you try to rest for a bit. Odrin, monitor Tarlac. She turned to go, and he reached out a hand to stop her. She tensed, and he saw the wariness in her eyes, pained that he had put it there. Respectfully, Videk, you are tired as well. Tarlac is fine, and I've set his HUD to alert me if there is a change. I would like to accompany you if you permit it. Consider it a recommendation from your healer. A smile flirted at her lips at his formality. Very well, healer. I accept your advice and offer of assistance. Thank you. Odrin heard Tarlac snort in laughter and determinedly ignored it. They walked back to the entrance, scaling the gully wall and settling into position against a rock on the edge. Zira frowned, looking around again before sighing in resignation. What do you see? he asked. It is a poor defensive spot. There's nowhere we can get the higher ground, at least it's flat around here with good sight lines, so we'll see them coming. He moved up behind her and placed his hands on her shoulders, massaging gently. She moaned and leaned into him, the tension melting away under his fingers. That feels incredible. Perks of dating a healer, we learn all kinds of medical skills. She giggled at him. Thank you for your support, Odrin. I know that I already apologised, but I am sorry for my disrespect before. I never meant to undermine you. You can always count on my support. She leaned back to look at him. Because we're dating. Is that what we're doing? Because you are incredible. You are brilliant as a warrior, intelligent and highly capable. If there is anyone that can get us out of here safely, it's you. Her eyes sheened, and she blinked back emotion. You forgot funny, and hot. He grinned at her. That too. His eyes heated. And if we are being honest, I think we've soared well past dating already. I'm not sure if there is a Philosian word for what we are doing right now. Only that I feel more connected to you than I have to anyone else in my life. I adore you, Zira. She kissed him lightly. Your timing sucks, Odrin, but for what it's worth, I care about you a lot. I could even fall in love with you, given time. Stubborn, arrogant idiot that you are. I will do my best to get us out of here to discuss this further. Her HUD beeped. Now stop distracting me on watch. This is becoming a habit. She opened the alert and felt her blood go cold. The bots have let me know that the military force is nearly on us. We need to keep an eye out. She chewed her lip. It's too fast. The first warrior won't get here in time. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. When the explosion came, Zira was relieved and panicked in equal measure. No more of this waiting or watching. It had only been an hour Luke and his team were still some distance away. Odrin jolted at the first explosion. He went to stand to get a better look, and she grabbed his arm, jerking him back down. Don't, she hissed. You'll give away the position if you stick your head up. She accessed the visual from the sensor bot and brought up the mercs, double-timing it across the crater towards them. Their initial scouts had reached the edge of the explosives range she and Ariel had laid earlier. She estimated that they had less than five minutes. She snarled in satisfaction when she saw her explosives had taken out their scout. As she watched, a dozen or more males appeared into view, their morphing jumpsuits perfectly adapted to mimic the oranges and yellows of the crater boulders. If she hadn't heard the explosion, they would have been on top of them before they saw them. A male towards the back lifted his arm, pressing a few buttons on a gauntlet, and turned in a wide circle, holding his arm out. When he turned to face her, the feed went dead. They've located our visual sensors and deactivated them. She cycled through the other sensor bots they had distributed, and found only two still active within range. One at the secondary entrance, apparently undisturbed, and a second showing a structure. Wait, what? She flicked back to the image of the structure, instructing the bot to pull back. As it did, it revealed a vast edifice full of towers and crenellations. She accessed its location. It was one of the three that Odrin had programmed to send into the cavern to continue their search. Odrin! Her voice trailed off. What is it? He touched her face, taken aback by her pallor. Look! She streamed the visual to his HUD and his jaw dropped. We found it! We found it! This is the right cavern! 
She hugged him fiercely, delighted. He grinned like a fool, for a moment forgetting their situation, forgetting everything other than how much he adored the incredible female next to him. There was another explosion, then a third in close succession. Zira snapped her attention back, her expression filled with horror. They are coming. They've made it to the third set of mines in less than two minutes. They are heading straight for us. We need to fall back. She jumped down and raced along the gully, Odrin on her heels. Calm the others. Tell them to be ready to defend the tunnel outside of the cavern. Shouldn't we make a stand here? he asked. No, they'll get above us and drop explosives down the hole. We'll be dead in seconds. In the tunnel they can only come at us one at a time, but we need to be deep enough that their pulse lasers and explosives can't bring it down on us. We don't want another cave-in. Her comment produced a sinking feeling in Odrin's stomach, and he wrenched his mind away. He felt the crawling darkness, the thunder of the dark stranger edging towards him. He did not have time to give in to his anxiety right now. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk Lucius marched towards the stores sector, following the HUD directions to the envoy. His face was thunder, and people scrambled to get out of his way as he moved. He heard squawking behind him and tuned it out. He would deal with it later. The red rage flowed over his vision when he spotted the envoy, and he hit the mail with the force of a battering ram. He gripped the grey male by the neck, heaving him into the air and around to slam him against the wall of a storage unit, the space-hardened metal denting under the power of his thrust. Why are they here? he growled. What? The Malurian scrabbled at Lucius's hand around his throat, spluttering. Put me down! Lucius bared his teeth at him. Tell me! He heard a scuffle behind him, and a sharp barked. Stand down! from a female voice. Explain yourself first, warrior! Sraya appeared at his shoulder, holding a pistol to him. You have one minute before I stun your ass. Our scouting party has been attacked at the crater. A military force attacked their camp, captured and interrogated Tarlac, and have them pinned down. There has only been one ship arrive in the past weeks, and it's the envoys. He turned his baleful gold gaze back to the envoy. Tell me what you want and why you have attacked my people. The envoy squirmed again, blubbering. Help me! Lucius growled and snapped elongated fangs at his throat. Cease this performance. We know you, Makenroy. Start talking. Like flipping a switch, Makenroy stilled. He hissed, faceted red eyes flashing, as he discarded his fearful politician persona. If you know of me as you say, then you know this is unwise. Remove your hands, warrior, or I will remove them permanently. Lucius snarled. You can try. The Malurian hissed and slashed upwards the sharp horns on the back of his hands slicing into Lucius's forearms as he pushed the enormous male away. Macon Roy landed lightly on the ground in a crouch, black coat flaring around him. His voice was a low, controlled rumble. I am an Alliance envoy. I have diplomatic immunity. This is an offence against the Alliance. Lucius leaned towards him, his body primed for violence. Does the Alliance condone torture now? Macon Roy shook his head in sharp denial. We do not torture, we are the Alliance, not some savage barbarians. He glared pointedly at Lucius. Sreya laughed bitterly. You must think we were born yesterday. The Alliance has plenty of dirty secrets and dark rooms. Makenroy turned his gaze on her, flicking over her weapons. All right, Gadek, point to you. More accurately, the Alliance did not send me to interrogate anyone here. Then explain this. Lucius accessed the recording of his conversation with Zira, played back her report of the attack and interrogation of Tarlac. Mekenroy stilled as it played. This is a trick. A deception. He shook his head slightly in agitation, the sound producing a rattle. There is no trick. We welcomed you, and you brought a security force that ambushed, kidnapped, and attacked our people. That continues to pursue and attack. Explain yourself. The Malurian looked awkwardly from Lucius to Sreya to his disarmed bodyguards sitting sullenly on the ground, under the watchful gaze of another Philosian. I brought an additional force, but their task was exploration and information gathering only, not to engage. Why? Sreya's words were quiet. Why would you do that? We are an alliance colony, barely formed on a backwater planet. We have no resources, no strategic importance. Why do we warrant a Malurian investigation? Makenroy tilted his head, considering her. Someone thinks you do. I was instructed to travel via spaceship, then used my shuttle to arrive on the planet to deliver the supplies, while another team did some investigating. They are not under my command. You have no proof that the military team attacking your people is even the same group as mine. Who? 
Who thinks we need to be investigated? asked Shreya. The Malurian shrugged. You'll need to do better than that, Envoy. It is all I can tell you. I am on a mission of mercy, bringing you much-needed supplies. And apparently a mission of intelligence gathering as well. Makenroy tisked. Don't be so provincial. The two are not mutually exclusive. Lucius snarled at him again. Don't push me, Snake. Come at me, Kitty. The Malurian crouched, ready to leap at Lucius. That is enough. Sreya shot the ground next to the Malurian's foot and he leapt back gracefully. Our people are in danger. You will not grandstand. Your mockery disrespects us and them. He smiled wickedly at her, looking her up and down. I like you, lovely. She looked at him stonily. I will shoot you if you say one more word. Make up your mind, dear. The furball wants me to talk. You want me to be quiet. So many contradictions. Aren't you meant to be forming a cohesive colony? Sreya stared at him for a long moment, looking him up and down, before swallowing her anger by sheer force of will and plastering a professional smile on her face. Envoy. Clearly our colony is still rustic and untamed. Since you don't claim ownership of this marauding force, we must assume that they are unknown hostiles. We must take all steps to ensure your safety as an Alliance envoy. She turned and motioned towards the security office. We must take you into custody, for your sake, of course. We can't allow you to come to harm on our colony. She cocked her head at his disarmed guards. Especially since your security personnel seem so inept, he hissed, all humour gone from his expression. You can't do this. Can't I? She quirked an eyebrow at him. Has this mysterious force suddenly become less of a threat? She paused expectantly, and he clamped his mouth shut. I thought not. This way, if you please, envoy. She motioned with her gun. Chapter 12 Making a Stand Odrin and Zira raced back down the tunnel towards the cavern. The others were already up, prepping their weapons. Zira's HUD was alerting her constantly as the military invaders passed the security boundaries, and she silenced it in irritation as she donned her ammo belts in the cave. They are in the tunnel, she called. Ready fire. Ariel, you and Odrin will be first wave. Tarlac and I will be second wave. Ulfa, when we run out of charge in our pulse pistols or our rifles, we will step back and allow the other wave to take over. You come and grab the charge kit and give us the replacement, then put the old ones into charge over there in the portable charger. He opened his mouth to object and she cut him off. It's very important. We only have enough for one in action, one in charge, per person at a time. Acknowledge? The young male looked like he was about to throw up, but his voice was steady. Acknowledge, Videk, I won't let you down. She smiled at him, letting him see her pride in his strength. I know you won't. First wave up. Odrin moved to one side of the tunnel entrance, Ariel to the other. Zira and Tarlac took cover behind a broken boulder. She examined him and he smiled gamely, looking weak but determined. They held their breath as they listened to the scuffs of the invaders get closer. Aside from their quiet footsteps, they were eerily silent. No discussion, no commands, nothing. Just the rhythmic low pounding of their feet in the corridor. When the invaders saw the light from the cavern, they pulled up just inside the tunnel, assessing. Zira watched the lead warrior take a cautious step towards the cavern, then another. Odrin raised his pulse pistol to shoot, but Zira held up her hand, motioning him to wait. He locked eyes with her and nodded, waiting for her signal. The warrior came closer and closer. Odrin could now see the three warriors behind him, and he realised what Zira was doing. By not shooting when they were in range... She hid their capabilities and enabled them to take multiple enemy soldiers in this surprise attack, an opportunity they would get only once. His admiration of her strategy was cut short when she dropped her hand in a slashing motion and he and Ariel opened fire. They took out several of the enemy soldiers, their comrades dragging them back by their armoured harnesses into the dimness of the tunnel. The next wave was smarter. They tried projecting a shield in front of them, but it meant that they couldn't shoot either. Zira and Tarlac set up a killing zone so that as they emerged from the tunnel, they cut them down from either side. It was brutal and bloody, but effective. The invaders pulled back, considering their strategy, giving them time to breathe. Zira moved over to him. We need to get out of here. I thought we were waiting for Luke. We were, but we won't last that long. She shared her HUD feed. Whoever they are, they're good. They've already found the second entrance. They'll be behind us if we don't move now, and we can't fight them on two fronts. Our best bet is to move towards the cavern with the ancient tech. It's huge, 
so at the least we'll have cover and somewhere to hide. Perhaps there will be something we can use. Plus, there are lots of caverns between here and there with branching tunnels. Hopefully they burn some time looking for us. Odrin reached out and squeezed her shoulder, and she put her hand over his for a moment. The connection lasted just a second. All too quickly she was moving, informing the others of the plan. They quietly left the cavern in a relay, sacrificing a single pistol to set up a repeating fire pattern to fool the invaders into thinking they were still there. They made their way through the tunnels, unable to move fast because of Tarlac's injury, following the map that the scouting sphere had laid out for them. Their breathing was harsh in the silence, and the threat of their pursuers was ever-present. During a brief respite, Zira noticed Odrin examining the walls of a little cavern they had chosen to rest in. What do you see, Gila? I don't think these are natural caves. Have you noticed there is no moisture, no typical formations such as stalactites or stalagmites? Ulfa overheard them and trained his torchlight over the walls. You are right, they almost look like lava tubes. He lingered his light beam on the smooth surface overhead. But this rock isn't basalt, doesn't look molten. It's crumbled like limestone or sea sponge. There are no lava gutters or protrusions where lava might have pooled. Zira ran her hand over the rock surface, feeling the warmth, and for a split second, the humming she had sensed earlier. There are no animals either. Most caves I've seen before have thriving ecosystems of insects, fungi and other cave-dwelling life forms. There's nothing here. She stood back. This is a mystery for another day. We have to keep moving. The others nodded and wearily got to their feet. They were all running on empty. Tarlac was not doing well, his injuries continuing to seep blood. The rest of them had just spent nearly 16 hours exploring caves before two hours of a high-stress situation. Their operational efficiency was significantly depleted and they would need to rest or risk crashing. They continued, the tunnels seemingly endless. Several times Zira felt like they were going in circles. It reminded her of the House of Mazes on Philosia, where each corridor was the same. She had always hated that amusement park. She'd have to take Odrin some time, she suspected he would love it. Wait, what? Where had that thought come from? She and Odrun were friends. She cared deeply about him, but they'd had a one-night stand, and he had been honest about his inability to commit to a mating. Why in the goddess's name was she thinking about taking him home? What was next? Meeting her sisters? She gave a hushed laugh that had Odrun turning to look at her inquiringly. She waved him off with a smile like hell she was going to share that with him. She had to stop this train of thought now, it would only lead to hurt on both sides. She had accepted what was offered freely. No more. There was a noise up ahead and Ariel, in the lead, held up her hand in command to freeze. Scratch, scratch. Two reflective eyes appeared, just outside of Ariel's torchlight, and she whipped her aimed pulse pistol down the barrel of her torch. There was a slight chuffing and a hiss as the light shone in the creature's eyes, but it was enough for Zira to recognise her little friend. For the love of the goddess, that damn creature is trying to give me a heart attack, Ariel cursed, dropping her pistol down to her side. Hello, little one, crooned Zira, and it stared at her adoringly. How did you get in here? It's not safe here for you. Maybe there is another exit, Odrin offered. Perhaps. Perhaps it is only just big enough for this little one. She crouched down and held out her hand, and it hopped between her and Ariel and sniffed it eagerly, ears dropping when it realised she didn't have any food. Sorry, buddy, we are on rations just now. She scratched its ears gently, and it rumbled in pleasure. Do you know a way out? She sent an impression of outside with her limited empathic skills, a sense of freedom and openness, of smelling the night air. She fell on her ass when she received a response sent back to her, an affirmative and joy at her connection. It was animal, but clearly mildly telepathic. Ariel laughed, having caught the sending. What a curious little friend you've found. The males looked on curiously. Zira's little friend here is telepathic. It just sent her an impression of a way out. That's ridiculous. We are just going to follow some little creature through the tunnels, hoping it leads us home. What's next? Will a winged horse come and collect us and fly us back to the base? Will the summer angel with his flaming sword come to smite our enemies? Tarlac was caustic, and Zira stood dusting off her pants. No, we stick to the plan. We know there is an alien tech site here with cover and possibly tech we can use and we know how to get there. Escape through wherever he came from can be plan C. They nodded and continued. 
noting that the little creature was keeping up with them. It darted here and there, sometimes weaving through their flashlight beams. At one point, Zira swore she heard it above them, clambering along the ceiling. Odrin shuddered and whispered over to her. I know it seems friendly, but it's creepy feeling it brush against me in the dark. Another hour passed, stumbling through the caves, when they realised that there was a faint light emanating from ahead of them. They crept forward, stopping before the end of the tunnel, and Zira peered around a corner at the cavern that opened up before her. They were on the floor level of a giant space, the ceiling so far above her she couldn't see it. Ahead of them was a ship unlike anything she had seen before. It was sleek long and oval, with dull black panels gracefully sweeping back like petals or wings of a bird towards the rear. Parts of the hull were encapsulated in rock that had grown into the ship, giving the impression of towers and crenellations that the bot had captured. As they crept closer, Zira realised it was even bigger than she had first thought, gargantuan. The ship must have been several times the size of the Ardrak, dozens of levels tall. In its prime, it must have been like a flying citadel. It took several minutes to traverse the cavern to reach the base of the vessel. The bottom tiers were gantries made of more of the matte black substance with no obvious openings. Zira led them around to the right until they found what appeared to be an entrance. There was a clear outline of a hatch partially raised in the underbelly, but no indication of how to open it. Ulfa was studying the material, running a scanner over it. This is amazing. I think the entire hull is Zeelan in a configuration I've never seen. His eyes were shocked, open wide. This single ship contains more Zeelan on its hull than the entire Alliance fleet. They must know how to manufacture it. We've never found naturally occurring Zeelan in these quantities. He was almost breathless with the possibilities. Meanwhile, Odrun was studying the rock that surrounded and infiltrated the ship. He reached over to touch the nearest rock and snatched his hand back with a curse. It feels alive! What? Zira examined the rock next to her and saw what he meant. The surface here was more pliable, had a texture like a damp sponge. She hovered her hand over it, and it gave off a perceptible heat. As she got closer, she saw it was covered in tiny filaments of hair, reacting to her presence with slight ripples when she got close enough. It was eerie. During her inspection, Odrin had been moving further along the rock wall, inspecting as he went. The cilia seem to die off the further you get from the wall. He studied the ship. I think the rock isn't rock at all. It's alien and it's coming from that ship. Tarlac scoffed. You think the ancient aliens were rock creatures? It's not out of the realm of possibility, Odrin replied reasonably. Ariel cut them off. This is all very fascinating, but right now I'm more worried about the aliens about to come charging down that passage and kill us. We need somewhere to hide and build defences. An armoured tank would be nice, but right now we need to get inside that ship. Zira nodded. Agreed, Ulfa. What do your scans say? The young male shrugged helplessly. It says that there is no ship here at all, that it is all rock. Damn it. Zira placed her hands on the door, intending to feel the edges to find some sort of panel or manual opening control, as Olfa shouted a warning. As her hand touched the door, it flared into warmth, a bright red circle appearing around her hand where it touched the black surface. She tried to pull her hand away and found herself unable to move, locked into her position. She couldn't even cry for help. Panic drowned her, followed by a soothing sense of calm. It was eerily familiar, the same presence she had sensed periodically during their time at the crater. Her HUD activated without warning, moving with a speed that she had never encountered, the images flashing faster than her eyes could detect. The entire thing took less than three seconds, her companions continuing their deliberations, unaware that anything was amiss. A soft, neutral voice spoke to her. Welcome to High Sudal Trasic. Apologies for the delay in responding, your language was unfamiliar to us. Please state your designation and authorization code. Her vocal cords were still frozen, she could not speak. How? Her mind screamed, and she sensed its confusion. Through your nerve induction interface, of course, is that not its purpose? Zira realised it was connected to her HUD, and tried to think to it. We typically use vocalisations when interfacing with the HUD. She felt its confusion deepen. If that is your preference, we will comply. It is an inefficient means of communication. We do not understand why you would use this when we detect your species is capable of psychic communication directly. Some of my companions are from a different species. They are not capable of psychic communication. 
She sensed its approval. Ah, we understand. Unity and cohesion between species is an important goal. Her vocal cords were freed, and the next interaction came through on the team's shared audio channel on the HUD. As requested, we will interface with your audio technology. Welcome to High Pseudoltrasic. Please state your designation and authorization code. Everyone else jumped and began asking questions at once. The voice calmly spoke over them. The activation process has commenced. We will only respond to queries from the primary interface until activation has completed. There was a long silence, and the voice prompted again. Welcome to High Sudaltrasic. Please state your designation and authorization code. I am Videk Zira Garrick, Felotian Military. I do not have an authorization code. We seek sanctuary. Unauthorized personnel are not allowed on board without a primary operator or authorized operator present. There was a pause. We detect no primary operator is currently living. Pause. We do not detect that any Ulariv remain alive within scanning distance. Another pause. Final orders. Activate ship camouflage and await further orders. Enact protocol cocoon. Enact protocol continuation. It went silent and Zira sensed sadness. It appears that the Ulariv no longer exist in this galaxy as a species. Protocol continuation allows me to register a new primary operator. Do you wish to be considered as a new primary operator? Just say yes, Zero. We have no choice, Odrin called. I, er, uh, yes, I wish to register as a new primary operator. Bonding protocol commenced. Designate secondary operator. What does that mean? The ship paused. The Ulariv were a linked species. They existed in bonded pairs, triads or extended psychic networks, grouped around a central locus, a queen. I have scanned and realised that your species does not function in the same manner. However, I cannot change my fundamental design in this aspect. Most ship systems require a primary and secondary operator at a minimum. All right. Be aware that whomever you choose, you will be psychically bonded with for the remainder of your life. What does that mean? I'm unable to respond accurately. The depth of the bonding varies from species to species. At a minimum, you will be able to hear their thoughts, sense their location and emotions. Is it permanent? It cannot be undone. You will be joined at a subdimensional level that you lack the technology or scientific understanding to detect. Even for the Ularif, the bond was extremely difficult to sever, and often resulted in permanent neurological damage to the bonded. Zira looked around in desperation at the others. They had no other options. She didn't know any of them well apart from Odran, but she couldn't ask him to do this. She looked at her team one by one. Ariel spoke first. For the record, this is a terrible idea. I do not recommend bonding with an alien spaceship. However, I cannot present any other viable options right now. I say do it. Zira looked at Tarlac, who grinned. Life is an adventure. What's life without a little risk? She snorted in response. She looked at Olfa. This is a scientific wet dream. I vote yes. Also, I'd like to not die today. She looked at Odrin. He stepped up to her, touched her face gently. It's all right, Zira, I'll do it. He smiled a little half-smile. Maybe this way I'll understand females a little better. She held his gaze, judging his sincerity before nodding. He stepped up to the door. Secondary operator, place your limb in the indicated panel. Another red circle appeared on the door, and Odrin placed his right hand on it. Primary and secondary operators physically connect to complete the circuit. Zira and Odrin reached out, linking their hands that were not on the door, and a dark red light encircled them. It generated from where their palms touched the door, moving through their bodies to their joined hands. When the red light streams met, it turned a lovely light yellow, and Odrin and Zira stiffened. The energy flowed through them, the light a thousand sparklers in their blood, like a shot of the strongest alcohol. They existed in the intensity for a moment, an eternity, feeling the energy weave back and forth between them, binding them together before the fizzing broke and their minds crashed into one another. Everything they were was exposed. Odrun saw Zira's childhood, her love for her mother and sisters, her accomplishments in the military and the dark periods after battles. Zira saw Odran's fears of being weak, being injured, his desire to prove himself, his complex relationship with the Maman, his love for Luke and his brothers. It lay all that they were bare for the other. Zira also saw Odrin's love for her. It was fledgling, born of admiration, respect and a decent dose of lust, but true and deep. She was flawed by the depth of it. 
He thought the world of her and deeply regretted harming her. Odrin saw how Zera saw him, her admiration and awe for his recovery, how she appreciated both his healing and warrior skills, and her growing feelings for him. It was terrifying and vulnerable and lovely. Whatever happened, they would never be alone. They would be connected to each other forever. It was a gift beyond compare. The red light receded, coalescing at their necks, forming a solid band of the same matte material, the unknown Zealand this time in a dark red. It was paper thin, and with a last burst of fire adhered to their skin. They collapsed to the ground together as the ship released them, wrung out from the experience. When the ship spoke again, it sounded different. The voice was female and warm. Initial bonding stage completed. You and your companions may board. I am Casti. Another pause. It means home away from home. The black raised panel disintegrated into the ship, and they clambered into the dark belly of the vessel. Zira, I have scanned your recent memories. I understand that the personnel coming down the tunnel are attempting to harm you and your companions. Would you like me to start the automated defences? Yes, please, Zira croaked out. Non-lethal, if possible. I would like to capture a prisoner for interrogation. Yes, Zira. Shields up, automated defences activated. Please note that I will also deactivate protocol cocoon, as the formations are now impeding my operational efficiency. This process will take approximately two hours. Until then, most of the ship's functions remain offline. Zira lay on the floor, still trying to catch her breath. What does that mean? Protocol Cocoon creates an organic rock formation that surrounds and protects the ship in the event of prolonged inactivity to prevent an unsuitable species from acquiring Ulariv technology. The Ulariv did not want to be responsible for their technology causing harm in species that are not emotionally ready to form the appropriate ethical value judgments in its use. The rock formations will reabsorb over the next two hours, returning to an inert state of organic material that can be repurposed. The others stood warily in the antechamber, looking around. The room was dark and small, clearly meant for boarding. The walls, floors and ceilings were made of smooth grey rock with pretty pale pink striations. Zira could sense Odran next to her, like a banked fire. If she reached out a slight psychic tendril, can you hear me? An impression of amusement. Loud and clear, Zira. She huffed in laughter. This is going to take some getting used to. She sensed his agreement. Odrin spoke. Casti, one of our companions is injured. Do you have any medical facilities? Yes, Odrin. While my capabilities remain impaired, I have scanned your companion and determined that only basic facilities are required to treat him. Follow the map provided to the nearest emergency medical station. A glowing map appeared on the shared HUD menu. Odrin groaned and levered himself off the floor. Come on, brother, let's get you healed. Zira, can you ask it if we can access external sensors? Ariel inquired. I can hear you, Ariel. I have completed stage one bonding with Zira and have scanned her recent memories. Zira, I can take you to the external sensor chamber if you wish it. Yes, please, Zira replied, and Ariel and Olfa helped her up off the floor, and a second flashing dot appeared on the ship's HUD map. As soon as she stood upright, her head swam, white spots filling her vision and a headache roaring into life. How long do the after-effects last? I am sorry, Zera, I do not know. This is the first time one of your species has bonded with a Casti. Bonded with a Casti. So Casti is a ship type, not the name of this specific ship. Correct, Olfa. The Ulariv did not name ships. They were named based on their operators. In Ulariv, this ship would be High Zeran. If you joined the bond, it would become High Zeranfer. If Ariel joined the bond, it would be High Zeraniel. The ship would become Hoa Zera Z if you both joined the bond. The group bond on the locus of Zera. This vessel is a Casti, designed to provide anything the inhabitants need for long periods of time. It is a self-sustaining ecosystem. We are delighted to have new operators. Why do you switch between we and I? Olfa was brimming with excitement and could barely contain himself. The ship is partially organic and is controlled through a series of interconnected organic nodes that control various functions. We, the nodes, operate as a collective. I, Casti, am the ship's operator interface artificial intelligence. I allow the operator to bond with the ship, provide the means for communication and act as mediator and locus for decision-making within the ship's subsystems. The Ulariv designed their vessels to reflect their society, a harmonious collective whole, 
using both organic and inorganic components. Were the Ulariv rock people? No. However, they evolved from a species you would consider insectoid and often used rock elements in their designs, much as mammalian species often use flora. If the ship is organic, how can anything be left alive for so long? And does the ship reproduce enough, Ulfa? There will be plenty of time for that later. Let's focus on priorities. Zira's mind was buzzing with Ulfa's questions. She was also receiving flashes of Odrin's vision and sound that was not helping her headache. Zira, are you all right? I can feel your distress. Odrin's voice in her mind was a cool balm, calming and soothing the jagged edges. The impressions are overwhelming. It's giving me a pounding headache, she replied. She could swear that she felt him stroke her hair in support. They reached the control room. It was a perfect sphere. They walked out into a gantry hanging in the middle of the room, and one by one segments of the walls came alive, displaying the exterior environment. Dark terminals sprouted around the edge of the gantry and lit up, loading all manner of instruments. Several segments of the sensor grid were offline or dark, blocked in by rock, Zira presumed. I apologise for the crudeness of the interface designs. I am still reconfiguring the Olariv instrumentation to your language and bio-interaction capabilities. Thank you, Casti. We appreciate you accommodating us. Zira sensed its pleasure. It is my purpose. Zira nodded, distracted by the visual shown on the front sensors. It showed the military group standing in the middle of the chamber, examining the ship. Can you tap into their comms? Yes, Zira. They are similar to your own, an archaic design. There was a slight buzz and the feed appeared. Come in, come in, Liberty. This is Strike Force. Can you read? They received only a buzz in response. Casti, are you blocking their comms? No, Zira. The cocoon protocol has grown deep over the period of my rest here. The cocoon's purpose is to preserve the ship's organic componentry and block scans of the ship's interior to prevent our technology being stolen. However, in this case, it also serves as a natural barrier to communication. So they haven't reported that they have found you. Negative. Although there is a small contingent of personnel travelling back to the surface, I hypothesise that this is their purpose. Another view overlaid the right side of the room showing a map of the caverns and tunnels with a red floating dot showing the cavern invaders and a smaller dot showing the second party returning to the surface. Can you block them? Yes, Zira. The cocoon protocol is within my control. As they watched, a new wall formed ahead of the party returning to the surface. Scan the planet. Is there another group travelling towards us? Yes, they are approximately half an hour away at current speed. I detect they are the same species configuration as you and your companions. Would you like to connect to them? Yes, please. Go ahead. Zira spoke into the darkness. First warrior, this is Videx Zira. Do you read? The reply was immediate. Zira, it is good to hear from you. Acknowledged. What is your status? You will not believe this, Luke. I'm... She caught herself. They had invaders and aliens on the planet. Who knew who was listening? Confirm this channel is secure and personnel are authorised to hear mission details. There was a pause. Confirmed, Zira, came Lucius's reply. The word confirmed floated in her vision, and Zira knew without asking that Casti had encrypted the transmission. I am standing inside the ancient ship Lucius, and it's alive. Its name is Casti, and it has accepted me as its operator. There was a long pause. Congratulations, Zira. What is the status of your team? Tarlac was injured. Odran is treating him now. Everyone else is a little bruised but functional. Casti has provided a shield to protect us and advises that it can use non-lethal means to deal with the military party outside. It has also prevented them from reporting the presence of the ship. Lucius's voice was amused when he replied. Sounds like you have thought of everything. And here we thought we were riding to your rescue. Well done, Videk. Ariel guffawed. We try, sir. Excuse my interruption, Zira. The military force in the cavern appears to be planting explosives to gain entrance. Ariel stiffened as Casti continued. There is no danger to us. They cannot harm us or damage the shield. However, where they are planting them is ill-advised and may bring the cavern down on them. Suggest we deploy non-lethal measures to subdue them before they harm themselves. Lucius laughed outright and Zira realised he could hear Casti through the comms. Zira replied, Please deploy measures, Casti. Please also guide Lucius and his team down safely. Yes, Zira. Lucius, I'll see you when you get here. I'll see if we can find a bow to put on top of the invaders for you. You do that, Videk. Confirmed, we'll be there soon. 
Zira slumped down to sit on the deck plate and watched Casti go to work. She wasn't sure what she was seeing at first. It was the faintest of glows. A fine lilac luminescence emanated from the ground, gradually merging into bright white tendrils. They wrapped around the feet and legs of the invaders before they knew what was happening. Wherever they touched, the invaders stiffened, paralysed. The tendrils would up them, pulling on them so that they were lying, unmoving in the ground. It was eerie and beautiful, and devastating in its efficiency. The whole thing took less than five seconds. Zira was so exhausted it took minutes before she realised the desk plate she was sitting on was moving. It softened and lifted, gently cradling her tired body. The top elongated to provide neck support and curved around her head to sit over her temples. When it connected to her forehead, she groaned in delight. It emanated a gentle warmth that eased her headache and gradually washed away her exhaustion. She closed her eyes for a few moments and when she opened them, she felt refreshed, as if she had slept for twelve hours. Ariel watched her in concern, her brow furrowed but said nothing. Thank you, Casti, that was amazing. You are my bonded. It is my purpose to care for you and yours. Thank you anyway, Odrin's voice echoed in her head. I think I'm jealous. I thought only I could make you feel that good. She laughed back. You wish you could make me feel that good. His snorting laugh left, leaving behind his warmth and amusement. Zira admitted to herself that she could easily get addicted to his presence in her mind. We are on our way back with Tarlac. Their healing tech is amazing. He's fully operational again. If that is just their emergency medical station, I can't wait to see their medical bay. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. When Lucius and his team arrived, it was almost anticlimactic. They walked in, following the little red-furred creature, looking slightly freaked out. They had found the invading security force sleeping peacefully on the ground, wrapped in glowing white tendrils head to toe. Zira sent Ariel to meet Lucius and guide him in, but she needn't have bothered. The little red creature ran straight into the control chamber where Zira had been sitting and climbed up next to her. Really? she asked Casti. The extended presence of Casti has had unintended consequences on the flora and fauna of this planet. Many of them have become telepathically sensitive after their exposure. This creature is highly sensitive. I have formed mutually beneficial arrangements with several species to bring me what I need to maintain the organic components. As Casti spoke, Zira tickled the creature under the chin and pulled out a protein bar, ripping off a chunk for him. He sat in her lap on his muscled rear legs, cradling the chunk in his forearms, nibbling delicately as Lucius walked up the gantry. Lucius raised one eyebrow at the creature but refrained from commenting. When Lucius arrived, she gently lifted the creature and deposited it on her seat and stood at attention. I cannot wait for your mission debrief on this one, Videk. She grinned at him, absurdly relieved to have his solid presence there to take command. For a first major mission on a new planet... She was proud of herself, but very relieved to hand back command to her senior officer for the political shit-fight that would come next. Casti informs me that in one hour the ship will be operational again. Apparently it was sent into hibernation by its last operator. Very well. Can you show me the interface with Casti? You may speak to me as you wish, Lucius. Casti's voice was gentle, echoing from around them in the chamber. However, I cannot respond to your commands without the primary operator's permission. Lucius's jaw dropped. Casti, please answer Lucius's queries. Yes, Zira, Casti replied. Casti, what can you tell us about yourself? What is your purpose? As I told Zira, Casti's purpose is to house the bonded group of the primary operator. It is a home away from home, a self-contained ecosystem capable of providing anything the operator requires. What manner of propulsion do you use? How far can you roam before resupplying? Once activated, Casti does not need to be resupplied. We can generate anything the operator requires. As for propulsion, we have ion engines. Zira frowned in confusion. Is something wrong, Zira? Casti asked. I'm just surprised. We use ion engines. I would have thought you would be more advanced, that's all. Engine development did not receive significant research after instantaneous transportation was discovered. The room was silent until Olfa asked in a strangled voice. Your species developed instantaneous transportation. Indeed. How does it work? The AI spoke kindly. I do not believe any of those here present contain the requisite scientific knowledge to understand my answer. 
Does Casti still have this ability? We will once we have returned to operational state and we complete the bonding. Lucius sent a curious look at Zira, who shrugged her shoulders. She had been trying very hard not to think about the fact that she had bonded herself to an alien, sentient, partially organic ship, and Odrin. Casti sent her a gentle alert. Zira, protocol cocoon reversal has reached critical mass. Any personnel outside the ship shields must either move to a safe distance or enter the shield perimeter. Zira looked at Lucius, who nodded, and opened a common HUD channel. All personnel enter the ship. Bring the alien force with you. I can do that, Zira, if you wish, came Casti's reply. Do you have holding cells? I can fashion some for you. I see the image in your mind. Then thank you, please do. On the monitor, the prone bodies of the invaders sunk into the ground of the cavern, and small glowing blue dots that denoted the colony security personnel raced towards the ship. Watch the forward screen, Zira. I think you will find this most enlightening. They stared out at the projected images, and Zira was unsure what she was seeing at first. The image was dim, indistinct. There, movement in the right corner, then the left. As Zira watched, she realised that the cavern walls were disintegrating, disassembling into smaller and smaller parts, and streaming in slow channels filled with glowing motes of energy towards the ship. The image zoomed out, so fast that it caught her breath, and readjusted so that she was looking down into the crater from above. As she watched, the great column shuddered and disintegrated into dust, the base of the crater looking like a slow-motion whirlpool as everything seemed to be pulled towards the centre where Casti waited. Wait, Casti! Yes, Zira? There is a ship in orbit. Can you make sure that this is not visible or scannable? Yes, Zira. I will project an unchanged image above us. Thank you. She could swear that she felt the ship's joy at helping her. Zira and Lucia stood and watched as Casti slowly rose out of the ground, the hole filling behind them, to sit in a slight dip in the landscape. They did not feel even the slightest movement themselves within the ship. Zira was awestruck. It was one of the most incredible things she had ever experienced. Chapter 13. Making Connections Luke and Zira exited the control room sphere, heading for the holding cells, when she stopped dead in her tracks. Gone was the rock entrance. Instead, the corridor was wide and open, the flooring a soothing pale wood, with high arched ceilings and trailing plants in a riot of colours. Casti what? asked Zira weakly. We are in the first stage of bonding. I am becoming psychically attuned to you, Zira. This is your strongest subconscious memory of home, the place you feel most safe, rested and positive. Casti adapts to your desires. Zira walked over and gently touched a vibrant blue flower with yellow speckles, its petals feeling like the softest velvet. A golden tendril reached towards her and wrapped around her finger playfully. It feels so real. The external environment is a simulation. We remain within the ship. However, I have accessed the genetic database on your colony and printed these specimens. They are quite real. Casti paused. Do you like it? I sense your distress. You can consciously alter the environment up to an extent, but Casti is designed to blend with an operator at all levels, to meet your needs before you know you have them. I am inexperienced in blending with your species. Perhaps the bonding needs more time to develop. It feels like... Your grandmother's home on Felosia. Orderan! Zira spun around at his voice and laughed as he ran towards her and lifted her into the air. His joyous laugh coloured the air around them. Isn't it incredible? I know this place through you, Zira. I can feel how much you love it. He dropped her down and held her against him and they were lost in the duality of sensation. She could feel him, his happiness to see her, how relieved he was that she was unharmed. She could sense that Casti had healed his lingering injuries, that he was whole and healthy again, how desperate he was to see her, touch her. They reached up in perfect synchronicity and laid a single finger on each other's cheekbone. Where they touched, a sizzling warmth emanated. Damn goddess, this is freaky, Odrin murmured. Zira nodded, mesmerised by the feedback. So intense. Lucius issued an awkward cough. Excuse me if I could interrupt. They flushed and disentangled, and Odrin spun to engulf the other male in a bear hug. Lucius, isn't this wild? He scratched his chin. Honestly, Odrin, I'm not sure I know what this is. This is so far outside my expertise. I don't even know where to start. Zira and I have bonded to each other and the ship. 
Lucius's eyebrows shot up into his hairline. You've mated. That was quick. Congratulations. No, no, not like that, Odrum paused. Well, maybe a little like that. It's... I'm not sure what it is either, except that it is the most amazing thing I've ever felt. Aha! Uh -huh. That clears up nothing. Lucius looked at Zira, who spread her arms in confusion. It all happened so fast, Luke. We're still processing. It seems to have formed a psychic link between Odrin and I and the ship. She paused. It informed us that the link between Odrin and I was permanent. We knew going into it. Lucius stared at her for a long moment, before turning his head towards the sky and muttering a prayer to the goddess. I think we'll shelf this one for later. Let's focus on the prisoners for now. I'm sure everyone will have an opinion on what we should do about this. He waved his finger in a circle, indicating the entire situation. The prisoners lay on plain white pallets in a communal bunk area, still unconscious. There were no walls. The room was warded off from the rest of the ship by a shimmering blue shield that encircled the bunks. Odrin spoke first. Casti, have you scanned them? Do you know what species they are? They are a variety of species, Odrin. I detect various human template derivatives from Alliance Worlds, a Malurian, a Kluxian, three feline cyborg variants that appear to be related. Their species is not in any database that I can access. A Galatean, two Larans. Thank you, Casti. We get the idea. Mercenaries. Lucius nearly spat the word. Or a conglomerate private security force, countered Zira. They considered. It was a distinct possibility. The trading conglomerates were rich and could easily afford a private army if they wished. It would explain the high-quality tech. If their fledgling colony had run afoul of an intergalactic trading conglomerate, they were screwed. Odrin argued, They came here with a Malurian, and they have one among them. That means mercs. Lucius nodded. Agreed. Did they see the ship? Zira nodded. That's inconvenient. We can't let them escape, and we don't have the facilities for long-term prisoner storage here. That leaves only one option. Execution. Lucius was grim. Actually, Lucius, I can present another option to execution. Casti spoke in its gentle voice. If duly authorised by a law enforcement officer, I can alter their recent memories. From my preliminary scan, I am able to wipe up to 12 hours back without causing any damage. Any longer, and there may be permanent neurological impairment. I will also need to delete sections of the cyborg species' brains and destroy or delete any scans and readings they have taken. Can you replace their memories with something else? No, Zira. Creation of artificial memories contravenes the Ulariv Declaration of Sentient Rights. So we could wipe their memories from just before they chased us into the cavern. Correct. Given the significant alteration in the landscape, it would be reasonable for them to assume that you utilised a weapon unknown to them, as we prevented them from communicating once underground, all they will know is that they chased a small group underground and fell unconscious. You may employ whatever deceptive theatrics you wish to encourage them to leave. Zira and Odrin looked at each other, weighing up the options before nodding. Lucius wondered if they realised how creepy it appeared to see them so in sync. Zira spoke for both of them. Let's do it. We need to interrogate them first, find out who sent them here. How long do you need to adjust their memories? It can be done instantly. Given that they chased us underground nearly five hours ago, we need to move fast. Can you wake just the Malurian up? Yes, Zira. Please do so. Done. It should come around at any moment. I have applied a dampening field that will prevent any tech from working within the cell perimeter. They stood silently, and Zira realised belatedly that she didn't know which of the prone, black-clad bodies was the Malurian. She needn't have worried. Within moments she saw the telltale tensing of muscles, indicating that it was awake, before it scrabbled at its helmet. My apologies, Zira, I may have made a miscalculation. What's wrong, Casti? In dampening the tech, it appears that the Malurian cannot breathe. The helmet and bodysuit are sealed, providing a closed environment. Can Malurians breathe our air? Yes, Zira. I suppose it will have to take its helmet off then to communicate. They watched as the alien did just that, ripping off the helmet and gulping in air. It was jet black, shimmering like marble, with a heavy jaw, brows and nose. Its cheekbones were wider than the typical human template species. Most striking were the swirls of gold patterning its forehead and cheeks, as if molten gold metal had been poured into cracks in its skin. It had a crest of short, bristled black hair that cascaded from the top of its head down its neck and into the jumpsuit. 
As its breathing normalised, it looked around, and they saw it realise that it and its companions were captives. When it registered the observers outside the shimmering barrier, it knelt back on its heels to wait. Lucius spoke first. Normally I would welcome you to Colony 29, but as you failed to declare your arrival and attacked my team, I think we'll dispense with the pleasantries. I am First Warrior Lucius D, Dathalka Clan, Head of Internal Colony Security. State your name, organisation and intention. The Malurian remained silent, examining the group. It fixed on Zira and its golden eyes brightened with interest, and Odrin resisted the urge to growl at it in warning. When it spoke, it was sibilant, its voice low and quiet. You are the leader that defended the cavern. She nodded. It was well done. You held off a better armed superior force through strategy and intelligence. You would be welcome to join us should you ever wish to change your employment. Zira huffed a laugh. Of all the ways she thought this would go, a job offer wasn't one of them. She spoke, amusement in her voice. Thank you. I'll keep that in mind. State your name, organisation and intention. I am Mal from Strike Group Quiet Song. Our intention is classified and I cannot divulge the details of our clients or our mission. Zira laughed outright this time, and Odrin quashed another surge of jealousy that had her flicking a quick, questioning look at him. Mal the Malurian? Really? He smiled self-depreciatingly, and Zira freely admitted to herself that he was hot. My brothers have a sense of humour. Can you stop checking out the prisoner, please? It's bleeding through, came Odrin's mental voice. I'm not dead. He's hot, and it's not like we've made any promises to each other. I distinctly remember you saying to me we'd never mate, she replied haughtily, the mental communication conveying layers of emotion. Chill, I'm hardly going to strip and jump his bones in a cell with you and Lucius watching. You did not just say that. Odrin's voice was caught halfway between amusement and outrage. We've bonded. It changes things now. Does it? came Zira's reply, and Odrin caught a faint thread of emotional resonance that disturbed him, but it passed too fast for him to examine it. Just stop flirting with him for a bit till we work this out. Please. It's getting confusing here. I can feel your attraction to him as if it is my own. Zira turned to Odrin, her eyes wide with mischief. Now that has possibilities. Odrin reached out and gripped her wrist, squeezing gently. The Malurian's eyes flicked to the contact, noting it and smirked, aware that it had scored a mark with them. Lucius spoke again. That is insufficient. You have invaded space deeded to us under Alliance colonial law and attacked our personnel on a scouting mission. Under the same colonial law, we are free to do as we wish with you, including interrogation and execution. Consider this your legally required warning. Failure to answer questions will be held as intention to do harm and treated as a terrorist action. The Malurian looked at Lucius. A scouting mission. Is that what you are calling it? I wonder what your alliance will say when they find out you are hiding Zelan and ancient tech here on your little backwater planet. Lucia smiled evilly. When they find out, we'll be ready for them. You certainly won't be telling them. The alien stood up to his full impressive height. And you think you can keep my brothers and I here indefinitely? Lucius moved to a hair's breadth away from the barrier and met the alien's gaze. No, I don't. You are a security threat to my colony. I won't have an alien force stay here, even in detention. The alien sat down on the edge of the cot. Then it seems we are at an impasse. I understand you need information and will now interrogate me, which will include torture. I am trained to resist torture, even under the most severe of circumstances. Zira cocked her head at him. You seem unaffected. Do you not value your own life? The Malurian looked at her again. Of course I do. But this is the job we signed up for. They pay us well, and we live lives of luxury when we are not here. We would do the same in your position. It is just business. My family will receive my death bonus and live their lives in luxury after I die. It is a fair exchange. Zira felt Odrin's anger at Mal's disregard for life, the casualness with which he discussed taking others' lives for profit. Mal leaned forward, his arms resting on his thighs. Although you may wish to consider the consequences, my people will come after me. The value of this strike team is in the millions. They will not let the destruction of such a team go uninvestigated. This is just the start of a world of pain for you. He laughed again. Like I said, you are at an impasse. Odran, would you try something with me? What is it? My psychic skills on my own aren't that strong. 
I wonder if we join using the ship's bond whether I can boost them enough to peer into his mind. Odrin considered, like the Kadek did with the saboteur. Yes, although she is highly skilled, this will be a hammer to her scalpel. Zira felt his assent. Casti, immobilize the prisoner. Keep him conscious. She turned to Lucius. Odrin and I are going to try something. This may not work. He looked at them both before nodding his permission. Casti, drop the barrier. The barrier dropped, and the prisoner made to stand up, realising that he could not move at all. His eyes conveyed the panic and terror he felt at his helplessness as they approached before he shored up his internal defences, bracing himself. Be calm, Mal. Tell me what I want to know, and then this will all be a nightmare in the past. You can go back to your life of luxury in between stints of murdering people. Acid dripped from her words. She held out her hand to Odran and felt their bond snap into place. As one, they each placed a fingertip on Mal's temples, connecting the circuit. She reached out with mental fingers, sheathing them in power, forming gauntlets of psychic energy, and wrapped her hand around his mind. Tell me why you came here, she demanded. No, he grunted out, and it surprised her, the power she felt shoved back at the walls of her mind. Belatedly realising that Malurian was mildly psychic as well, she squeezed harder. Tell me... Her taloned fingers dug into his mind, shearing through his defences, and he screamed in agony. She increased the pressure, and each time she did, she felt him scream, felt him crumple a little further, felt him slip further away from sanity. Her mind was a vice encircling his, his thoughts battering his own mind as they threw themselves against the wall of her will, fraying under the pressure of her assault. She heard Odrin crying out in her mind, demanding that she stop insisting that this was too far. Within her mind, Zira whispered, Casti, help us. She felt a surge of energy flow through her, felt Mal's mind give a final desperate cry before collapsing into itself. She felt his acceptance of defeat, his silent weeping inside his mind, and for a moment allowed herself to realise the full horror of what she had done before she shoved it down. She would see this through. Tell me, she whispered again inside his mind. This time he told her. Zira instructed Casti to release the bonds on Mal's vocal cords and head to allow him to speak. His voice was calm, distant. Svoboda, he intoned. Svoboda instructed us to come here. He gasped, trying to wrench away her control, but she held fast. They had an operative on this planet that went dark. Before he ceased communication, he told them you had made a discovery here, something Svoboda could use as leverage to prevent this colony going ahead. Lucius asked, why do they care so much if this colony goes ahead? What difference does it make to them? Mal responded in that same leaden tone. I don't know, I only suspect. Go on. Svoboda suspects that this planet, or one nearby, has Zilan. They've sent us on lots of clandestine security missions, and something they found pointed them towards this sector of space. They wanted this planet for themselves. Why didn't they apply? They had every chance. They have their own enemies, they didn't want to make their interest obvious. When word gets out that there is Xylan here, it'll be a free-for-all. They wanted everything in place before that. They overplayed their hand. There hadn't been a new colony world in years. No one predicted your application. You caught them off guard. They weren't ready to move. The pieces weren't all in place. Couple that with their hatred of powerful females. They want no more matriarchal societies being established. It's become a priority mission for them. Mal was rapidly deteriorating, his skin turning ashen grey. Word is that they tried to block your application. By forcing them to back down, you undermined them and ruined decades of work. They looked bad, and their allies are now questioning whether they can deliver on their promises. They have to recover this world, or it will all fall apart for them. Does the envoy know? Mal shook his head. He knows they sent a team, but not the details of their mission. He doesn't know we work for Svoboda. He thinks he is here on behalf of the Alliance. Odrin grabbed Zira's arm. All right, Zira, enough. We have what we wanted, let him go. She slashed a glance at him in annoyance before the depth of his emotions stopped her cold. He was truly furious with her, disgusted almost. All right, Odrin. She reached over and delicately removed his hand from her arm. Casti, release Mal. The alien collapsed to the floor, sobbing, rolling into a fetal ball. Zira felt strangely detached, like she was tethered to reality by the thinnest of threads. Don't worry, 
she crooned. You won't remember any of this. He looked at her hurt and fury in his eyes. That doesn't make it all right. The reproach ignited her own fury. Would you have preferred that I maim you? Cut off some fingers, maybe an ear? How about removing a few teeth like you did to Tarlac? Because that was where we were heading. Don't pretend you wouldn't have done the same. You abducted Tarlac and had him tortured. At least I would have had a chance to fight back, he shot. Like Tarlac could, bound by immobilization bands. Her voice lashed him. How very male. How many times have you tortured those physically weaker than you? Did you comfort yourself with the lie that they could have fought back? He didn't meet her eyes, and she reached out to grip his chin, forcing him to look at her. I saw inside your mind. I know what you've done. Justify it however you want. He jerked his head away and rolled over, turning his back on her. Live with it. Zira snorted. Social philosophy from a mercenary that invaded and hunted us. Goddess, give me a break. Odrin stepped forward and put his arm around her shoulders, pulling her back beyond the barrier as it reinitialized. Casti, put him back to sleep and begin the memory wipe process. Keep them unconscious until we are ready. I require authorization from an officer of the law. Lucia spoke and they both started, having forgotten his silent presence was watching. I authorize as head of security on Colony 29. Accepted. Action initialized. He looked at them both, his expression troubled. All right, you two. There's a shitload of stuff going down. I have only one order for you both. Rest. You and your team have been through a lot in the past two days, so as of now, until I tell you otherwise, you are on a rest cycle. As soon as Luke spoke, Zira realised how bone-weary she was. She nodded and sighed and scratched her nails over the stubble on the shaved sides of her head. I don't even know where my stuff is. Casti spoke. Zira, I have prepared rest quarters for you and your team and will transport your goods there. Please follow the map. Somehow, Zira and Odrin stumbled their way through the ship, following the lit HUD map until they reached the rooms that had been set aside for them. When they neared the rooms, Zira realised she didn't actually need the map. She knew where she was going. It felt like coming home, intimately familiar. Like the rest of the ship, the rest chamber had morphed to resemble her grandmother's seaside home on Felosia, but today Zira didn't step onto the balcony to admire the black sand and sea view. She heard Odrin murmuring to her, but did not have the energy to respond. She fell face first onto the bed, piled with soft linens and was out like a light. Odrin was ensconced in a soft, warm, dark cocoon. He had never felt so relaxed in his life. After a while, he realised that the dark was not true blackness. There were pinpricks of light. Gradually, the pinpricks multiplied and merged, becoming golden fireflies, fluttering to form a dim, warm light surrounding him. He reached his hand up to rub his eyes to clear them and tangled in the heavy furs. Wait, furs? He extricated himself and opened his eyes properly to look around. His breath caught. He was home, in his bedchamber at the Dathalka clan complex, in the wing of Lucius's family. He heard a low moan behind him, and he leaned over to pull back the furs to reveal Zira. She moaned again and opened her eyes a slit to glare at him. What? she grumbled. Swarm! She snuggled down into the furs, already closing her eyes to sleep again. Don't you want to see my home? What? Her eyes were bleary when she opened them again, but awake. Casti has altered the room again while we slept. Look. Slowly she returned to awareness and sat up and looked around. She was delightfully mussed, creases still lining her sleepy face from the sheets. Looking around, she gasped in surprise. It's lovely. He looked at it again, seeing it anew through her eyes, feeling her wonder at his home. The room was lovely, he realised. It had been his room since his youth, so he hadn't ever really considered it. Like most Verrett clan homes, it was in an extensive cave network, heated by geothermal energy deep under the frozen surface of Verrett. His chamber was wide and dimly lit. A large hearth took up most of one wall, piles of cave moss banked and providing a warm orange glow and gentle heat. The roof and walls were an uneven pale stone, smoothed over time by the hands of the Dathalka clan males. In niches and crevices in the walls, bioluminescent fungi gathered, providing additional light. Occasional tapestries dotted the walls, featuring scenes from Verrett culture, softening the harshness. Embedded along the wall at floor level were clear interface crystals that supported the AI automation of the complex. 
he swung his legs off the bed platform, set in the centre of the room before the hearth. His feet landed on one of the many plush rugs that covered the floor in layers, each in deep blues and greens, the colours of the Dathalka. He helped Zera off the bed, her eyes wide as she examined the chamber. She brought the bed furs with her, wrapping them around her for warmth over the light nightdress she wore. Looking at her in his furs, he shivered, realising that he was clad only in pyjama bottoms. He snagged her as she passed and pulled an edge of the furs aside so that he could snuggle in with her, wrapping them both in the covers. This is your room, she whispered. He nodded. Since I joined Atalka. He drew her towards one wall. Look. He touched a point on a wall and the wall turned transparent, revealing a view down from a cliff edge over a vast underground lake, lit by floating beds of bioluminescent algae and simulated sunlight. Clan members could be spotted swimming, boating and playing in the waters below. Zira leaned forward, pressing her hand against the security field. Can we go down? Odrin shrugged. I don't know. I don't know how much Casti can do. She smiled at him and took his breath away at the joy shining from her eyes. She turned back into the room, examining the large, dark red circular sofa on one side, facing his giant entertainment screen. His study desk was on the other side, still littered with his pads, papers and the minutiae of his life. He couldn't believe how real it all felt. Zira shivered again and he pulled her over to the fire. He grabbed the poker and stoked the moss up, adding a brick of dried fungus to burn. He wrapped his arms around her again and pulled the furs up to her neck. She nuzzled into him, pressing her cold nose into the nape of his neck to warm up. You are so warm. It feels nice. We are well adapted to an ice planet. I don't even care that I'm wearing dead animal skin right now. I just want to warm up. They piled back into the bed, and he activated the heat pad on the mattress. Gradually, her shivering stopped, and they lay warm and cosy together in the nest of blankets and furs. Why do you think Casti brought us here? she asked. I wanted to show you my home. It must have picked up on it. She lazily stroked his arm as she snuggled in. I wish I could see it for real. He stoked her hair down her back. It's unlikely. Verit is closed to outsiders. The Maman trust no one. That's so sad. It's lovely. It should be appreciated. He shrugged. It's just the way it is. She hesitated, but had to ask the question burning in her mind. Are you okay? I felt how angry you were when we interrogated the mercenary. He shrugged. I was angry. If we have to become them to win, then the victory will be meaningless. And now, she pressed, I'm tired. I thought about what you said about the dislike of psychic warfare being a male prejudice. You are right, my lady, but it doesn't make it any easier to swallow. You would have preferred we torture and execute him. He shrugged again. No, but I am uncomfortable with my part in it. I accept the choice we made, but that power needs consideration before use. I will not be pushed into doing it again. She sighed. What are we going to do, Odrun? You said you could never mate. Then you bound yourself to me like this. It's more permanent and deeper than any mating contract could have been. Fear settled in his gut. I don't know. I wasn't thinking about any of that. Just that I wanted us to survive and hated the thought of someone else being bound to you that way. It might be possessive and stupid, but I wanted to be the one connected to you forever. Permanently. He felt Zera tense. Your mamma is going to be so pissed. He laughed uneasily. Yes, she will. He had been trying not to think about the maman's reaction. Zira smoothed a hand down his chest to rest above his heart, attempting to soothe his anxiety. It'll be all right, Odrin, so what? She'll be annoyed. It's done and can't be undone. What's the worst she can do? His stomach tightened. You do not know what she can do. You bonded with a female, on a planet designed for mating, that she brought you to. She's not going to kill you. He remained silent, and Zira levered up on her elbow to look at him. Searching his gaze, feeling his churning emotions, she paused. What am I missing? You do not know what the Mammon are like. You see Frey and think her spoiled and angry. But the Mammon, they are vicious and cunning, and they control Verit absolutely. They are strategic, they do nothing without purpose or plan, and kill to get what they want. If our bonding impedes one of her machinations... She may well try to kill one of us without a moment's thought. Zira bared her teeth at him. She won't find us an easy target. 
She is more dangerous than you can possibly understand. She wouldn't come at you in the open. How would you feel if she threatened your sisters? Zira blanched in fear and he hugged her tightly. It may not come to that. We don't know her purpose for the life debt. This may not block her plans. It may even complement them. As you say, she brought me to a planet designed for mating. We may be jumping at shadows. He felt Zira gradually relax, felt her hesitation before she asked quietly, Do you regret it? His rejection was immediate and he lifted her chin to look at him. Never, my Dalat. Whatever happens, I will never regret this bond. Feeling you inside me is the most incredible thing I have ever experienced. I am honoured beyond measure that you accepted me. Her eyes misted. I am the one that's honoured, Odrin. I will never forgive myself if our bond causes you harm. He kissed her gently, tracing his way up her cheekbone, tasting her tears. Don't cry, it'll be okay. Don't cry. She gripped his hair, pulling him towards her to deepen the kiss as she moved over to straddle him. He skimmed his hands up her back, trailing his fingers along her strong thighs and around to grip her ass firmly, and had her moaning into his kiss. They twined together, driving each other to the edge with gentle and not-so-gentle nibbles and licks. He pushed her harder and higher as she cursed him. When she came, she reached out to him with her mind and linked with him, and he screamed in pleasure and shock with her as she shared the exquisite sensations running through her. She collapsed, sweaty, but he refused to let her rest. Still joined, he trailed his fingertips over her skin, feeling the sensitive spikes of pleasure and pain reverberate through their loop. Come, beloved, my Dalat. He punctuated each word with butterfly kisses as he guided her hand to him, and as she gripped and massaged him firmly, he shared the sensations with her. She gasped with shock and the intensity, her eyes flicking open at the realisation of the feedback loop she had created. He pulled her towards him, weaving his hands in her hair, wrenching her head back to make her look at him, making sure that she was here, in this moment, not lost in their joined sensations. Yes, Zira. She looked at him for a long moment, a single second of clarity and stillness on the roaring whirlwind of their joined sensations. Yes, Odran. They moved together, and it was raw and real and perfect, and he had never felt more alive. The Dark Stranger lived in perfect synchronicity with him, and Odrin gripped Zira tighter. She was a goddess in truth, fierce and passionate and unafraid. She took all of him, everything he could give her, and demanded more. They were about to crest, the sensations feeding and spiralling together. Odrin leant forward and sank his fangs into the nape of her neck as the tips of his claws shot out to pierce the skin of her hips as he slammed her down onto him. She laughed wickedly and followed suit, sinking her small teeth into his shoulder. The final spike of pain pushed them both over, and they convulsed together. Stars clouded their vision, and their pleasure wrung them dry. In the aftermath they stayed there, arms wrapped around each other, still joined by flesh and sticky sweat as Odrin lapped at the puncture wounds he had left on her nape. Zira raised a shaking hand to sweep back her hair, the slight movement sending delicious aftershocks through them both that had them shuddering again. That was incredible, I've never felt... She trailed off, unable to articulate the beauty of their shared bond. He hugged her tight, his heart full. Me neither. He felt her heart beat against him, felt the racing, felt the slight friction as she moved against the crisp hairs of his chest. That was insane in the best way. I think you have addicted me to you. Zira laughed as she drew little circles on his back with her fingertips, feeling his responses, feeling how much he loved it. You addicted me first. Did not. You connected us. He shot back, leaning down to massage her ass. Are you really arguing with me right now? You love it. He felt her smile inside him. I do. She stilled. And I love you, Odrin. I know it's crazy and we barely know each other, really. But in another way, I know you better than anyone else in the world. She looked at him. I see you, Odrin, all of you. The healer, the warrior, the dark stranger that so desires to possess me. I see you and I love you. He felt his heart stutter to hear her speak his deepest fears, that no female would ever see and love all of him, understand his need to possess and control in their bed. He praised the goddess again that she had brought him his Zira, this incredible fierce female that was not scared of anything, that met him stroke for stroke. And I you, Zira. I see you. I see your fears, your joys. I promise, beloved, 
that I will spend the rest of our lives doing everything I can to make you happy. She reached up to clamp her hand over his lips. Hush, Odrin. Don't make promises you can't keep. Not until you resolve your life debt. Let's just leave it at that. That I love you deeply and truly and you love me. She touched her breast over her heart. I feel you here. I feel your love. Let us enjoy it and deal with the rest tomorrow. After a long moment, he nodded. He reached out to touch her over her heart. My heart will always be yours, my love. Believe that. She nodded. Again? Let us see how high we can push each other. Zira gasped. They had little time or energy for thought after that, as their bond solidified over the long night. The next morning they woke up refreshed and ready for whatever came next. The bond settled and quiet in their minds. Zira had feared that they would be tied together forever in that maelstrom of emotion and sensation. Instead, their bond felt like a solid black cable at the edge of her awareness. She felt Odrin happy and content sitting in the back of her mind. He was all but purring, a contented cat, as they strolled towards the command centre. You look insufferably smug. It's disgusting, he said, as he brushed a heavy warm palm down her back to cup her ass, giving her butt a shameless pat as they walked. How can I not be? I have the hottest male on the planet and he's all mine. He looked at her and sent a pulse of love down their bond, his heart in his eyes. I am your most devoted slave, lady. So long as you remember you are all mine too. He twined the rope of her braid around his hand and pulled her towards him, nibbling and kissing at her lips. Ahem, excuse me. Lucius stood there, grinning from ear to ear. Zira flushed. Apologies, first warrior. Accepted, Videk. Head into the command room, I'll be there shortly. Odrin, a moment. Zira nodded and left with a smile. Are you well, Odrin? I am, Luke. Casti healed my injuries, but I was nearly back to peak anyway. There was an awkward silence. Odi, are you sure? Odrin's eyes widened in surprise. What, about Zira? Of course I am, why do you ask? I like Zira. She's a fine female and an excellent warrior, but she's not what I expected of you. I see. Odrin crossed his arms defensively. And what did you expect? Lucius shrugged. I don't know. Someone more cerebral, I guess. A scientist or a healer like you. You think that because she isn't a scientist, she's not intelligent. Lucius frowned at him. Don't put words in my mouth, Odrin. That's not what I meant at all. I just want you to make sure you know what you're getting into. Like you did with Denny, Lucius snarled. Don't bring my mate into this. Because you two are such an excellent role model for us all. Odrin spat. Lucius took a step back, taking a deep breath to calm himself. I'm concerned for you, Odie. You have been my clan and family brother since you were six. I taught you to hold your first sword. This is sudden and impetuous, and it's not like you at all. He scrubbed a calloused hand over his face. Are you sure it's you and Zira that made the decision to bond? You're connected through an unknown alien machine which has access to your subconscious. Lucius motioned to the hallway and the simulation of a sea breeze bellowing through the curtains. Odrin stepped into Lucius's space, his voice intense. And how are you so sure what I'm really like? I don't think any of you actually know me at all. He jabbed a finger after Zira. She gets me. For the first time in my life, someone sees me. All the way down, all the dark pieces, and she loves me. Odrin cursed. Zira and I care about each other. We'll work the rest of it or we won't. It's nothing to do with you. He turned and stalked away. It took a while to organise to head back to the colony. Lucius was arranging for the security team he had brought to stay behind to guard the unconscious prisoners and Casti. When Zira informed Casti that she was heading back to the colony, Casti was happy to comply. Very well. My engines are not yet functional enough to undertake interstellar travel, but are sufficient for planetary travel. However, from my scan of your colony site, I cannot land without damaging local flora and fauna. I will need to transport you to the colony via other means. Um, Casti, I don't think that's a good idea. We need to keep you a secret. Someone will notice a giant alien ship floating over the colony. Casti was silent for a long moment, and Zira worried that she had offended it. When it spoke gently, Zira realised it had been trying to find simple words to explain to her, like speaking to a child. Zira, I am Casti. My purpose is to transport you and yours wherever you need to go. I am able to shield myself from any sensors you and your people have, as well as visual and audio detection from the ground. Zira looked to Lucius frantically for guidance, who simply shrugged. All right, Casti, thank you. What do you need? 
Instruct any personnel you wish to travel with us to board. Any other personnel should evacuate approximately the crater depression. This vessel has remained here for an extended period, so there will be significant geologic impact of removal from the surface. I can restore the surface once I have left, but the initial takeoff will be disruptive. Ah, right? Okay. She looked at Lucius, who relayed the command. In short order, all personnel were on board. Are there any safety protocols for takeoff? No, Zera. My purpose is comfort and transport. I will not harm your personnel. You need only command me where you wish to go. Before Zera, a control panel flowed from the featureless deck plate. It grew organically, forming a matte black surface with a slight raised outline of a handprint. Please place your handprint to initialize engines, then command me as you see fit. Zera took a deep breath and blew it out. Here goes nothing. She placed her hand on the panel and waited. Engines initialized, came Casti's reply. Please state your destination. Colony 29 Base Camp. Confirmed. There was no sound, no vibration. Nothing. After almost a minute of silence, Zira ventured to ask, How long will it take? It will take two minutes to clear the crater, one minute to restore the surface. Our travel will take approximately five minutes once we have cleared the crater. When will we leave? We already have. Zira jumped. What? When? We felt nothing. When you commanded. This vessel's purpose is transport. It has been designed. Okay, okay, I get it. Can you show me a feed of outside, please? All around her, the curved panels of the control room disappeared, replaced by an exterior feed. Zira's mouth gaped. They were slowly travelling upwards, the depression filling in behind them. It was unbelievable. The size of the ship, the speed of the ascent, and there was nothing. No sensation of movement, sound, or anything. She turned to Lucius, who was looking at her in astonishment. Um, right? Thank you, Casti. The geography whooshed by them as the ship sped towards the colony. It was unreal, like something out of the galactic entertainment net. Her mind boggled at the manipulation of physics in play to feel nothing at all. Within minutes, they were hovering, cloaked over the colony site. Casti produced several small pods for them to ferry down, resulting in Zira sitting her butt in the conference room chairs of the cadet's office just 15 minutes after the decision to head back. It was surreal and she was struggling to keep up with it all. Odrun sat by her side, outwardly relaxed. If not for her bond, she would never have known that his sense of disconnection and strangeness was every bit as strong as hers. Around the table sat the Mammon, the Kadek, Lucius, Dinara and Sreya. The Mammon positively glowed with avarice when she heard that Zira and Odran had bonded with the alien AI. Well done, well done. Excellent thinking. She beamed at them approvingly, and Zira resisted the urge to scoot closer to Odran under her gaze. This will change the future for our species. Our planets will rule the alliance with this. The military, medical and research implications cannot be underestimated. Coupled with the Zillion, we stand on the edge of a new eon of human existence. The cadet cut her off. I share your enthusiasm, Maman, but we are at a fragile stage. We are in no way prepared to defend our new asset or the planet. We must plan these next steps with care. We must decide what to do with the envoy and whether to confront the Alliance. The Maman looked at the cadet for a long moment, considering, and Zira swore that silent communication passed between the two. It still surprised her that two such different females could work together for the benefit of the colony. I agree, Kadek. This decision is bigger than us. We need to confer with our governments. Sreya leaned forward. While I agree with the need to seek instructions, I cannot guarantee the security of our communication channels just now. We don't know who that group really was, or what technology they were using to scan, and we still need to do something about the envoy, the strike team, and a possible spaceship nearby. The Maman looked at Odran. Can we use the alien ship? Odrun tapped his finger on the desk. Possibly, but we know so little about it. It's risky trusting something so important to an unknown alien tech. It has shown every sign of being trustworthy, but unless it is a last resort, I would not recommend it. Dinara jumped in. Are we just ignoring that two of our personnel interacted with alien tech directly? They should be in quarantine. Everyone should. This mission was search and report only. You could all be infested with alien plague right now. Casti's soft voice spoke in Zira's ear. I have completed mapping your genotype and have absorbed your medical records. I have confirmed that you have not suffered any negative health impacts from contact with Casti. 
Odrin and Zera looked at each other and laughed and relayed the message. Dinara was decidedly unimpressed. Forgive me if I don't take an alien AI's word for it, the cadet cut in. It's done now. Everyone seems fine. Dinara looked at her. Are you insane? It's like you've never seen a movie before. Enough, Dinara. The call is mine. Dinara clenched her jaw, remaining silent. We need to consult with our governments, and we cannot trust the comms. We must go to them. We will arrange a conference, the cadet announced. Where? asked Sraya. Intgal 1. Intgal 1? Why? What's there? It's a security nightmare, asked Odrin. Zira grinned. It's perfect. Hundreds of ships of all species go through there every day. If we can't use Casti, we won't be able to hide that we are sending a ship off-world, so secrecy isn't an option for us. The next best option is to blend in. Species organise meetings and conferences there all the time. Have you considered why we might be choosing to send a ship to an intergalactic trade station? Me? The maman spoke up, and everyone looked at her. It's fairly well known that I'm unwell and not getting better. I could go to seek medical treatment off-world. The chief healer has recommended moving to an off-world medical facility previously in her notes, should anyone wish to dig into our reasoning. The cadet nodded. Very well. Let's organise it. How soon can you get a Verit transport here? Within a day or two. Then it's settled. I can't go. I must stay here. The Mamon, Lucius and Zira will go. Zira nodded. The Mamon frowned. I wish to take Odran as well. Zira felt Odran's surprise, and the cadet looked at the Mamon sharply. Very well, Mamon. Odran may go as well. Sreya sat forward. What about the envoy or the security team? The cadet tapped her fingers against the desk in contemplation. The envoy can remain our guest for now. Have him send a message that he is staying to consult with us longer. Sreya looked dubious. I don't know if he'll go for that. Convince him, Gadek. Sreya nodded reluctantly. As for the security force, let us engage in some theatrics. Take them to the crater site, tie them up, and let them wake up naturally. Have a team interrogate them and tie one of them just lightly enough so that they can escape. Let them overhear the team discussing that they were caught while we were surveying and prepping for a new colony site. The maman was sceptical. You really think that will work? The cadet shrugged. It's the best option. They will remember dropping into the crater and attacking our team. They may even have been able to report that, but thanks to Casti's interference, nothing else. We won't hide that we were at the crater, just our purpose. Sprinkle a little truth with our deception. They may wonder where their two days went to, but it's unlikely they will come back and ask if their purpose is subterfuge. We should just kill them. And bring the might of a merc group or trading conglomerate down on us. The cadet shook her head. This is the best of bad options. Meeting concluded, they went their separate ways. Zira watched the maman stand, leaning heavily on her ornate cane, Skara at her arm as she moved to the doorway. Odran, attend me. I wish to hear a full debrief of your experience. He looked at Zira apologetically, touching her elbow briefly in goodbye. I'll see you later, he whispered in her mind. He obediently took the maman's other arm and, with Skara, supported her out the door towards her quarter. Zira couldn't shake the sense of foreboding that came over her, watching them walk away. Chapter 14. Road Trip the Verit ship was like nothing Zira had ever seen. The Ardrak, the colony ship that had brought the colonists to the planet originally, had been over 100 years old and designed for functionality. Casti was completely alien, designed to move with her subconscious. The Verit ship, the Al Marai, was a flying palace. Designed to transport Maman and their personnel, it was luxury personified. The floors were pale polished marble, shot through with veins of dark blue, it looked like sunlight through ice. The walls and ceiling were a gentle pale grey, and the architecture was severe, all right angles and stonework. From inside, you could easily have believed that you were in a castle on old earth. It had some of the same elements of Odran's beloved rooms at the Dathalka clan complex, but refined to the nth degree. From the moment they stepped onto the ship, the maman took over. Her aides hustled forward, clucking like hens over her condition, and bundled her into a litter. A junior maman imperiously motioned for them to follow, and Zira, Odran and her team were shown to an extensive suite of apartments. Zira watched Odran closely, trying to pick through the emotions that were transferring to her through their unreliable bond. 
As soon as it had been announced that they would travel to Intgal via a Verit transport, his anxiety had started to rise. She moved to stand next to him as he examined a statuette of the goddess in navy blue marble, spotlit with hidden lights. I didn't realise you were such a lover of art. He smiled at her absently but didn't respond. Oh no, this was serious. What's wrong? she murmured. He sighed and didn't pretend not to know what she was talking about. I hate this place. I had forgotten what it was like being here. I am realising that I feel like a stranger among my own people. What's wrong with it? I mean, the decor isn't to my taste, but... Don't make fun of me, Zira. His voice was tight. I'm not in the mood. I'm sorry, Odrin. I'm just trying to ease you. I don't know how to help. I know. He reached over and grasped her hand, squeezing gently. You've never seen us with other Mammon before. On the colony, we have a level of freedom unknown on Verit. It's why we want to stay so badly. I know that you Philosians dislike Mammon Frey, but compared to most, she isn't bad at all. She genuinely cares for her people, even if it is a rough kind of love. But the others here, it brings back memories. I'm sorry, Odran. I can't imagine how it must have been for you. At least this is temporary. A couple more days and we'll be home again. He turned his megawatt smile on her. Home. I can't believe that planet has become home so quickly. He pulled her towards him to nuzzle her cheek. Home with my smoking hot, dangerous mate and an alien spaceship to spend my life researching. Bliss. Don't get ahead of yourself, love. You still need the Mammon's permission to mate. He took a deep breath. Yes, you're right. I will need to negotiate with her for permission. Whatever she wants, I'll give her. You're worth it. When he looked at her, his heart was in his eyes, and Zera found herself unexpectedly blinking back tears. Oh, damn it, I'm totally sunk. How the hell did you get under my skin this quickly? He grinned at her. I'm skilled. Besides, that's what they call me. Quick shot Odrin. Quick to hook him. Quick to... Zera cracked up laughing as she shushed him. Excuse me, Videk. I'm sorry to interrupt your moment of levity, but the maman has summoned Odron Dare. A junior maman had appeared, silent and elegant like her sisters in her flowing cerulean robes. Oh, of course, please do. Zira smiled and stepped back. Is the maman feeling better? The young aide beamed at her. Yes, milady, thank you for your concern. She spoke to Odron, her face assuming a serious expression. Please follow me, healer. She turned with a swish of her robes, Odrin casting a small smile at Zira as he fell in with the two Verit males assigned to guard the young mammal. Odrin walked through the hallways, feeling as if he was on his death march. When he reached her quarter, the mammal was propped up against piles of silk pillows in a four-poster bed, tucked in with acres of pillowy comforters. It was quiet in her room, the usual coterie of advisers nowhere to be seen. Come in, Odrin. I wish to discuss something with you. She motioned with a skeletal hand to a seat next to her bed. Are you feeling all right, my lady? She coughed rustily, scrabbling in her pocket for a cloth to cover her mouth. No, as you well know. Perhaps your alien ship can provide some medical miracle for me when we return. What can I do for you, maman? She studied him, letting the silence draw out between them. I have noted your bond with Zera. Odran was not surprised. The maman saw everything. He didn't reply waiting to see where she was going. Do you wish to mate with her? Yes, my lady, if you would consent. The maman considered, her finger tracing the delicate embroidery of the coverlet. She is a fine female, strong and willing to make the hard choices when necessary. Others may question your selection, but I see much in her that matches your soul. Odrin's heart soared. He couldn't believe that she was considering it. However, I do not consent, at least not now. You owe me a life debt, Odrunde. I now call it in. Odrun was light-headed with shock. He numbly replied, What would you have me do, Maman? Skara is nearly of an age where she must take her first mate. The Maman sighed heavily. I have done my best, but she is too soft. A gentle soul. She needs more care, more time to mature. You will offer yourself for Skara's pleasure to be her first mate. Goddess willing, you will father her first child. Odran could not have been more surprised if the maman had ordered him to walk out an airlock. Why me? The maman leaned towards him and reached out a hand to grip his, her voice urgent. You are a fit male, Odran, the best of us. I have seen to your upbringing myself. You are a healer. You have patience and kindness written in your bones. You will support her during this transition. She sat back, releasing him. 
You are also a warrior and intelligent. You can support her and protect her during this dangerous time. Why now? Maman do not always take a mate straight away. She cackled bitterly. I am dying, Odron. She stopped his protests with a hand. Don't pretend otherwise. Through my own foolishness and arrogance, I am dying. Her eyes shimmered in the dim light with unshed tears. Unless your alien machine can deliver a miracle, I will meet the goddess soon. I will see both Skara and Bailel protected before I leave this world. Odran couldn't answer. She was right. All of Danara's treatments had failed. What of Zira? She loves me. She will never accept this. If she loves you as much as she says she does, she will wait. A mammal's first contract is only three years. Five if there are offspring. She can wait that long. Odron stood, agitated. Please don't ask me to do this, Maman. I love Zera. I barely know Skara. How do you know she would even want me? She will do as ordered. The Maman smoothed her covers, sat up as straight as she could in her bed. And I am not asking you, Odran. You owe me a life debt. You are ordered. Panic overtook him. He could feel his chance at happiness slipping away. I won't do it. Anything else, yes, but not this. It would be a betrayal of everything Zira and I have. We have just psychically bonded. She would feel everything. It would be torture for her. The timing is unfortunate with regard to the bonding. The maman's voice was measured. Do not test me on this, Odron. This is my will. If you do not comply, you know the penalty. Odron felt sick. You wouldn't. I would. I value you as I do all my males. But Skara is a mammal, the future of our people. Her safety and continuance must come first. Don't think for a second that I will not use every lever at my disposal. Her eyes were hard as she glared at him. Now what do you say? Odrin sank to one knee and bowed his head. He had no choice, no choice at all. As the goddess wills it. Very good, she crooned. I will make the arrangements shortly. Out of courtesy for Zira, I will let you tell her privately first. You have two hours. Odrin stumbled to his feet, feeling drunk. How could his life have taken such a sharp turn in so little time? Less than an hour ago, he had a mate that he adored and who loved him back. His fierce, beautiful mate. Now he would have to break her heart. When Odrin walked into the suite, Zira jumped up in shock. She had felt his pain, known something bad had happened. But when he appeared, he looked like the walking dead. Odrin, what has happened? Odrin couldn't look at her. He sank to the sofa, his head cradled in his hands. Are you injured? Tell me. Zira was frantic. I'm so sorry, my love, I... He couldn't find the words to tell her. Instead, he opened his mind to hers, allowing the memory of the conversation with the Mammon to flow through their shared bond. It lasted only seconds before he pulled back, but he felt her stab of pain, of disbelief, and the torrent of her rage. That bitch, how dare she! Zira stood, her fists clenching. I'll murder her myself, save everyone the pain. Zira, wait! He reached for her and she smacked his hands away, refusing to allow him to get close. What, Odron, what? Zira dashed furious tears away from her eyes. How could you just agree? What does she have over you? What did you do? I owe her a life debt. No more of that shit, Odron. Tell me now or I'm walking out and never coming back. He sighed and sank down again. When I was younger, I lived with Lucius and his brothers in the clan house. They were my family unit and I loved them. Lucius was a father, older brother and mentor. He had already made a name for himself as a warrior, as well as a name for himself as something of a rebel. Never enough to get really punished, but enough that they watched him. Too many males looked to him for leadership. He scrubbed his hand over his face. Lucius was seen at a meeting with anti-Mamon rebels. They wanted to reform our society and they were agitating. He hadn't done anything yet, just listened to their talk, but it was enough. I found out that they were going to make an example of Lucius. He was too troublesome, had become too noisy. It was just the excuse they were looking for. They were going to execute him as a rebel. Odrin looked at Zira, his eyes haunted. I bargained with the Maman with the only thing I had, my life. I would do whatever they wanted if they didn't kill Lucius. He was punished instead, whipped and put into reform training. I don't understand, Odrin. Aren't you bound to follow their orders anyway? It's not the same. We follow their orders, but there are balances. There are things they cannot order us to do, such as accept a mating. A life debt removes those barriers I must comply. What happens if you don't? Lucius and his brothers will be executed. The entire family unit will be deemed without honour and expunged from clan records. 
Anyone that defends me will also be killed. Zira was appalled. What the hell is wrong with your society? Can she even do that? Odrin nodded. She can, and no one will stop her. Our own clan brothers would do it, afraid that the dishonour would taint them as well. What can we do? Odran sighed. Nothing, Zira, I'm so sorry, but there is nothing we can do, no loophole. The life debt is simple and absolute. She commands I do or my family will die. Zira sank to the floor in shock in front of him. This isn't happening, it's not possible. He knelt down next to her. It is, Zira. I'm so sorry, but it is. Zira lurched away from him. Oh, goddess, the bond. I'll feel it. Feel everything. Feel you with another female. He reached for her and gathered her to him. I will do everything I can to block it. It's only for a few years. A few years? You expect me to do this for a few years? She snarled at him. Sit quietly like a good little female and wait for you. No, Zira, he said sadly. I had not hoped you would wait, only that our pain would finish in a few years. I don't know if I can bear it, Odrun. Feeling you with someone else, feeling your pain and hatred of it, it would tear me apart. Tears spilled down her cheeks. Please don't ask me to be helpless to protect the one I love. She gasped out her tears, drowning in her despair. And what if you don't hate it? What if you like it? I will have to sit there, feeling you slowly fall in love with someone else. Odrin could only sit there, slowly stroking her back, silent witness to her agony. I promise, my goddess, that I will never love anyone as I love you. And what if I mate someone else? she whispered. Then I will bear that pain as penance for the harm I have caused you. She doubled over, pressed her stomach with one hand, the anguish eating her up from inside, her tears dropping like rain. I don't think I can do this. He curled around her, supporting her. You are the strongest person I have ever met. I am so sorry, but I cannot allow Lucius and his family to die. She shuddered. I know. He kissed her gently, kissed her temples and eyelids, kissed the tears away. My warrior goddess, Dalat Rai, I am so unendingly sorry. They lay like that, curled on the floor for a long time, until Zira stirred. She felt like a zombie, like her limbs were not her own. She stiffly climbed to her feet, pushing him away. Please leave, Odran. Please don't send me away, Zira. Rage at me, hate me, let me bear punishment for your anger. He reached for her and flinched when she jerked away from him. She looked at him, fury and hurt and pain and fear churning in her eyes. I need some space to work out how to deal with this. I don't know how I feel. There's a monster inside, tearing me apart. She looked at her hands. I love you, Odra, never doubt that. I know this isn't your fault, but I need an outlet for my anger and I don't want it to be you. He sank back onto his knees. As the goddess wills it. Zira reached out for him, wrapping her arms around him, and as she did, she wrapped her mind around his. They shared their pain and their anger. I will come and find you once I've processed. I just need some time. He nodded, kissing her gently, and followed her order to leave. Zira did not know how long she sat in her room, wrapped in her pain. Eventually, her HUD alerted her that the Felotian delegation had arrived, and she was required to meet them. She dragged herself up, splashed some water on her splotched face, and walked through the vessel to the shuttle receiving bay. She didn't see the beautiful marble or the beautiful architecture. Instead, she saw what the Verit males had been warning her about. The coldness of the matriarchy, the unyielding will and cunning drive to achieve their aims. This vessel was a temple to their ambition. When she reached the shuttle bay, the Mammon and Skara were there before her. She couldn't even look at the females. She could sense the Mammon's satisfaction, and Skara's uncertain confusion, but she simply didn't have any emotional energy to give to them. When the Maman opened her mouth to talk to her, the look Zera sent her was scalding. For a single second, she let the Maman see the depth of her anger, her desire to stab the other female, that would enslave her own people, before she shuttered her eyes and looked down, studying the marble patterns. After that, the Maman and Skara kept to their own side of the room, silent, which suited Zira just fine. A gentle chime sounded, announcing guests arriving. The cadet had not told Zira who would arrive, only that it was a senior Felotian representative. Zira's mouth dropped when the cadet herself appeared in the entryway. After a split second, she realised she was incorrect. While this female looked like the cadet, there were some differences. The female before her was softer, 
lacked the cadet's military bearing, and her silver hair was longer than the cadet's, but the features and the red skin were identical. With her were a group of black-clad security operatives. Greetings, Videk. I am Stai Delegate Amira Lien. Thank you for meeting me. Greetings, Sadai. I have the details of your quarters here if you would follow me. Just a moment. The leader of the security team spoke. You two take point. She motioned to her team. Videk passed them the map. With a quick look at the Sadai for approval, Zira transferred the map to the other females. Walk with me, Videk. Zira fell in next to the Estai as they travelled the corridors. The Estai laughed when she saw the decor. Ah, Verit Maman, so predictable. They reached her quarters and waited for her security team to clear the rooms before they walked in. Thank you for greeting me, Videk. Now I have read the briefing pack sent by my sister. She saw Zira's expression. Yes, Kadek Moral Lien and I are twins. But for now I would like to hear what has transpired in your own words. I want your personal impressions. Beyond that written in the official reports, please sit. Yes, ma'am. Zira took a seat, arranging her thoughts. Have you eaten? I have not had my evening meal as yet. I'm happy to order some food for you, should you wish to join me. Zira's stomach threatened to turn inside out at the thought of food. No, thank you, ma'am. Then please excuse me while I eat. She turned to her head of security. Please join us for the briefing. The kiss can wait outside. Shock flashed through Zira at the mention of the kiss. The Dagger's Kiss was the most elite of Felosian security forces. They guarded the Lakar and all the senior planetary leaders, so she supposed it made sense that they would run security for the Alliance ambassador. Every female in the Felosian military wanted to join the Kiss. It was the pinnacle of success for their field. The Kiss were bodyguards, generals, assassins and negotiators. The head of security took off her black face covering and sat on the sofa next to the Stai and Zira saw the large scar crawling around her neck. She was the famous Dagger Edge, leader of the Kiss. The female was a legend, almost indestructible. Now, Zira, tell me what has occurred and how you managed to gain us an alien spaceship. Odrin rarely drank, but he desperately wished to now. His mind was reeling from everything that had happened over the past few days, and the hurt he had caused Zira was a wound soul deep. He felt like he was bleeding from a death blow he couldn't find, couldn't stem. What was worse, his mind constantly sought Zira's out. He was exhausted by constantly corralling his wayward thoughts. He couldn't give his Zira what she needed, but at least he could give her the space she had requested. As a result, he was in no mood to be summoned by the maman, and even less than to walk in to find Skara there. The maman curtly informed him that she had advised Skara of their upcoming mating, and that it would be appropriate for him to commence escorting Skara to official functions. Maman Zaluda will arrive shortly to represent the matriarch in these discussions. Odron, you will be there as Skara's future first male. She turned her flinty glare on Odron. Do not shame our clan in front of the matriarch's representative, or it will be the last thing you do. She turned her gaze on Skara, softening. You may have a few moments together now to discuss the situation before we must begin the official greetings. With a final icy glare at Odran, she turned and swept into her chambers, leaving him and his future maman bride in the receiving room. He looked at Skara and felt a reluctant empathy. She had just turned sixteen and by the norms of their people she was considered a young female. Ready to assume the duties of her clan, ready to mate, but to his eyes she was little more than a child. She was... fragile. Skara stood, ethereal and pale, a vision of verit perfection in her clouds of white hair and pale skin, icy blue robes accentuating the impression of a spun glass sculpture. She raised her head, clinging to her training and poise, and folded her hands to hide their trembling. As per custom, he waited silently for her to speak to him. After an awkwardly long moment, she flushed, belatedly realising that he could not open the dialogue. She turned to wander the receiving room, fingers absently trailing over the carven stone furniture and knick-knacks made of precious gems and shells, casting furtive glances at him, standing still and silent in the centre, awaiting her commands. He retreated into Delmalayat breathing, the bitterness of using the techniques his beloved had taught him to cope with the fear and anger of his mating filling his mouth. He would remain calm, he would not dishonour himself or the clan, and he would not selfishly sacrifice Lucius and his clan brothers for his own happiness. 
I am gratified that you have accepted the request to be my first mate, Odrande. I know you have never mated before. It will be easier on both of us that we are familiar with each other. He remained silent, staring straight forward. He had not been given permission to speak. You will make a good first mate. I will be proud to bear the young we create. We may even create a daughter on the first try. Her smile was bright and brittle, fear a flashing fin underneath the surface. The maman has chosen well for me. She looked at him expectantly, her smile slipping slightly at his continued stony expression. You may speak freely when we are alone, Odran. Thank you, maman la, he intoned politely. She flashed another smile. You may also call me Skara, when we are alone. He bowed his head slightly. As the goddess wills it, she frowned at him. You do not seem pleased, Odran. He didn't respond, and her frown deepened. Speak, Odran. He turned to look at her properly for the first time. You haven't asked me a question. Don't be obtuse, you know well what I am asking. He cocked his head, anger stirring. Dangerous to be angry with a maman, the dark stranger whispered. Control. I will not lie to you, Maman La. I suggest you not ask questions you do not want the answer to. Don't presume that you know my thoughts, Odran. I am young, not stupid. I asked you a question. Now answer. His temper snapped. No, I am not happy about our mating. He turned and paced the small room, venting some of his energy. Is that what you want to hear? You know that I was given no choice in the matter at all. I will follow your commands, Skara but I will not pretend that this is by my choice. She reeled back as if struck and he continued mercilessly. If you want pretty words and declarations of love, I have none for you. My heart lies elsewhere, as you well know. He met her eyes and she looked away ashamed. I will do my duty. I will not make this any harder than it must be. I can give you no more. Her own temper rose. Duty! You speak as if our time will be unpleasant. I have completed my training. I will make sure that we both enjoy ourselves, never fear that. She moved towards him and placed a delicate hand on his chest. He looked down at her, his eyes hot with anger, and made no move to touch her back. You know that I am bonded with Zira, yet you persist in this. Whatever I must do physically to perform, it will always be a duty. Do not attempt to deceive yourself into thinking anything else. She stumbled back, her eyes misting. Odron... Why are you speaking to me so cruelly? This is not you. He cocked his head at her. This is me, Skara. You do not know me. You know the polite facade that I present to patients and to the maman. You have never seen the real me. You will not speak to me so disrespectfully. She balled her small fists, her mouth an ugly twist, and Odrin felt a warning thrum. There it was, the raw fury of a maman, controlling, vicious and cruel. I am not being disrespectful. I am honest. I told you I wouldn't lie to you. Don't ask questions you don't want answers to. He shot back. She sighed. I am not your enemy, Odrin. How difficult this mating will be is up to you. Her shoulders slumped. Besides, you act as if I had a choice in the matter. We both dance to the Maman's song. I also have my duty. She stiffened, shoring up her courage. I will follow my orders, Odrin. See that you follow yours. Later that day... Odran attacked the sparring drone with a single-minded vengeance. He whipped around the mannequin, delivering devastating slashes with his knife, supplemented with kicks and punches that came straight from Delma Layat. Augmented with his Verit warrior training, it was a unique style all his own. The meeting with the matriarch's representative had been excruciating. He had been on display like a pony at a show. It had taken all his self-control not to rake the maman's face with his claws. As soon as he could escape... He had come to the gym to work out the rage before he hurt someone that didn't deserve it. But thus far, the workout was sharpening the edge of his temper, not helping. The fact that the nanite mannequin just reformed after each slash drove his fury higher, and he roared his anger to the ceiling. He wanted to rend, destroy. The dark stranger had never been so close to the surface before. In his anguish, he released his claws and tore into the training device with his talons and teeth, determined to work out his pain and frustration before he did something stupid, tasting blood as he threw himself again and again at the device. The pain of his wrenched claws a balm to his aching heart. Your new bride won't like it if you are a toothless male on your mating day, came a voice behind him. He didn't need to look. He had sensed her coming. 
He could find her anywhere. He snarled at Zira. He couldn't joke about their situation. He felt his gorge rise at the thought of touching another female. She tisked. Bad kitty, don't take your anger out on me when I came to talk. He snarled at her again. Who can I take it out on? I did this with my own stupidity. I agreed to a life debt. This is the consequence of my own decisions. I see. So your solution is to damage yourself? Maybe if you punish yourself enough, she won't want you anymore. Shut up, Zira. I can't do this just now. She narrowed her eyes at him. You get one free pass speaking to me like that. Do it again, and I'll knock you on your ass so hard you'll hear ringing in your ears for days. He cut a slashing glance at her and launched another stinging attack at the training dummy. He carved slice after slice off it, so fast his claws blurred and the nanites grew sluggish trying to reform quick enough to keep up with him. She frowned, considering him. This boil of pain needed to be lanced before they could talk. You know what, I think maybe you should try working this out with me. Go away, he continued slashing at the device. I gave you space, now I need you to give me some. I'll come find you when I've calmed down. She took off her jumpsuit jacket and dropped it on the ground. Her weapons followed. Next, she removed her combat boots and placed them next to the pile. She stretched her arms up, loosening her shoulders. Odran. He ignored her. Odran. He ignored her. Odran. What? Defend. She launched herself at him, delivering a vicious round house kick at his head that left him seeing stars. Come on, healer, show me what you can do. Next came a flurry of punches, delivering insulting, stinging slaps at his chest and head. You want to work out some stress, come on. I don't want to hurt you, Zira, she grinned fiercely. What makes you think I'll let you? He swiped at her half-heartedly with his claws, and she bent backwards elegantly avoiding his blow, before slapping his hands away. That was pathetic, I thought all you want to fight trained Fine. as a warrior. He grabbed for her, pulling her into an arm lock, determined to show the foolish female how much danger she had put herself in, tangling with him when his blood was up. Somehow she twisted around and ended up behind him. She leapt onto his back, wrapping her thighs around his neck and dove forward, using his own weight to flip him over. He landed with an oof on the floor, all the wind pushed from his lungs. She bounded up, grinning from ear to ear and dancing on the balls of her feet. Come on, Kitty, let's play. He clambered to his feet, his fury moving into something darker, hotter. Oh, you will regret that, he purred. She laughed, unafraid. Make me, you're all talk. The game was on. They danced back and forth, trading blows and taunts. It was glorious, and for a few brief minutes, Odrun forgot everything else. There was only this female, this incredible female that the goddess had blessed him to know, who was his perfect match in every way. She put up with none of his shit, met the world face on and fearless with an infection's joy. She wasn't afraid of him, or his darker, rougher edges. She accepted him completely. It made him want to scream at the unfairness of it all, that the goddess would taunt him with this vision of perfection, of a vibrant life exploring the world with Zera, only to rip it away from him. No matter how many times he tried to convince himself that it was only a delay, only a few years, he couldn't fool himself. Even he wasn't buying what he was selling. His Zera was proud, his Dalat Rai, a goddess in her own right. She would never simply sit waiting for another female to be done with him, nor would he ask her to. She was glorious, incandescent. He couldn't expect that her vibrance would go unnoticed. Many males would wish to bathe in her light. Perhaps that was a fitting punishment, for the pain that she would endure sensing his relationship with another female. He would have to sense her falling in love with another male. It was only fair, and the goddess had a finely tuned sense of justice indeed. He missed his next move, his maudlin thoughts consuming him and distracting him, and she landed a punishing blow to his face, splitting his lip open. Odran, you idiot! What were you thinking? She rushed over to him, gripping his chin, turning his face this way and that to see the damage. You aren't meant to actually get hurt. This is just to blow off some steam. He allowed himself to wallow in her touch for a long moment, before reaching up to grasp her hands. My Zira, my love, I can't do this with you. I love you with everything I am. I can't play with you like this. It hurts too much to see what we could have. Her tawny yellow eyes glistened, filling with tears that she blinked away, stubbornly refusing to let them fall. She didn't try to pretend that she didn't understand. I... I know, I wanted to give you this time, a last moment before we say goodbye. 
a good memory to take with you. She pressed a gentle kiss on his cheekbone. I won't dishonour you or your vow. I will keep my distance, but I couldn't stand to see you suffer. He nodded and pressed a kiss to her fingertips before taking a deliberate step back. He bowed to her, his heart in his eyes, and turned to walk slowly away. Zira stood there watching him as he exited the hall, her heart breaking inside her. She stayed in the gym, sitting on the mats. Her mind was deliberately blank. She refused to think, to feel. It took a long time before she realised she wasn't alone. She looked up as the person held out a hand to her, shocked to see the dagger edge standing there. Come, sister, let's get a drink. It's too early. It's midnight somewhere, besides, who gives a shit? She took the offered hand and was hauled to her feet. She followed obediently, her emotions scoured out for now. They ended up in the mess hall. It turned out that they didn't have Luzi, the Falosian standard alcoholic drink, but they had a verit wine made from cave berries. It was served bitingly cold and was surprisingly sweet. They didn't talk again until they were seated in a small booth. Is it the male, Odrin? Zira nodded. He is certainly handsome enough. I saw you sparring with him. He's got some moves. Zira laughed wetly. That he does. There was a long pause. I heard what happened. The whole ship is buzzing with it. Apparently calling in a life debt is a big deal. Their baby maman couldn't stop gossiping. Zira cursed. Great, that's all I need. My sex life is public news. You'll be on the cover of Interstellar Titbits next. Zira snorted. Are you going to go back to the colony? Zira eyed her. Why do you care? This is kind of you, but you don't even know me. The dagger edge shrugged. I hate to see a sister turn herself inside out over a male, and I hate a waste of talent. Zira looked at her inquiringly. I've had my eye on you for a while, Videk. Expert martial artist, outstanding service record. You've got quite the moves yourself. You took down that male without even breaking a sweat. Zira remained silent, not sure where this was going. It might be selfish, but it seems to me that this situation presents an opportunity. You could return to that backwater colony, spend the next few years watching the male you've bonded with wait on another female. Or you could consider joining the Dagger Kiss. Zira's jaw dropped. The Dagger Kiss was the elite unit. They performed security services for the Lakar and her most senior advisors, the Stai. Soldiers trained for years hoping for an invitation. Why me? There are lots of officers like me out there. Maybe, but there aren't any others that have successfully bonded with an alien AI. I can't discount the advantage that will bring with you. Aside from your own natural skills, which are not common despite what you may think, it is a significant benefit. Zira sipped the wine, considering. When do you need an answer? There is no rush. Just mull it over for a bit. The offer is there when you want it. Zira squinted at the dagger edge, the wine fuzzing her slightly. I do have one question. Yes? What is your name? Surely your team don't call you the Dagger Edge each time they want something like, Hey, Dagger's Edge, can I borrow your shampoo? The other female laughed in surprise and cast Zira an appreciative glance. My name is Lila. For what it's worth, I think you'll fit in just right with us. You'll be surprised how much you'll enjoy it. You know, this isn't even my first job offer this week. Must be something in the air. Lila raised an eyebrow and Zira pulled herself up in mock pride. I'll have you know the leader of a team of mercenaries thought I was highly skilled. Lila snorted a laugh. Oh dear, that is an attractive offer. How will I ever compete? She fluttered her eyelashes and they cackled laughing. She patted Zira's hand. Let's talk about something else. I'd love to hear how you got into teaching Delma Layat. Zira smiled at her, grateful for the distraction. Perhaps it was exactly what she needed right now. Well, you see, my mother taught my sisters and I... Chapter 15. Intergal 1. Zira had the feeling that the universe was moving around her, that this moment was momentous. At the small table in the back dining room of the Galatean Vegetarian Restaurant on an intergalactic trading post, they discussed secession against the Alliance. This is insane, declared Amira. The Stai Amira and Mamon Zalude sat at either end of the table, their advisers arrayed around them. This is madness, the Stai hissed. Even with the dampeners, she whispered, as if afraid of being overhead. You jump at shadows and speak of treason. Perhaps, responded Zaluda placidly. Yet the situation remains the same. Our new colony is under attack. 
They have attempted to cut off its supply lines, deployed saboteurs that have harmed our people and landed troops. Ah yes, the conveniently mysterious they. We don't deny that someone is attacking our colony. It may even be Svoboda, as Maman Frey and my sister suggest. But that is a significant step away from an outright alliance conspiracy against us, and a long step away from secession from the alliance. No colony has successfully seceded in centuries. I, and the Lakar, believe that we are stronger together. We would be together, Felosia, Verit and Colony 29. We would be an alliance of our own. We have the military strength, you have the scientific and financial backing. We would be formidable. We would be targets. It would be open season on us all. And you have not addressed my initial point. You have no proof, only shadows and suspicions. Zalude cocked her head, examining her opponent and potential ally. All right, you agree that someone is targeting the colony. Amira nodded once. And you have noted the testimony from your own sister, Kadek Morale, as well as the interrogation of the security force found on site, that Svoboda is behind it. Amira nodded again. I note their testimony and evidence. We concede that unknown Svobodans are likely attempting to disrupt the founding of our new colony. What more do you need? Amira was succinct. Proof. We need to know if this is a splinter group. Fascists from Svoboda determine not to allow another matriarchal society to form, or if the Svobodan government supports them. Very well. Assuming we can deliver such proof, what else? Amira snorted in derision. Assuming you can deliver. To play out your fantasy, we would also need proof that Svoboda is poised to take over the Alliance, and somehow cause us detriment. Maman Frey's voice was dry. When they kill you in your beds, will that suffice? Perhaps when your daughters are raped and murdered or enslaved, what about then? Frey, Zaluda was gently chiding. She turned back to Amira. Surely you can't believe that Svoboda in charge of the Alliance would be good for us? Amira rolled her eyes. Of course not, but there is a significant jump between different philosophies and beliefs and enslaving and murdering a population, and you assume that the other Alliance members would just stand by and let it happen. And in this lovely fantasy land, will we all have tea later? Perhaps cakes? Maman Frey's voice was caustic, and Zira forced herself to remain expressionless against the urge to smile. Amira turned her glare on Frey. Do not bait at me, Frey. Your own extremist views are well known. I will not be goaded into precipitous action by your dramatics. Frey looked like she had been slapped. What do you propose, Amira? Zalude asked. Information. We desperately need intel to plan our next step. An operation such as the one you are describing will be widespread. It will involve many people. Felosians are excellent at espionage. We will track down the root of this action against us. I will assign the dagger kiss to this endeavour. It will be their priority mission. And then? What if your daggers find out the Svoboda is poised to take over? What if there is some plot? What if, what if, what ifs? They are endless. We will deal with the situation at the time. Zaluda leaned in, intent. The matriarch has instructed that I am not to leave here without your answer. Will you join with us if there is a conspiracy? The Stai paused, then straightened, her eyes hard. If there is a conspiracy, if any male thinks to pull us down... We will do whatever is necessary to protect ourselves, our people and our way of life. We will stand with our Verit allies if need be. She turned to Frey. But that is not to be taken as carte blanche to drag us towards a crusade of your own design. She looked back at Zalude. Zalude held her eyes for a long moment before nodding once. It is agreed. Your daggers will locate the truth of this matter and we will meet again to determine our next steps. If they plot against us, we will join in the fight. Later that night, Lila slipped into the booth opposite Zira, her dark purple curls escaping from her tight braid. I received our next mission briefing this morning. We are leaving tomorrow. Zira smiled at her vaguely. She had been expecting this conversation. They were all packed up and ready to board the Verit ship back to the colony. She had snuck out for a final trip to the markets before heading back to the colony, but not even a trip to the perfumer had lifted her spirits. She had settled for drinking in a little alley bar. Have you had any more thoughts on my offer? Zira blew out a breath and dabbed her sweat-damped palms. Between the dagger's offer and Odrin, her mind felt like it was occupied by miniature tornadoes. Thank you so much, I really mean it. But I'm not ready to just walk away, I love him. Even if I can't be with him, 
I'm prepared to wait. I'm going back to the colony and I'll give it some time. Lila nodded as if she had expected nothing less. You can change your mind any time. The offer is open-ended. Her eyes were full of sympathy. Zira stood and hugged the other female impulsively. Thank you, Lila. I will call you whatever happens and let you know. She sniffed slightly. You could come to the colony for a visit. Lila let out a startled laugh. Videk, I might be a soldier, but I do not rough it when I travel. Backwater rustic colonies are very low on my priority list, she softened. But I look forward to your call. Chapter 16 Unexpected Help The return trip to the newly named colony was the calm before the storm. Zira stayed in her quarters, only venturing out when she had to get food. She took to checking her HUD wherever she went, to make sure that Odrin and Skara were not present. She simply couldn't bear seeing them together, and had no desire to hurt Odrin further by forcing him to witness her pain. For his part, he kept his side of their bond clamped down as tight as he could. The odd emotion leaked out, but mostly it was still and silent. It was strange. They had only been bonded for a few days, but she had become so used to feeling him with her, to reaching out and sharing an anecdote or joke, or simply a reassuring touch to assure herself he was still there. Arriving back on the colony was another matter entirely. She knew there was no way she could avoid them on such a small planet, and most people had detected their fledgling relationship before they left. Her Philosian sisters would take only a single look to understand what was happening, and Zira suspected the Maman had grossly underestimated how angry the Philosians would be over the situation. Perhaps she could move to Casti to avoid them. As soon as they had come within range of the planet, Casti reached out to her telepathically. Zira! You have returned. Its voice was joyful, trumpeting in her mind. Of course. Did you think I would not? She asked, surprised. I am unused to your species. I was uncertain how you mark absences in time. Zira sighed internally. At least someone wanted to be near her. No, she chastised herself. That was unfair. She knew why Odrin was doing what he was, and she agreed. It just hurt. I'm looking forward to learning more about you. We may need to defend this planet together soon, we need to learn how to work together. Zira grabbed her bag as she spoke to Casti. Casti paused long enough that she straightened, waiting for its response. I am not equipped for military action, Zira. I have basic defensive capabilities only. I am Casti, not Arya. Zira's interest sharpened. Arya, that's a military vessel. Yes, Arya is the name for military vessels. Zira got the sense that Casti was uncomfortable discussing the matter. Only a few were made. They were difficult to bond with. The operators found it emotionally distressing. We grew beyond Aria long before we left this universe. As Zira telepathed Casti, she headed for the shuttle exit. When she reached the airlock, she found Odran and Skara there before her waiting to disembark. She couldn't even look at them. She could sense Skara sending her furtive, anxious glances, but she refused to look at the Mamon La. She had no emotional energy left for the female. The maman leaned heavily on her cane as she shuffled down the ramp into the pale sunlight, Odrin and Skara trailing her. Her own mate, Prime Brune and Lucius, waited to greet her. Welcome home, maman, how did it go? Lucius inquired with a bow. Well, first warrior, we have reached many decisions. I will share them all when we next meet in council. For now I wish to return to my quarters, shower and rest in my own bed. The Prime smiled down at his wife, his concern for her frailty lurking behind his eyes, and offered her his arm. Skara, attend me, she called. The young Mamon La cast a bright smile at Odran and trotted obediently after her mentor. For the first time in days, Zira stood with Odran alone. She couldn't look at him, could barely breathe. She felt like she was held together by the thinnest threads. One wrong move and she would spill out in every direction, blow away in the wind. Lucius embraced Odran, overjoyed at his return. Odie, welcome back, and you, Zira. He offered his forearm in greeting in the manner of warriors. I can't wait to hear all about your trip. Come and join Denny and I for a meal tonight. She would love to see you both. Odrin's jaw tightened, a vein pulsing in his temple. He dredged up the ghost of a smile and spoke to Lucius, still not looking at her. Apologies, Luke. I have other matters I need to deal with. He turned on his heel and strode off, leaving a stunned Lucius staring after him. Luke turned to her, eyes wide in surprise. Is there something I need to know? She shrugged. You need to ask Odrin. He scowled at her. Nice try, Zira. You should know me better than that. Tell me what's going on. 
She remained silent, unwilling to get involved, and Lucia softened. Please, Zira, I care about him. I just want to know if he needs help. Looking into Lucia's beseeching eyes, she couldn't remain aloof. She reached out to Odrin through their bond. You absolute fucking bastard! How dare you leave me to do this! His reply was instant, contrite, and full of self-loathing. I'm sorry, my Dalit. I, I can't bear to have him disappointed in me. I know I'm a coward. But I can't tell him. I just can't. She took a deep breath and turned back to Luke, still standing, awaiting her reply. I... She trailed off. She did not know how to say it. Odron. The Maman has decreed that Odran and Skara will mate. He will be her first male. They will mate after Skara completes her Maman ceremony in three days' time. Lucius's jaw dropped, and for a split second Zira saw the anguish in him, before he shuttered his expression. I'm sorry, Zira. I thought before you left that you and he had an understanding. He looked so sorrowful and awkward that she couldn't look at him. She turned away, blinking back tears. We did. The maman has ordered him and he complies. There is no other option. Lucius growled. There is always an option. The maman may control our lives, but we are not slaves, not in this. Lucius almost spat his words, his claws extending, looking for something to rend in his rage. Why would he agree to this? Why? Zira couldn't meet his eyes. She almost whispered her answer. Because he owes her a life debt. The words fell like lead between them. Say that again, he growled. He has a life debt. Didn't you hear me, first warrior? The male I love has a life debt. If he doesn't do this, your life, Dinara's life, your brother's lives, they are all forfeit. She glared at Lucius. He does this for you, she screamed at him. He does this for you. Lucius held his hand over his chest like she had stabbed him as she continued, jabbing at him with her words. I hate you. I hate your fucking culture, your manipulative bitches of the matriarchy, all of it. I wish I had never come here, never met you. Lucius reached for her, gathered her into a bear hug while she struggled against him, uncaring of who saw, battering her fists against his chest. It's all right, Zira, I'll make this all right. I'm sorry, shh, it'll be all right, Lucius crooned, letting her cry against his barrel chest. Before long she felt another presence, Danara stroking her hair. When she looked up, wrung dry from her tears, Danara stood next to her, her small arms encircling Zira and Lucius while she hummed gently. Danara wove a gentle spell of healing over her, wrapping her in strands of empathy and care. It's all right, Zira. Come on, come with us. You need to rest. We'll sort this out later. Danara held out her hand and took Zira's, and Zira walked behind her like a child, uncaring or unseeing. Zira allowed herself to be taken wherever Danara wished, and put into bed, drinking the large glass of Lucy Danara left for her before falling into a dreamless sleep. At some point she heard Lucius arguing, but she rolled over, unable to face whatever drama was now rolling in. She was absolutely spent. She had nothing left emotionally. The next morning Danara came into her room, bringing her a tray with a bowl of fruit, toast and a caffeine drink. Come on, time to get up. Eat something while we talk. Zira dragged herself up, noting that she was in a small room off the medical bay wearing a medical gown. Why am I in med bay? Because you were pretty out of it, and I was on night shift last night and wanted to keep an eye on you. Zira nodded, accepting the tray and starting on the sliced fruit. Want to talk about it? Not really. Okay. Zira eyed Danara suspiciously. In the month on the colony, Danara had become her closest friend, and she never gave up without a fight. Just okay? she asked. Danara's eyes crinkled in response. Just okay, you've clearly been through a rough time. I won't add to it, but I'm here if you want to talk. Zira nodded, picking up her toast. Did I hear shouting last night? Danara laughed. Yeah, Lucius had a little chat with the maman. It didn't go well. Zira paused mid-bite and raised an eyebrow expectantly. He couldn't get the decision overturned. I'm sorry, Zira. The tiny bubble of hope that had started to rise burst in her chest. It's all right, it's Odran's choice. I understand it, even if I don't like it. The males are furious, as are the Philosians. This hasn't won the Maman or Skara any favours. It's blackmail, coercion and slavery, however you look at it. Zira's composure broke. I don't know how to do this, Denny, she whispered. I love him. I can't watch him be with another female. Can't feel him be with another female. It'll destroy me. Then stop it. I can't, cried Zira. How do you know? Have you even tried? Danara shot back. You think it's that easy? 
This is their whole damn culture. Your life, Lucius and his brother's lives, they are all on the line. I didn't say it would be easy, Zera. But can you live with yourself if you don't try? Zera glared at Denny, then slumped, deflated. I don't know what to do. I've racked my brains, but I just don't know. And I don't know if I can stay. Where would you go? Zera pulled herself together, scrubbing her face. The dagger kiss offered me a position. The offer is open-ended. Dinara reached over and gripped her hands. Well, if you can't stop it and you can't watch it, maybe you should take the offer. Don't destroy yourself and your life like this. You have so much to offer. Zira nodded. I won't, but I need to see for myself that he is happy with her. And there's Casti. I want to work with it. Learn everything I can. And if he isn't happy, if he is miserable and misses you every day, and there is nothing either of you can do about it, if he breaks his vow because he can't bear being without you and causes the deaths of those he loves, how will that feel? Zira shook her head, trying not to hear her. Dinara continued implacably. And what if he is happy? Plenty of arranged marriages turn into love. What if you sit here alone on this backwater colony, watching him, feeling him love another female? No other species can understand the pain that an empath feels, watching those we love, feeling those we love, not love us back. Love another. Will you reject all other opportunities for happiness, pining for a male that has chosen another? Zira could feel the pity pouring off of the other woman. It burned like acid. At this stage, I think nothing can stop this. The Maman have complete authority over matings, their own and everyone else's. Dinara stilled. Say that again. Zira's brow furrowed. What? Say that again. I... I said that the Maman have complete authority. Zira stammered, confused, and Dinara corrected her. No. You said that the Maman have complete authority over their own matings. Well, yes, but I don't see how that helps. Skara is Maman La, not a full Maman. Not yet, replied Dinara. Zira pondered, turning it over in her mind, trying to see what Dinara had when it clicked. She grinned and lunged over the tray to engulf the healer in a fierce hug. Dinara laughed, hugging her back. Whatever you are thinking, Zira, be careful. This is done, announced. It won't be easy taking this back. Not everyone will come out of this clean. Zira's eyes glowed citrine in the light as she worked out the plan in her mind, and Dinara tapped her on her nose to break her train of thought. Whatever you do, don't hurt that child. She is as much a victim as he is. We'll see. Zira stood and began pulling on her clothes. As she did, she spoke to Dinara over her shoulder. You know, he calls me Dalat Rai, his warrior goddess. She's the Verit goddess of passion, justice and vengeance. Let's see how justice feels. Skara stiffened when she saw Zira walking towards her. I have nothing to say to you. Skara was standing in the doorway of her unit, looking extremely uncomfortable. Don't worry, I'm not here to berate you. I'm sure you are doing enough of it yourself. Zira tried her hardest to convey quiet patience. Please leave. I need to talk to you just for a moment. I have a question. Skara looked around, as if expecting someone else to appear to assist her before she sighed heavily. Fine. Five minutes. No more. Zira walked into the small unit, identical to her own. She sat at the small table, then immediately stood up. She had too much energy to sit just now. Skara arranged herself elegantly on the other chair, her silk skirts floating around her. Zira looked at her silently for a long moment. Do you really want to do this? Skara hissed and shot up. Go away now. No, wait. Answer my question, please. Is this what you want truly? Skara folded her arms. I will do my duty. Answer. The question. You are destroying my life and his. If this is what you want, he will submit. He has no choice. His family's life is forfeit. You will have to live with forcing him into a mating that he doesn't want. Skara was shocked. I will treat him well. He will not be harmed. How dare you suggest he will suffer in my care? It is against the Alliance Declaration of Sentient Rights to force anyone into a mating. There is no force. He does this of his own free will, she shot back hotly. On pain of murder, of Dinara, Lucius and his brothers, sounds like coercion to me. Skara stood. Your time is up. I want you to leave, now. Zira backed up, giving Skara space. I ask you again, is this what you want? Or are you doing it because you were told to like a good little maman? Despite her best intention to talk to Skara calmly, she couldn't keep the bitterness out of her voice. Leave, now! Skara's voice was shrill. Or I will call security! I will when you tell me the truth. 
No, damn you, no. Is that what you want to hear? No, I don't want to be mated to a male double my age. Don't want to be a maman with males' lives in my hands. I hate it, she screamed. I have as little choice as Odran does. At least he is kind and gentle as far as our males go. I know him a little. He's not a stranger. He is the best choice I have. Why do you have to make a choice? Why can't you just say no? It is tradition. I must obey the maman. I thought you were a maman. Or you will be tomorrow. I thought maman chose their own mates, that no one told a maman what to do or where to go. Skara was furious, the tears spilling over her cheeks. I am a maman. No one tells me what to do. Then release him. Make your own decisions. Get out, now. Zira bowed mockingly. As the goddess wills, maman. She heard Skara scream as she left, whether in rage or anger she was unsure. She stepped outside, moving around the back of the accommodation units. When she was hidden from view, she shuddered, dropping to her knees. She took deep, gulping breaths as the tears fell. Whatever happened now, she had done all she could. It was up to Skara whether she was strong enough to make a different choice and free them all. That night she went to Casti. All it took was a thought. Casti, can you send a shuttle for me, please? Certainly, however my teleport capabilities have regenerated. If you wish to travel just yourself, I can teleport you. Zira's heart squeezed at the thought, excitement warring with sadness that Odrun was not with her to experience this marvel. Yes, please, I'd like to be teleported. The world swam around her, and she was standing in the control room on Casti. That was incredible. I thought there would be disorientation or movement, but it was so smooth. Of course, my purpose is your comfort. It went quiet. I can sense you are distressed. What can I do to ease you? Zira shrugged. I don't think you can, Casti. Some things can't be eased. I understand. Casti's voice was incredibly gentle. I feel the loss of my previous locus. I cared for the locus for nearly 300 years. Casti are bioengineered, we feel. The loss is... difficult to process. Zira felt her heart go out to Casti. It was so alien, but some things like love and family were universal. I'm sorry for your loss, Casti. Thank you, Zira. Zira moved aimlessly through the ship after that, wandering wherever she wished. There were many chambers, most of which she didn't recognise the function of. Eventually, her fatigue caught up with her. One night of sleep was not enough to fix the days of stress and emotional exhaustion, so she found herself back in the rooms that Casti had created for her. It still resembled Odran's childhood bedroom, which paradoxically both hurt and made her feel close to him. She moved to the viewing window, looking down at the underground lake below. Could I go down and swim if I wished? Not in this chamber. I do have swimming areas, but they are several levels down. I can create you a bath if you wish. Zira brightened. That would be wonderful. I haven't had a proper bath in months. Casti binged gently, and she turned around to see the large carven depression in the rock floor filled with water. It was deep, coming past her waist, and big enough for ten people. She shucked out of her clothes and slipped into the warm water with a sigh. She floated on her back, letting her hair fan out around her, as she contemplated the conversation with Skara. She honestly wasn't sure if she had helped or hindered the situation. All she knew was that if she hadn't tried, she would have regretted it for the rest of her life. When it came time for the mating, Zira stood at the back of the assembled colonists, near the edge of the courtyard. The colonists had been shocked by the marriage announcement, but had done their best to make the area festive. Native flowers and garlands of green and purple leaves had been used to decorate the courtyard. They had dragged chairs and tables from the mess hall out to form a semicircle around a central fire where the actual ceremony would take place. The males had built a square, stacked bonfire, and little pots and baskets of herbs were laid on a table next to it, ready to be thrown in. The sun was setting. Everything was ready. All they were waiting for was the maman. Over the past two days, Zira's hopes had gradually dropped. As word spread in the colony, a strange, wary silence had fallen. The Felotians were appalled at the turn of events, and their collective emotions had harmonised to the point that even the Verit colonists could feel their displeasure. When Felotians agreed on something, it was palpable. For the males, they were horrified. Zira could feel their hope dwindling. The fledgling excitement that this colony presented an opportunity for a new way of life, slowly being crushed under the reality 
that another of their brothers was forced into a mating he did not want. The knowledge of Zira and Audrin's relationship and bond only made it worse. It was quite literally a nightmare come alive for them, to find a female that they adored enough to want to bond with, only to have it snatched away by a machination of the maman. Skara had barely been seen. Whenever she had entered a room, the atmosphere was icy. The males were formally polite, but Zira had never heard yes maman sound so much like fuck you before. Zira had poured everything she had into blocking the bond with Odrin. He was doing the same to protect her. His emotions were there, just out of reach, and as she watched him standing next to the fire, Lucius at his side, grim as death, she held herself in iron control to prevent her from reaching out and connecting, even for a second, just to make sure he was okay. She was terrified that if she sensed distress from him, she would kill everyone that stood in her path to take him away from here. He had made his wishes clear. He wouldn't go. He would not sacrifice his family for their love. In the clear light of day, Zira was honest enough with herself that she would never let him sacrifice them either. If she was the type of female that would ask him to do that, she wouldn't be worthy of him in the first place. Right now, though, as the sun set and the fire was lit, that clear-sighted female was very far away. She felt a hand slip into hers and turned to see Dinara standing with her. I'm glad you came back, sister. We were worried about you. I went to stay on Casti. I needed to be away from it. I couldn't see them plan all this. Dinara nodded. I have you, sister. Just hold on. Zira gripped the offered hand tightly and blinked back tears. Should you be here? Why torture yourself? Zira shook her head. She could not leave. I bear witness. Dinara said nothing else, just wrapped her other arm around her and held on tight. Skara, the Maman and Bailel appeared out of the darkness, clad head to toe in silver. They wore dark grey coats with elaborate curled collars that framed their faces, falling to the floor in heavily embroidered layers. Over their coats they wore silver filigree chainmail that conformed to their bodies. The Mamon and Skara both wore heavy diadems in silver metals, studded with blue and white gems. Skara's white hair was woven in and around hers, with threads of pale pink and white pearls woven throughout. It dawned on Zera that she had rarely seen the Mamon without some sort of headdress, and that they must have a cultural or rank signifier for Mamon. Skara was now a first-level Mamon, no longer a trainee La, and therefore able to wear a crown. Maman Frey leaned heavily on a silver-tipped cane as she walked, but her expression remained imperious as ever. Zira controlled her own expression, clamped down on her emotions against a surge of jealousy. Skara was lovely, like the first breath of air on a winter morning. She glowed with health and happiness. Zira could never hope to compete. She was a solider and happy with herself. But what male wouldn't want this stunning female over her? Odrin whipped around to look at her, and she realised that she hadn't been as successful as she had thought in blocking her emotion. He must have caught her surge of jealousy. Deliberately, she nodded her head ever so slightly towards the approaching maman. He held her gaze for a single agonising instant, his heart in his eyes before he opened the bond to her. She gasped as she was swamped in his emotions. His anger at the situation, despair at what he would face, guilt for her pain a thread of hurt that she would think so little of him that he would wish for Skara over her. But over it all, love. A roaring, vicious tsunami of love and want and need that threatened to drive her to her knees. It wrapped around her in chains, tiny hooks embedding itself in her psyche so deep, she knew that his love would be with her through all the years of her life. She would never be able to rip it out, never doubt how he felt. Only Dinara's supporting arm kept her upright, as he gave her a single, piercing last glance before turning to the maman, his expression shuttered and cold. Skara's steps faltered when she saw him, and when she saw Lucius, his expression like stone. She approached and stood next to Odran before the fire, her gaze roving over the assembled colonists. There was no love there, no support. Their disbelief and anger was a taste in the air. Maman Frey moved to stand between them, raising hands wrapped in gold cords to the fire. We stand before the goddess to witness the bonding of Mamon Skara and Odrande. Skara has chosen Odran as her first mate. He has the honour and joy of protecting and supporting his living goddess through her first steps as an adult Mamon, and offering his seed so that the future of Verit may continue. The Mamon held out a hand to Odran, 
who placed his in hers without comment. He might have been made out of living marble. He gave away so little emotion. If not for Zera's connection with him, she would have thought him entirely unaffected by the ceremony, an aloof winter prince marrying his princess. The maman wrapped Odran's wrists and hand in the cord over and over until the cord covered his hand and arm like a shimmering gauntlet. She held the tail out to Skara. Maman Skara, this male offers himself for your pleasure. Do you find him fit and worthy? Do you accept him as your first mate? The world seemed to hold its breath. Skara cast a furtive glance around the assembled colonists before landing on Odran. He smiled at her gently, understandingly, willing to sacrifice himself to her will to save those he loved. She stiffened and raised her chin, looking every inch the arrogant ice princess. No, maman. Frey spun around, nearly falling in her haste. What are you doing? Skara looked at her mentor. No, maman. I do not find him fit or worthy. He is unsuitable as my first mate. Deliberately, Skara dropped the cord and turned her back on him. Skara! she hissed. This cannot be taken back. Think about this. Skara glared at Frey. I have thought about this. I shall select another in due course, as is my right as a maman. She turned to the colonists. Thank you for this lovely evening. Let's not let it go to waste. Please enjoy the celebration. She looked into the darkness. Talaksa, I request your escort for the evening. She held out a delicate hand. There was a long pause as Tarlac stood in shock before Peyton elbowed him ungracefully. Tarlac nearly tripped over his own feet, coming to stand next to her. He bowed low. As the goddess wills, my lady. Odrin hadn't moved. He stood there silent and in shock as the world moved around him. Luke turned to him. Come on, Odie. I think you need to sit down. He grabbed Odrin's arm and pulled him to the side, where Odrin thumped down into one of the chairs, shaking. Slowly he looked up and their eyes locked. The bond opened in a rush and his emotions swamped her. Confusion, love, fear, pain, it swirled in and around him and threw the bond to her. Zira unfroze to run to him. She skidded to a stop in front of him, reaching her hands out to grip his face. My love, are you all right? Zira, he whispered numbly. Zira, he whooped and stood, grabbing her and swinging her around in a high circle. Zira, my Dalat. He hugged her to him, and she felt his desperation, the incipient panic, the aftermath of the adrenaline leaving him hollow and shaking. It's all right, Odrin, I'm here, I'm here. She cooed as she stroked his hair away from his face, so that she could pepper kisses all over it, desperate to get as close to him as possible. I'm here, I'm not going anywhere, I'm here, I'm here. You stupid bitch, this is your doing, Frey spat at Zira. His blood roared in his ears as Odrin pulled Zira behind him, hiding her bodily from the furious maman. A part of him noticed Zira did not want to be hidden and was squirming away from him to face the maman. Zira was furious, angrier than he had ever seen her. Have a care, Frey. I am not one of your baby maman that you can order about and I have no problem putting you on your ass to teach you a lesson. The maman snarled at Zira. You stupid bitch, you've ruined his life. Once a maman declares a male unfit, no other maman will take him ever. It cannot be undone. Years of effort in his training just to throw it away. Zira stared at her incredulously. You can't be that stupid. Do you honestly think he wants another maman? We are bonded. He is my mate. It's done, and it's got nothing to do with you. He owes me a life debt. He will pay it one way or the other. My debt is repaid. It is done when I say it is done. And you did. Your words were specific. You will offer yourself for Skara's pleasure to be her first mate. I did, and Skara did not want me. My debt is fulfilled. The maman snarled at him, her face twisted with rage. I am maman. My word is law. Your life is mine to use as I see fit. The male is correct. Out of the shadows moved Skara. He has met the terms of the bargain to the letter. Maman Frey released her claws, hissing as she turned to Skara. I took you into my home, trained you, and this is how you repay me. You haven't even been a maman for a full day and you think to defy me. Skara flushed with anger and a little fear. You taught me well, maman. I am strong and I will do what I think is best. That does not include binding a male to me that is already bound to another. I will not allow our people to continue with this slavery under the guise of respect. I will find a new way, my own way. I will not become another you. Frey looked as if she had been struck. Skara looked over her shoulder and Bailel appeared to stand by her. 
The Philosians have shown us much over the past months. Be honest, Maman. Look at Lucius and Dinara. Can you honestly say that you don't want that? That you would not wish for a male to adore you that much? That you need never fear for your safety? The Maman shook her head, her face drained of colour. What have I done bringing you here? My daughters, they have poisoned you. They have opened our eyes, Bilel corrected. You will destroy us, our people and our way of life. Skara sighed, her face compassionate. We're already dying, Maman. That's why this colony exists. We need to evolve to survive, not cling to the past. It is time to move beyond our fear of what we were. You are an idiot. You do not know what you are doing. Skara raised a delicate hand and Bilel captured it. We will see, Maman. We hope you will stay with us on the journey. The Maman screamed her rage and clutched at her chest, doubling over in pain. Immediately her mate was there to support her. My lady, you must rest. I'll rest when I'm dead, she spat. If you don't rest, you will get your wish soon enough, responded Danara, emerging from the crowd. Come, Maman, return to Medbay with me. No, get off of me, witch. I want no more of your incompetent poking and prodding. Maman, I will give you a trade. Zira stepped forward, her body full of tension. In exchange for the grievous insult you think I have inflicted on you and your people, I offer you a trade. She clenched her fists, willing her heart to stop racing. She had a crazy, wild idea. If it worked, the maman sneered at her. What could you possibly have that I want? To live, Zira replied simply. Casti has advanced medical facilities. If you set this aside now, I will ask Casti to heal you. Everyone around them stilled. Zira, what are you doing? Odrin whispered in her mind. You don't even know if Casti can heal her. I'm gambling, she replied. Casti, can you do this? I believe so, Zira. Bring her on board so that I can do a detailed scan. Casti says it wants us to bring you on board to do a detailed scan. It believes you can be healed. The maman leaned heavily on her mate's arm. Even in pain and haggard, she was formidable, her icy gaze examining Zira's face, looking for any indication of treachery. Zira felt her own ire rising. Even when offering an olive branch, this female couldn't help fighting. Her temper snapped. You have this one chance, Maman, an opportunity to live, to put this enmity behind you. Decide, will you cling to your pride and traditions as you die, or accept the new way before you and the opportunity for life that it offers? The assembled crowd was silent, waiting on the response from their diminutive ice queen. Very well, I accept. You must state it aloud. Swear that you will seek no retribution against me, Odrin, or Skara for this, that you will embrace our blending of traditions. I will seek no retribution, she ground out. She remained stubbornly silent as everyone waited with bated breath for more. Odrin barked a laugh. I guess it's better than nothing. He looked at her, pleading with her to take what the maman had offered. Slowly, reluctantly, she nodded. Casti, Zira spoke aloud for the other's benefit. Transport myself, Odran, and the maman to the med bay aboard ship. The planet dissolved around them, and they found themselves in the shining med bay. The entire room was an incongruent pale pink, shot through with shimmering gold fibres. As soon as they appeared, the pink floor around the maman rose up to encompass her form, wrapping her in layers of fibrous pink wefts. When the first strand touched her, she closed her eyes. I have administered emergency pain medication and a sedative, Zira. This individual was in significant medical distress. Odrin let out a shuddering breath, running his hand over his hair in stress. Thank you, Casti. Please complete the scan. I already have, Odrin, came the calm reply. Odrin laughed aloud. I should have known. What was the result? I can correct the genetic errors in her system. The treatment is simple. The treatment will take several hours. I will keep her sedated until then. Odrin turned to Zira, his heart in his eyes. Beloved, I don't know what you did, but... He raised a shaking hand to touch her cheek. I know that I have you to thank for this. She gripped his forearm and drew him down to press his forehead against hers. I had to try. I knew I shouldn't interfere, but I would never have forgiven myself if I didn't try. I love you, my Zira, my Dalat. I love you, Audrin. I hope you are happy because you are stuck with me forever. No other maman will have you. Zira was filled with guilt, that in her desire to save him she had ostracised him from his people. He laughed softly like another female could compete after you. My warrior goddess, I want no other. She looked at him archly. You know, we have several hours to kill. 
Want to see the new bath I made up in our room? She winked mischievously. It's big enough for ten. He pulled her towards him and kissed her thoroughly. I'll go wherever you wish to lead, lady. Chapter 17. His and Hers Futures. Odrin carried the picnic basket as they reached the top of the hill. Zira laid out a blanket, and they chattered about everything and nothing as they set out their snacks, casually passing the bottle of wine back and forth. It was normal and perfect, and she still couldn't quite believe it was real. Between them, the bond sat quietly, warm, like a banked fire in the back of their minds. Zira had realised over the past few days that it had settled. She need only reach out and touch it, and she would be instantly connected to Odrin. She found herself reaching for it multiple times a day, just the most fleeting of touches, to reassure herself that he was there. He was all right. She kept having flashes of anxiety, of adrenaline, as if her system hadn't quite worked out that it was safe again. Odrin pulled her down to sit next to him as they watched the forest rolling below. They were an hour south of the colony in a beautiful clearing. The clearing surrounded a hill and was dotted with pretty flowers of all colours, and towards the colony they could see a new shuttle landing in the distance. Casti was still there, hovering above the colony, invisible from view. The forest rolled away on one side of the hill, and the other was an overlook that flowed over the river to the colony. He passed her a cracker with some cheese and laughed aloud when he looked behind her. Emerging from the forest, chattering, was the small creature that she had befriended at the crater site. It loped up the hill to them, chattering at her, and she caught the psychic images that it sent. She hadn't seen it since before the ship transferred here. Apparently it had taken the long way, travelling over land to find her. Its mind was filled with the simple joy of being with her until it spied her cracker. Extending its long neck, it delicately sniffed the offering. Here you go, little bandit. It happily took the cracker in its front paws and moved a few steps away to nibble on its prize. I think you have acquired a pet. Maybe he's very intelligent. She accepted a second cracker from Aldrin, replacing the one she had given to the creature. What made you choose this spot? How did you find it? Zira asked. Odrin smiled secretively. I've been checking out the land parcels that the colony planning team has been setting aside for colonists. With more soldiers and researchers landing soon, I thought I might stake my claim on one before the good ones were gone. He paused. What do you think? Zira was breathless. Really? This is your claim? Her voice was hushed. It's stunning, Odrin. Truly beautiful. Where does it extend to? He pointed out the boundaries. The 300 Scree claim included a section of river and a bay suitable for a small jetty, the hill they were sitting on, and a decent chunk of grasslands and a chunk of forest. I was thinking of building my house on this hill. It's got gorgeous views. Zira nodded as they watched the shuttle take off and another queue behind it to land. It's beautiful. Will you stay here with me? She quirked an eyebrow at him. I suppose it'll do. She looked around. Although my allotment may be nicer, perhaps I should have a think about it. He tackled her to the ground, rubbing noses with her affectionately. Maybe you should take the allotment next door. We could be neighbours. She laughed. We could at that. She ran her hands through his long braids. He pulled back to look at her seriously. Will you mate with me, Zira? She rubbed her nose against his again. I thought we already did. Properly. The ceremony. A big party the works. She pushed him off to sit up. I don't know, we don't have the same concept of mating as you do. When you say you want to mate, what do you want? He heard the vulnerability in her tone. Love, commitment, being together. If you want them, raising our children together. For how long? He frowned. For always, forever. That's an enormous commitment. The standard alliance agreement is only three years. What if you get sick of me? I'm pretty annoying, you know. He laughed. Don't you think that ship has left the shuttle bay already? We're psychically bonded together by an ancient alien. You're worried about living with me for three years. Well, when you put it like that, she sighed. What if I don't want to stay here? The dagger kiss gave me an open offer for a position. Once the colony is settled, there won't be much work for a professional soldier. Or if Casti needs to go somewhere, I will need to go too. Then I'll go with you. Healers can get work anywhere. He laced his fingers with hers but I want this to be our home. She looked at him, gripping a braid to pull him towards her. Deal, Odrin. Whatever we do, we'll go together. 
In that case, he pulled out his laser knife and grabbed the braid she was holding. This is for you. He sheared off the braid and handed it to her. Oh, Dran, are you nuts? Why would you do that? It's how Verit males show they are mated. Zira pondered the braid in her hand. All right. She pulled her own thick tail in front of her and took the knife, slicing off one of her braids to give to him. The End Afterward, thank you for listening, all. I am an indie author and reviews mean the world to us, so if you enjoyed this audiobook, I'd love it if you could leave a review here. Ebook and print books are available on Amazon, and the full, unabridged audiobook can be purchased at rosemackey.com. If you want to share on social media, I'd love it if you can tag me at, at Rose Mackey Author on Facebook, Insta or TikTok. If you really loved it and want to read more, check out rosemackey.com where you can sign up for my newsletter to hear about future books. No spam, I promise. You'll get access to extra scenes, free novellas and be the first to hear about new releases.